Chapter 26 Mustang Part of Cassius is gone. That invincible boy I first met is somehow different. The humiliation changed him. I can't decide how, though, as I straighten his fingers and help him fix his shoulder. He falls down from the pain. Thank you, brother, he says to me and cups the side of my head to help himself up. It is the first time he says it. I failed the test. I don't disagree with him. I went in there like a plum fool. If this were anywhere else, they would have killed me. At least it didn't cost you your life, I say. Cassius chuckles. Just my pride. Good. Something you have in abundance, Rogue says with a smile. We have to get her back. Cassius's own grimace fades as he looks at Rogue, then at me. Quinn, we have to get her back before he takes her up to his tower. We will. We bloody will. Cassius and I go east according to my plan farther than we have gone before. We stay to the northern highlands, but we make sure we walk along the high crests visible to the open plains below. East and east, our long legs taken us fast and far. A ride it to the southeast, I say. Cassius doesn't look. We pass through a humid glen, where a dark lock offers us the chance to catch a drink across from a family of deerling. Mud covers our legs. Bugs flit over the cold water. The earth feels good between my fingers as I bend to drink. I dunk my head and join Cassius in eating some of our aging lamb. It needs salt. My belly cramps from all the protein. How far east of the castle do you reckon we are? I ask Cassius, pointing behind him. Maybe twenty clicks. Hard to peg it. Feels farther, but my legs are just tired. He straightens and looks where I point. Ah. Got it. A girl on a dappled mustang watches us from the edge of the glen. She has a long covered bar tied to her saddle. Can't make out her house, but I have seen her before. I remember her like it was yesterday. The girl who called me a pixie when I fell off that pony Matteo put me on. I want her horse to ride back, Cassius tells me. He can't see out his left eye, but his bravado is back a little too forcefully. Hey, darling, he calls. Shit, that hurts the ribs. Prime ride. What house are you? I'm worried about this. The girl rides to within ten metres, but she has the sigils on sleeve and neck covered with two lengths of sewn cloth. Her face is streaked with three diagonal lines of blue berry juice mixed with animal fat. We don't know if she's from Ceres. I hope not. She could be from the southern woods, from the east, from the far northeastern highlands even. Lo, Mars, she says smugly looking at the sigil on our jackets. Cassius bows pathetically. I don't bother. Well, this is swell. I kick a stone with my shoe. Lo, Mustang. Nice sigil. And horse. I let her know having a horse is something rare. She is small, delicate. Her smile is not. It mocks us. What are you boys about in the hinterlands? Reaping grain? I pat my sling blade. We have enough back home. I gesture south of our castle. She suppresses a laugh at my feeble lie. Sure you do. I will be even with you. Cassius forces his battered face into a smile. You are stunningly beautiful. You must be from Venus.
Hit me with whatever is under that cloth on your saddle, and take me back to your fortress. I'll be your pink if you promise not to share me, and to keep me warm every night. He takes an unsteady step forward. And every morning. Her mustang takes four back, till he gives up trying to steal her horse. Well, aren't you the charmer, handsome? And by that pitchfork in your hand, you must be a prime fighter too. She bats her eyelashes. Cassius puffs at his chest in agreement. She waits for him to understand. Then he frowns. Yup. Uh-oh. You see, we didn't have any tools in our stronghold, except those pertaining to our deity. So, you must have encountered House Ceres already. She leans forward in the saddle sardonically. You don't have crops. You just fought those who do. And you don't have any better weapons, clearly, or you would be carrying them with you. So, Ceres is in these parts as well, likely in the lowlands near the woods for crops, or near that big river everyone is talking about. She's all laughing eyes and a smirking mouth and a face shaped like a heart, hair so golden it sparkles in the sun and flows down her back in braids. So, you're in the woods, she asks. North, in the highlands, probably. Oh, this is fun. How bad are your weapons? You clearly don't have horses. What a poor house. Slag, Cassius makes a point of saying. You seem pretty proud of yourself. I put my sling blade on my shoulder. She raises a hand and wiggles it back and forth. Sort of, sort of. More proud than handsome there should be. He's full of tells. I shift my weight on my toes to see if she notices. She moves her horse back. Now, now, Reaper, are you going to try and get in my saddle too? Just trying to knock you out of it, Mustang. Fancy a roll in the mud, do we? Well, how about I promise to let you up here with me if you give me more clues as to where your castle squats, towers, sprawls. I can be a kind master. She looks me up and down playfully. Her eyes sparkle like a fox's might. This is still a game to her, which means her house is a civil place. I'm envious as I examine her in kind. Cassius didn't lie. She is something to look at. But I'd rather knock her off her Mustang. My feet are tired, and we're playing a dangerous game. What draft number were you? I ask, wishing I'd paid more attention. Higher than you, Reaper. I remember Mercury wanted you something awful, but his drafters wouldn't let him pick you in the first round. Something about your rage, Metric. You were higher than me, so you're not Mercury then, because they chose a boy instead of me, and you're not a Jupiter because they took a gory damn monstrous kid. I try to remember who else was chosen before me, but I can't, so I smile. Maybe you shouldn't be so vain. Then I wouldn't know what draft you were. I notice the knife under her black tunic, but I still can't remember her from the draft. Wasn't paying attention. Cassius should have remembered her the way he looks at girls, but maybe he can only think of Quinn and her missing ear. Our job is done. We can leave Mustang. She's smart enough to figure out the rest. But leaving might be a problem without a horse, and I don't think Mustang really needs hers. I feign boredom. Cassius keeps an eye on the hills around. Then I start suddenly as if I've noticed something. I whisper, snake, into his ear while looking at the horse's front hooves. He looks too, and at this point the girl's movement is involuntary. Even as she realizes it's a trick, she leans forward to peer at the hooves. I lunge to close the ten meter gap. I'm fast. So is she, but she's just a hair off balance, 
and has to lean back in order to jerk her horse away. It scrambles back in the mud. I dive for her, and my strong right hand grips her long braids just as the horse darts away. I try to jerk her out of the saddle, but she's all hellfire. I'm left with a handful of coiled gold. The Mustang is off, and the girl laughs and curses about her hair. Then Cassius's pitchfork wobbles through the air and trips the horse. Girl and beast go down in the muddy grass. Damn it, Cassius, I shout. Sorry, you might have killed her. I know, I know, sorry. I run to see if she's broken her neck. That would ruin everything. She's not moving. I lean in to feel her pulse and sense a blade graze my groin. My hand is already there to twist her wrist away. I take the knife and pin her down. I knew you wanted to roll me in the mud. Her lips smirk. Then they purse as if she wants a kiss. I recoil. Instead, she whistles, and the plan becomes a bit more complicated. I hear hooves. Everyone has bloody damn horses but us. The girl winks and I force the cloth from her sigil. House Minerva. Greeks would have called it Athena. Of course. Seventeen horses tear down the glen from the crest of the hill. Their riders have stun pikes. Where the hell do they get stun pikes? Time to run, Reaper, Mustang taunts. My army comes. There's no running. Cassius dives into the lock. I jump off Mustang, run after him through the mud, and throw myself over the bank to join him in the water. I cannot swim, but I learn quickly. The horsemen of House Minerva taunt Cassius and me as we tread water in the centre of the small lock. It's summer, but the water is cold and deep. Dusk is coming. My limbs are numb. The Minervans still circle the lake, waiting for us to tire. We won't. I had three of the Duro bags in my pocket. I blow them full of air and give two to Cassius, keeping one for myself. They help us float, and since none of the Minervans seem intent on swimming to meet us, we're safe for the time being. Roke should have lit it by now. I tell Cassius some hours into our swim. He's in bad shape from his wounds and the cold. Roke will light it. Faith. Goodman. Faith. We're also supposed to be almost home. Well, it's still going better than my plan did. You look bored, Mustang. I shout out with chattering teeth. Come in for a swim. And get hypothermia. I'm not stupid. I'm in Minerva, not Mars, remember? She laughs from the shore. I'd rather warm myself by your castle's hearth. See? She points behind us and speaks quickly to three tall boys, one of whom looks as big as an obsidian, shoulders like a huge thunderhead. A thick column of smoke rises in the distance. Finally. How the slag did those pricks pass the test? I ask loudly. They've given our castle away. If we get back, I'm going to drown them in their own piss, Cassius replies, even louder. Except for Antonia, she's too pretty for that. Our teeth chatter. The 18 raiders think House Mars is stupid, horseless, and unprepared. Reaper, handsome, I must leave you now, Mustang calls to us. Try not to drown before I return with your standard. You can be my pretty bodyguards, and you can have matching hats, but we'll have to teach you to think better. She gallops away with fifteen riders, the huge gold reining his horse in beside hers like some sort of colossal shadow. Her followers whoop as they ride. She also leaves us company, two horsemen with stun pikes. Our farming tools lie in the mud on the shore. Mm -hmm. Mustang is a sex p p pot. Cassius manages to shiver out. She's scary. R -r Reminds me 
m- of my m- m- mother. Something is wrong with you. He nods in agreement. So the b- b- plan is sort of b- b- working. If we can get out of the lock without being captured. Night falls in earnest, and with the darkness comes the howls of the wolves in the misty highlands. We begin to sink as our juro bags leak air from small stress holes. We might have had a chance to slink away in the night, but the remaining Minervans are not lazily sitting around a fire. They stalk through the darkness, so that we never even know where they are. Why can't they be stupidly sitting in their castle infighting like our fellows? I'm going to be a slave again. Maybe not a real slave, but it doesn't matter. I won't lose. I cannot lose. Eo will have died for nothing if I let myself sink here, if I let my plan fail. Yet, I do not know how to beat my enemies. They are clever, and the odds are stacked heavily against me. Eo's dream sinks with me into the darkness of the lock, and I'm about to swim to shore, regardless of the outcome, when something spooks the horses. Then a scream slices across the water. Fear trickles down my spine as something howls. It is not a wolf. It can't be what I think it is. Blue light flashes as a stun pike flails in the air. The boy screams another curse. A knife got him. Someone runs to his aid and electricity flares blue again. I see a black wolf standing over one body as another falls. Darkness again. Silence. Then the mournful whine of medbots descending from Olympus. I hear a familiar voice. Clear now. Come out of the water, fishies. We paddle to shore and pant in the mud. Mild hypothermia has set in. It won't kill us, but my fingers are still slow as mud squishes between them. My body shakes like a drill boy at work. Goblin, you psychopath. Is that you? I call. The fourth tribe slides out of the darkness. He's wearing the pelt of the wolf he killed. It covers his head to his shins. Damn small kid. The gold of his black fatigues is coated in mud. So's his face. Cassius crawls from his knees to clasp Severo in a hug. Oh, you you, you beautiful goblin, beautiful, beautiful boy, and smelly. He been nibbling on mushrooms, goblin asks over Cassius's shoulders. Stop touching me, you pixie. He pushes Cassius away, looking embarrassed. Did you kill these two? I ask, shivering. I bend over them and take off their dry clothing to exchange for my own. I feel pulses. No. Severo cocks his head at me. Should I have? Why are you asking me like I'm your praetor? I laugh. You know what's what. Severo shrugs. You're like me. He looks at Cassius with disdain. And somehow still like him. So, should I kill them? He asks casually. Cassius and I share startled glances. No, 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 We agree, just as the medbots arrive to take the Minervans away. He hurts them badly enough to end their time in the game. So... What, pray tell, are you doing wandering about in a wolf skin all the way out here? Cassius asks. Rogue said you lot would be at east, Severo replies curtly. Plan is still a go, says he. Have the Minervans arrived at the castle? I ask. Severo spits in the grass. The twin moons cast eerie shadows over his dark face. How the piss should I know? They passed me on the way. But you have no leverage, you know. It's a dead-end plan. Is Severo 
actually helping us? Of course, his help begins with listing out our inadequacies. If the Minervans get to the keep, they will destroy Titus and take our territory. Yes, that's the point, I say. They will also take our standard. That's a risk we have to take. So I stole the standard from the keep and buried it in the woods. I should have thought of that. You just stole it? Just like that? Cassius starts laughing. Crazy little sod. You're prime mad. One hundredth pick. Prime mad. Several looks annoyed. Pleased, but annoyed. Even then, we cannot guarantee they leave our territory. Your suggestion? I ask, still shivering, but impatient. He could have helped us before. Get leverage to get them out after they do their job of taking Titus down, obviously. Yes, y yes, I get it. I shake off the last of my shivers. But how? Several shrugs. We'll take Minerva's standard. B -b Wait, Cassius says. You know how to do that? Several snorts. What do you think I've been doing this whole time, you silky turd? Wanking off in the bushes? Cassius and I look at each other. Kind of, I say. Yeah, actually, Cassius agrees. We ride the Minervan horses east of the highlands. I'm not a sound equestrian. Of course, Cassius is, so I learn to clutch his bruised ribs very well. Our faces are painted with mud. It will look like shadow in the night, so they will see our horses, our pikes, our sigils, and will think us their own. The Minervan castle lies in rolling country, quilted with wildflowers and olive trees. The moons glimmer bright over the pitching landscape. Owls hoot in the gnarled branches above. As we reach their sprawling sandstone fortress, a voice challenges us from the rampart above the gate. Severo is not very presentable in his wolf cloak, so he guards the escape. We found Mars, I call up. Oi, open the damn gate. Password, the sentry demands lazily from the battlements. Buzzing butthead, I shout up. Several heard it last time he was here. Prime. Where's Virginia and the Raiders? The sentry calls down. Mustang? Took their standard, man. The pissers didn't even have horses. We might still manage to take their castle. The sentry bites. Prime news. Virginia's a devil. June's made supper. Fetch some in the kitchen and then join me if you like. I'm bored and need to be entertained. The gate creaks open very, very slowly. I laugh when it finally parts enough for us to ride in abreast. Cassius and I aren't even met by guards. Their castle is different, drier, cleaner, and less oppressive. They have gardens and olive trees that wend between the sandstone columns of the bottom level. We hide in the shadows as two girls pass with cups of milk. They have no torches or fires an enemy can spot from the distance, only small candles. It makes it easy to slink about. Apparently the girls are pretty because Cassius makes a face and pretends to follow them up the stairs. After flashing me a smile, he sneaks toward the sounds of the kitchen as I look for their command room. I find it on the third level. Windows overlook the dark plain. In front of the windows lies Minerva's atlas. A burning flag floats above my house's castle. I don't know what it means, but it can't be good. Another fortress, House Diana's, lies south of Minerva's in the Great Woods. Those are all that have been discovered. They have their own score sheets to keep track of accomplishments. Someone named Pax seems a bloody nightmare. 
He's taken eight slaves personally and caused medbots to come down to fetch nine students, so I assume he's the one that stood as tall as an obsidian. I don't find their standard anywhere in the command room. Like us, they weren't stupid enough to leave it just lying about. No problem. We'll find it in our own way. On cue, I smell Cassius's smoke fires seeping through the windows. What a pretty war room they have. Much prettier than Mars's. I break everything. And when I have ruined their map and am finished defacing a statue of Minerva, I use the axe I found to chop the name of Mars into their long, beautiful war table. I'm tempted to etch another house's name into the debris to confuse them, but I want them to know who did this. This house is too put together, too ordered and level-headed. They have a leader, raiders, sentries, naive ones, cooks, olive trees, warm milk, stunpikes, horses, honey, strategy. And heavens, proud piggers. Let them feel a bit more like House Mars. Let them feel rage, chaos. Shouts come. Cassius's fire spreads. A girl runs into the war room. I nearly make her faint as I lift my axe. There's no point in hurting her. We can't take prisoners, not easily, so I pull out both the sling blade and the stun pike. Mud on my face, my golden hair wild. I look a terror. Are you June? I growl. N -n no Why? Can you cook? She laughs, despite her fear. Three boys turn the corner. Two are thicker but shorter than me. I scream like a rage god. Oh, how they run. Enemies! They scream. Enemies! They're in the towers! I roar to confuse them again and again as I descend the stairs. The top levels! Everywhere! Too many! Dozens! Dozens! Mars is here! Mars has come! Smoke spreads. So do their cries. Mars! they shout. Mars has come! A young man flashes past me. I grab his collar and throw him at a window into the courtyard below, scattering the Minervans massed there. I go to the kitchen. Cassius's fire is not bad, mostly grease and brush. A howling girl beats at it. June! I call out. She turns into my stunpike and shudders as the electricity dumbs down her muscles. That's how I steal their cook. Cassius finds me running with June over my shoulder, through their gardens. What the hell? She's a cook, I explain. He laughs so hard he can barely breathe. Minervans fall into chaos, running from their barracks. They think the enemy's in their towers. They think their citadel is burning down. They think Mars has come in full force. Cassius pulls me along into their stables. Seven horses have been left behind. We steal six after tossing a candle into their hay stores and ride out to the main gate as smoke and panic consumes the fortress. I don't have the standard, just as we planned. Severo said there was a hidden back gate to the fortress. We wagered that someone very desperate to flee a fallen fortress would use it to escape, someone trying to protect the standard. We were right. Severo joins us two minutes later. He howls out from under his wolf cloak as he comes. Far behind, the enemy chases him on foot with stun pikes. Now they're the ones without horses, and they've no chance to get back the owl standard that glitters in his muddy hands. The cook, unconscious across my saddle. We ride under the starry night, back to our battle-torn highlands, the three of us laughing, cheering, howling. Chapter 27 The House of Rage We find Roke at Phobos Tower with Leah, Screwface, Clown, Thistle, Weed and Pebble. We have eight horses, two stolen at the lake, six stolen in the castle. We add them to our plan. Cassius, Severo and I cross the bridge that spans the river Metos. 
an enemy scout bolts north to warn Mustang. Our other stolen horses, led by Antonia, follow once the scout is away, looping north. Roke, horseless, loops south. My horse alone is not covered with mud. She is a bright mare, and I am a bright sight. I carry Minerva's golden standard in my left hand. We could have hidden it, could have kept it safe, but they need to know we have it, and even though Severo stole it, he doesn't want to carry it. He likes his curved knives too much. I think he whispers to them. And Cassius we need for other things besides carrying the standard. Plus, if he carried it, then he would look the leader, and that will not do. Dead silence as we ride through our lowlands. Fog seeps around the trees. I cut through it. Cassius and Severo ride to either side. I cannot see or hear them now, but wolves howl somewhere. Severo howls back. I struggle to keep my seat as the mare spooks. I fall off twice. Cassius's laughs come from the darkness. It's hard to remember I'm doing all this for Eo. All this to start a rebellion. It feels like a game this night. In a way it is, because I'm finally beginning to have fun. Our castle is taken. Firelight along its ramparts tell me this. The castle stands high above the glen on its hill, its torches making strange halos in the fog-quilted darkness. My horse's hooves thump softly on wet grass, as to my right, the metas gurgles like a sick child in the night. Cassius rides there, but I cannot see him. Reaper! Mustang shouts through the mist. Her voice is not playful. She is forty metres off, near the base of the sloped road that leads to the castle. She leans forward, arms crossed over the pommel of her saddle. Six riders flank her. The rest must be garrisoning in the castle, otherwise I'd hear about it. I look at the boys behind her. Pax is so large that his pike looks like a scepter in his huge mitts. Lo, Mustang. So, you didn't drown. That would have been easier. Her quick face is dark. You are a vile breed, you know that. She's been inside the keep, and she doesn't have words for her anger. Rape? Mutilation? Murder? She spits. I did nothing, I say, and neither did the proctors. Yes, you did nothing. Yet now you have our standard, and what? Handsome somewhere out there in the mist. Go ahead. Pretend you're not their leader, like you're not responsible. Titus is responsible. The big bastard? Yes, Pax laid him low. She gestures to the monster of a boy beside her. Pax's hair is shorn short, his eyes small, chin like a heel with a dent in it. Beneath him, his horse looks like a dog. His bare arms are flesh stretched over boulders. I didn't come to talk, Mustang. Come to cut my ear off, she sneers. No, Goblin did. Then one of her men slips screaming from his saddle. What the... a rider murmurs. Behind them, knives already dripping, Severo howls like a maniac. A half dozen other howls join his, as Antonia and half her Phobos garrison ride from the north hills on the stolen mud-black steeds. They howl like mentals in the mist. Mustang's soldiers wheel about. Severo takes another one down. He doesn't use stun pikes. Medbots scream through the sky, which is suddenly filled with proctors. All of them have come to watch. Mercury trails behind the rest, carrying an armful of spirits, which he tosses to his fellows. Each of us peers up to watch their strange appearance. The horses continue to run. Time pauses. To the fray! Dark Apollo mocks from on high. His golden robes show he's just risen from bed. To the fray. Then chaos hits as Mustang shouts orders, strategy. Four more horsemen ride down the sloped road from the gate to support her troop. 
My turn. I slam Minerva's standard upright into the earth and scream bloody murder. I kick my heels into my mare. She lurches forward, almost losing me. My body shudders as she pounds the moist earth with her hooves. My strong left hand grips the reins and I draw my sling blade. I feel a hell diver again when I howl. The enemy scatters as they see me raging toward them. It is the rage that confuses them. It is the insanity of Severo, the manic brutality of Mars. The horsemen scatter, except one. Pax jumps from his horse and sprints at me. Pax Autelamanus, he screams, a titan possessed, foaming at the mouth. I dig my heels into my horse and howl. Then Pax tackles my horse. His shoulder hits my horse's sternum. The beast screams. My world flips. I fly out of my saddle over my horse's head and crash to the ground. Dazed, I stumble to my knee in the hoof-churned field. Madness consumes the field. Antonia's force crashes into Mustang's flank. They have primitive weapons, but their horses are shock enough. Several Minervans fly from the saddle. Others kick their mounts toward their abandoned standard, but Cassius appears out of the fog at a gallop and swipes the standard away to the south. Two enemies give chase, dividing their force. The other six soldiers from Antonia's tower garrisons are waiting to ambush them in the woods, where the horses cannot gallop. Reflexes make me duck as a pike sweeps toward my skull. I'm up with my sling blade. I slash it at a wrist. Too slow. I move as if in a dance, remembering the thumping pattern my uncle taught me in the abandoned mines. The reaping dance carries my motions into one another like flowing water. I swoop the sling blade into a kneecap. The aureate bone does not break, but the force knocks the rider from the saddle. I spin sideways and strike again and again and sweep the hoof of a horse away, breaking a fetlock. The animal falls. A different stunpike stabs at me. I avoid the point and rip it free with my red hands and jam the electrocuting tip into another assailant. The boy falls. A mountain pushes it aside and runs at me. Pax. In case I am an idiot, he roars his name at me. His parents bred him to lead obsidian landing parties into whole breaches. Pax, ow, telemanus! He beats his huge pike against his chest and hits puffy-haired clowns so hard my friend flies back four meters. Pax Autelamanus is a prick licker, I mock. Then a horse's flank thumps into my back and I stumble toward the monstrous boy. I'm doomed. He could have gotten me with his pike. Instead, he hugs me. It's like being embraced by a golden bear that keeps screaming its own damn name. My back cracks. Mother Mercy, you're squeezing my skull. My shoulder aches. Bloody hell, I can't breathe. I've never met a force like this. Dear God, he's a bloody damn ogre. But someone is howling. Dozens of howls. Back popping. Pax roars his personal victory. I have your captain. I piss on you, Mars. Pax Autelemanus has slagged your captain. Pax Autelemanus. My vision flickers black and fades, but the rage in me does not. I roar out one last bit of wrath before I faint. It's cheap. Pax is honourable. I still smash his grapes flat with my knee. I make sure to get both as many times as I can. One, two, three, four. He gawps and collapses. I faint atop him in the mud to the sound of proctors cheering. Severo tells me the story as he picks through the pockets of our prisoners after the battle. After Pax and I finished one another off, Roke sallied into the glen with Leah and my tribe. Mustang, the crafty girl, escaped into the castle and manages yet to hold it with six fighters. All the prisoners of Mars she captured won't be hers until she touches them with the tip of her standard. 
Fat chance. We have eleven of her men, and Roke digs up our standard to make them our slaves. We could besiege our own castle, there's no storming its high walls, but Ceres or the rest of Minerva could come at any time. If they do, Cassius is supposed to ride to give Ceres Minerva's standard. It also keeps him away while I cement my position as leader. Roke and Antonia come with me to negotiate with Mustang at the gate. I limp up and favor a cracked rib. It hurts to breathe. Roke takes a step back so that I am most prominent when we reach the gate itself. Antonia wrinkles her nose and eventually does the same. Mustang is bloody from the skirmish, and I can't find a smile on her pretty face. The proctors have been watching all of this she says scathingly. They've seen what happened in that... place. Everything. Was done by Titus. Antonia drawls tiredly. And no one else? Mustang looks at me. The girls won't stop crying. No one died, Antonia says in annoyance. Weak as they are, they will repair themselves. Despite what happened... There's been no depletion of golden stock. The golden stock, Mustang murmurs. How can you be so cold? Little girl, Antonia sighs. Gold is a cold metal. Mustang looks up at Antonia incredulously, then shakes her head. Mars, a gruesome deity. You're fit for this, aren't you, Lot? Barbarity, past centuries, dark ages. I don't have a mind to be lectured by an oriat about morality. We would like you to leave the castle, I tell her. Do so with your men, and you may have those we captured. We won't turn them into slaves. Down the hill, Severo stands beside the captives with our standard in hand, He's tickling a disgruntled Pax with a horsehair. Mustang jams a finger into my face. This is a school. You realize that, yes? No matter the rules your house decides to play by. Be ruthless all you gory well like. But there are limits. There are slagging limits to what you can do in this school. In the game. The more brutal you are, the more foolish you look to the proctors, to the adults who will know what you've done, what you're capable of doing. You think they want monsters to lead the society? Who would want a monster for an apprentice? I see a vision of Augustus watching my wife dangle, eyes dead as a pit vipers. A monster would want a student in his own image. They want visionaries. Leaders of men, not reapers of them. There are limits, she continues. I snap. There are no goddamned limits. Mustang's jaw tightens. She understands how this will play out. In the end, giving us back our horrible castle won't cost her anything. Trying to keep it would. She might even end up like one of the girls in the high tower. She never thought of that before. I can tell she wants to leave. It's her sense of justice that is killing her. Somehow she thinks we should pay, that the proctors should come down and interfere. Most of the kids think that about this game. Hell, Cassius said it a hundred times as we scouted together. But the game isn't like that, because... Life isn't like that. Gods don't come down in life to mete out justice. The powerful do it. That's what they are teaching us. Not only the pain in gaining power, but the desperation that comes from not having it. The desperation that comes when you are not a gold. We will keep the series slaves, Mustang demands. No, they are ours. I drawl, and we will do with them what we like. She watches me for a long moment, thinking. Then we get Titus. No. 
Mustang snaps. We will keep Titus, or there are no terms. You will keep no one. She's not used to being told no. I want assurances they are safe. I want Titus to pay. It doesn't matter a flying piss what you want. Here you get what you take. That's part of the lesson plan. I pull out my sling blade and set its tip into the soil. Titus is of House Mars. He is ours. So please, try and take him. He'll be brought to justice, Roke says to Mustang, to reassure her. I turn to him, eyes blazing. Shut up! He looks down, knowing he should not have spoken. It doesn't matter. Mustang's eyes don't look to Antonia or Roke. They don't look down the slope where Leah and Scipio have her warband on their knees in the glen, and Thistle sits on Pax's back with weed, taking her turn tickling him now. Her eyes don't look at the blade. They're only for me. I lean in. If Titus raped a little girl who happened to be a red, how would you feel? I ask. She doesn't know how to answer. The law does. Nothing would happen. It isn't rape unless she wears the sigil of an elder house like Augustus. Even then, the crime is against her master. Now look around, I say quietly. There are no golds here. I'm a red. You're a red. We are all reds till one of us gets enough power. Then we get rights. Then we make our own law. I lean back and raise my voice. That is the point of all this. To make you terrified of a world where you do not rule. Security and justice aren't given. They are made by the strong. You should hope that is not true, Mustang says quietly to me. Why? Because there is a boy here like you. Her face takes on a gloomy aspect as though she regrets what she must say. My proctor calls him the Jackal. He is smarter and crueler and stronger than you, and he will win this game and make us his slaves if the rest of us go about acting like animals. Her eyes implore me. So please, hurry up and evolve. Chapter 28 My Brother I pretend the matches came from one of the Minervans when I light our first fire inside Castle Mars. June is fetched from her makeshift prison, and soon she has prepared us a feast from the meat of goats and sheep and herbs gathered by my tribe. My tribe pretends it's the first meal they've had in weeks, the others of the house are hungry enough to believe the lie. Minerva and her warband have long since slunk on home. What now? I ask Roke as the others eat in the square. The keep is a place of squalor still, and the light of the fire does nothing to illuminate the filth. Cassius has gone to see Quinn, so I am alone for the moment with Roke. Titus's tribe sits in quiet groups. The girls will not speak to the boys because of what they've seen some of them do. All eat with their heads down. There's shame there. Antonia's people sit with mine and glare at Titus's. Disgust fills their eyes. Betrayal, too, even as they fill their bellies. Several scuffles have already escalated from minor words to thrown fists. I thought the victory might bring them together, but it did not. The division is worse than ever, only now I cannot define it, and I think there is only one way to mend it. Roke doesn't have the answer I want to hear. The proctors aren't interfering because they want to see how and if we handle justice, Darrow. It is the deeper trait that this situation probes. How do we manage law? Brilliant, I say. 
So what? We're supposed to whip Titus? Kill him? That would be law. Would it? Or would it just be vengeance? You're the poet. You figure it out. I kick a stone off the ramparts. He can't stay tied up in the cellars. You know this. We will never move on from this torpor if he does, and it has to be you who decides what to do with him. Not Cassius, I ask. I think he's earned a say. After all, he did claim him. I don't want Cassius to share leadership, but I don't want him to come out of the Institute without any prospects. I owe him. Claim him, Roke coughs. And how barbaric does that sound? So, Cassius should play no role. I love him like a brother, but no. Roke's narrow face tenses as he sets a hand on my arm. Cassius cannot lead this house. Not after what happened. Titus's boys and girls might obey him, but they won't respect him. They won't think him stronger than them, even if he is. Darrow, they pissed on him. We are golds. We do not forget. He's right. I pull my hair in frustration and glare at Roke as though he were being difficult. You don't understand how much this means to Cassius. After Julian's death, he has to succeed. He cannot be remembered solely for what happened. He can't. Why do I care so much? Doesn't matter a flying piss how much it means to him. Roke echoes my words with a smile. His fingers are thin like hay on my bicep. They'll never fear him. Fear is necessary here. And Cassius knows it. Why else is he absent in victory? Antonia has not left my side. Pollux, the gate opener, hasn't either. They linger several meters away to associate with my power. Severo and Thistle watch them with sly grins. Is that why you're here too, you scheming weasel? I ask Roke. Sharing the glory? He shrugs and gnaws on the leg of mutton Leah brings him. Slag that. I'm here for the food. I find Titus in the cellar. The Minervans tied him and beat him bloody after they saw the slave girls in his tower. That's their justice. He smiles as I stand over him. How many of House Ceres did you kill in your raids? I ask. Suck my balls. He spits bloody phlegm. I dodge. I resist kicking him there. Barely. Already got packs for the day. Titus has the gall to ask what has happened. I rule House Mars now. Outsourced your dirty work to the Minervans, eh? Didn't want to face me. Typical golden coward. I am afraid of him. I don't know why. Yet I bend on a knee and stare him in the eye. You are a pissing fool, Titus. You never evolved, never got past the first test. You thought this whole thing is about violence and killing. Idiot. It's about civilization, not war. To have an army, you must first have a civilization. You went straight to violence like they wanted us to. Why do you think they gave us of Mars nothing, and the other houses have so many resources? We're meant to fight like mad, but we're meant to burn out like you did. But I beat that test. Now I'm the hero, not the usurper, and you're just the ogre in the dungeon. Oh, huzzah, huzzah. He tries clapping his bound hands. I don't give a piss. How many did you kill? I ask. Not enough. He tilts his large head. His hair is greasy and dark with dirt. 
almost as though he's tried to black out the gold. He seems to like the dirt. It's under his fingernails, coats his burnished skin. I tried to bash their heads in, kill them before the medbots came, but they were always so fast. Why did you want to kill them? I don't understand what the point is. They are your own people. He smirks at this. You could have changed things, you bastard. His large eyes are calmer, sadder than I remember. He does not like himself, I realize. Something about him is too mournful. The pride I thought he had is not pride. It's just scorn. You say I'm cruel, but you had matches and iodine. Don't think I didn't know even before I smelled you. We starved, and you used what you found to become leader. So do not lecture me on morality, you backstabbing piss-sucker. Then why didn't you do something about it? Pollux and Vixus were frightened of you. So the rest were too. And they thought Goblin would kill them in their sleep. What could I do if I was the only one who wasn't scared? Why aren't you? He laughs hard. You're just a boy with a sling blade. First I thought you were hard, thought we saw things similarly. He licks a bloody lip. Thought you were like me, only worse because of that coldness in your eyes. But you're not cold. You care about these piss pricks. My eyebrows pinched together. How's that? Simple. You made friends. Roke, Cassius, Leah, Quinn. So did you. Pollux, Cassandra, Vixus. Titus's face contorts horribly. Friends, he spits. Friends with them. Those gold brows. They are monsters, soulless bastards. Nothing but a bunch of cannibals, all of them. They did the same as I did, but... Pfft. I still don't understand why you did what you did to the slaves, I say. Rape, Titus. Rape. His face is quiet and cruel. They did it first. Who? But he's not listening. Suddenly he's telling me about how they took her and raped her in front of him. Then the slaggers came back a week later to do it some more. So he killed them, bashed their heads in. I killed the bloody damn monsters. Now their daughters bloody well get what she got. It's like I've been punched in the face. Oh, hell. A chill spreads through me. Bloody damn. I stumble back. What the hell is the matter with you? Titus asks. If I were a gold, I might have not noticed. Might have just been befuddled by the odd word. I'm no gold. Darrow? I pull my way into the hall. I move in a haze. It all makes sense. The hate. The disgust. The vengeance. Cannibals eat their own. He called to them cannibals. Pollux, Cassandra, Vixus. Who are their own? Their own. Golden. Bloody dam. Not gory. Titus said bloody dam. No gold says that. Ever. And he called it a sling blade, not a reaper's scythe. Oh, hell. Titus is a red. Chapter 29 Unity 
Titus is what Dancer did not want me to become. He's like Harmony. He's a creature of vengeance. A rebellion with Titus at the helm would fail in weeks. Worse, if Titus continues this way, continues unstably, he puts me at risk. Dancer lied, or else he did not know that there are other reds who've been carved, other reds who have donned the mask of the gold. How many more are there? How many has Ares planted here, in the society? In the Institute? It doesn't matter if it's a thousand or just one. Titus's instability puts every red ever carved into a gold at risk. He puts Eo's dream at risk. And that is something I cannot abide. Eo did not die so that Titus can kill a few kids. I sob in the armory as I resolve what must be done. More blood will stain these hands, because Titus is a mad dog and must be put down. In the morning, I pull him into the square in front of the house. They clear away the remnants of the night's feast. I even have the slaves there to watch. A few proctors flicker high above. There is no medbot floating beside them, which must stand as their silent consent. I push Titus down on the ground in front of his former tribe. They watch quietly, mist hanging in the air above them, nervous feet scraping the cold cobblestones of the courtyard. A chill seeps into my hands through the durosteel of my sling blade. For crimes of rape, mutilation, and attempted murder of fellow house members, I sentence Titus Auladros to death. I list the reasons. Does anyone contest my right to do so? First I glance to the proctors above. Not one makes a sound. I stare at cruel Vixus. His bruise is not yet gone. My eyes go to Cassandra next. I even look at Craggy Pollux, the one who saved Cassius and opened the gates for us. He stands by Roke. How loyalties shift here. How my own shift. I will make a red die because he killed golds. He dug the earth like me. He has a soul like mine. In death, it will go to the veil. But in life he was stupid and selfish with his grief. He should have been better than this. Reds are better than him. Aren't we? Titus's tribe stays silent. Their guilt is bound up with their leader. When he goes, it'll go. That is what I tell myself. Everything will be well. I contest the sentence, Titus says, and issue a challenge to you, turd liquor. I accept, Goodman. I bow curtly. Then a duel per custom of the Order of the Sword, Roke announces. I choose then, Titus says, eyeing my sling blade. Straight blades, nothing curved. As you have it, I say. But as I step forward, I feel a hand at my elbow and feel my friend come close behind me. Darrow, he is mine, Cassius whispers coldly. Remember? I make no sign of acknowledgement. Please, Darrow, let me honour House Bologna. I look to Roke. He shakes his head no as does Quinn, who stands behind Cassius. But I am leader here. And I did promise my friend, who now recognises my ascendance. He requests instead of demands, and so I make a show of considering and then accepting his request. I stand aside as Cassius steps forward with a straight blade held in his fencer's grip. It is an ugly weapon, but he's sharpened it on the stones. The little prince, Titus snickers. Wonderful. I'll be happy to drench your corpse with piss again when we're through. 
Titus is meant for brawls, meant for muddy battlefields and civil wars. I wonder if he knows how easily he will die today. Roke draws a circle in ash around the two combatants. Clown and Screwface walk out with arms full of weapons. Titus picks a long broadsword he took from a Ceres soldier five days before. The metal scrapes over stone. Echoes around the courtyard. He swings it once, twice, to test the metal. Cassius does not move. Pissing your pants already? Titus asks. No fretting. I'll be quick about it. Rogue performs the necessities and commences the fight. Cassius is not quick about it. The ugly blades sound brittle against each other. The clangs are harsh. The blades chip, they grind. But how silent they are when they find flesh. The only sound is Titus's gasp. You killed Julian. Cassius says quietly, Julian Au Bologna of House Bologna. He pulls his blade free of Titus's leg and slides it somewhere else. He rips it out. Titus laughs and swings feebly. It is pathetic at this point. You killed Julian. A thrust accompanies the words, words he repeats until I no longer watch. You killed Julian. But Titus is long dead. Tears stream down Quinn's face. Rogue takes her and Leah away. My army is silent. Thistle spits on the cobbles and puts her arm over Pebble's shoulders. Clown looks even more dejected than usual. Even the proctors make no comment. It is Cassius's rage that fills the courtyard, a cruel lament for a kind brother. He said he did it for justice, for the honour of his family and house. But this is revenge, and how hollow it seems. I grow cold. This was meant for me. Not for my poor brother, Titus, if that was ever really his name. He deserved better than this. I'm going to cry. The anger and sadness well in my chest as I push through the army. Roke looks at me when I pass him. His face is like a corpse's. That wasn't justice, he murmurs, without looking me in the eyes. I failed the test. He's right. It wasn't justice. Justice is dispassionate. It is fair. I am the leader. I passed the sentence. I should have done it. Instead, I gave license to vengeance and vendetta. The cancer will not be cut away. I made it worse. At least Cassius is feared again, Roke mutters. But that's the only thing you got right. Poor Titus. I bury him in a grove near the river. I hope it speeds him on his way to the Vale. That night, I do not sleep. I don't know if it was his wife or his sister or his mother they hurt. I do not know what mine he came from. His pain is my own. His pain broke him as mine broke me on the scaffold. But I was given a second chance. Where was his? I hope his pain fades in death. I did not love him till he was dead, and he should be dead, but he is still my brother. So I pray he finds peace in the Vale, and that I will see him again one day, and we'll embrace as brothers, as he forgives me for what I did to him, because I did it for a dream, 
for our people. My name, three bars beside it now, floats nearer the primus hand. Cassius has risen too, but there can only be one primus. Since I cannot sleep, I take the guard ship from Cassandra. Mist curls around the battlements, so we tie sheep around the walls. They will bleat if an enemy comes. I smell something strange, rich and smoky. Roast duck. I turn and find Fitchner standing beside me. His hair is messy over his narrow brow, and he wears no golden armor today, only a black tunic striped with gold. He hands me a piece of duck. The smell makes my stomach rumble. We should all be pissed at you, I say. His face is one of surprise. Tots who say that usually mean to explain why they are not pissed. You and the proctors can see everything, yes? Even when you wipe your ass. You didn't stop Titus because it's all part of the curriculum. The real question is why we did not stop you. From killing him? Yes, little one. He would have been valuable in the military, don't you think? Perhaps not as a preter with ships in the ink. But what a legate he would have made, leading men in star shells through enemy gates as fire rained down against their pulse shields. Have you ever seen an iron rain, where men are launched from orbit to take cities? He was meant for that. I do not answer. Fitzner wipes grease from his lips with the black sleeve of his tunic. Life is the most effective school ever created. Once upon a time, they made children bow their heads and read books. It would take ages to get anything across. He taps his head. But we have widgets and data pads now, and we goals have the lower colors to do our research. We need not study chemistry or physics. We have computers and others to do that. What we must study is humanity. In order to rule, ours must be the study of political, psychological, and behavioral science. How desperate human beings react to one another. How packs form. How armies function. How things fall apart. And why. You could learn this nowhere else but here. No. I understand the purpose. I murmur. I learn more when I make mistakes, so long as they don't kill me. How well I learned from trying to be a martyr. Good. You make plenty of them. You're an impulsive little turd. But this is the place to frag up, to learn. This is life. But with medbots, second chances, artificial scenarios. You might have guessed that the first test... The passage was the measurement of necessity versus emotion. The second was tribal strife. Then there was a bit of justice. Now there will be more tests, more second chances, more lessons learned. How many of us can die? I ask suddenly. Don't worry about that. How many? There is a limit set each year by the Board of Quality Control, but we're well within the bounds, despite what happened with the jackal. Fitchner smiles. The jackal, I say. Is that what happened the other night when the medbots blitzed south? Did I say his name? Oops. He grins. I mean to say that the medbots are very effective. They heal nearly all wounds, but will they be so effective when Cassius finds out who really killed his brother? My stomach tightens. He already killed Julian's murderer. Apparently you weren't watching. Of course. Of course. Mercury thinks you're brilliant. Apollo thinks you're uppity. He really does not like you, you know. I could give a piss. Oh, you should care much more than that. Apollo's a peach. 
Right. So, what do you think? You are my proctor. I think you are an ancient soul. He watches me and leans against the rampart. The night is misty beyond the castle. From its depths, a wolf howls. I think you're like that beast out there. Part of a pack, but deeply sad. Deeply alone. And I can't puzzle out why, my dear boy. This is all so much fun. Enjoy it. Life doesn't get better. You're the same, I say. Lonely. You're all japes and snide comments, just like Severo. But it's just a mask. It's because you don't look like the others, isn't it? Or are you poor? Somehow you're an outsider. My looks! He barks a laugh. What does that matter? Think I'm a bronzy because I'm not an Adonis? He leans forward because he really does care about what I'm going to say. You are ugly and you eat like a pig, Fitchner but you chew metabolizers when you could just go to a carver and fix yourself to look like the others. They could take care of that paunch in a second. Fitchner's jaw muscle flickers. Is it anger? Why should I have to visit a carver? He hisses suddenly. I can kill an obsidian with my bare hands. An obsidian. I can outwit a silver in parlance and negotiation. I can do math greens only dream of. Why should I make myself look any different? Because it is what holds you back. Despite my low birth, I am of note. I am important. His hatchet face dares me to contradict. I am gold. I am a king of man. I do not change to suit others. If that's true... Why do you chew metabolizers? He does not answer. And why are you only a proctor? Becoming a proctor is a position of prestige, boy. Fitchner snaps. The drafters voted me to represent the house. Yet you're no imperator. You lead no fleets. You're not even a praetor in command of a squadron. Nor are you any sort of governor. How many men can do the things you say you can do? Few, he says very quietly, face all anger. Very few. He looks up. What is the bounty you desire for capturing the Minervan standard? Isn't that Severo's deal? I say, understanding the conversation is nearing its end. He has passed it to you. I ask for horses, and weapons, and matches. He agrees curtly, and turns to leave before I can ask him one last question. I grab his arm as he starts to ascend. Something happens. My nerves fry like needles in acid through my hand and arm. I gasp. My lungs can't function for a second. Gory hell! I cough out and fall to the ground. He wears pulse armor. I can't even see the generator. It's like a pulse shield, but inlaid in the armor itself. He waits without a smile. The jackal, I say. You mentioned him. The Minervan girl mentioned him. Who is he? He's the arch-governor's son, Darrow and he makes Titus look like a blubbering child. Large horses graze in the fields the next morning. Wolves try to take down a small mare. A pale stallion trots up and kicks one of the wolves to death. I claim him. The others call him Quietus. It means the final stroke. He reminds me of the Pegasus that saved Andromeda. The songs we sang in Lycos spoke of horses. I know Eo would have liked a chance to ride one. I do not realize, till days later, that when they named my horse Quietus, they were mocking me 
for my part in Titus's death. Chapter 30 House Diana A month passes. In the wake of Titus's death, House Mars becomes stronger. The strength comes not from the high drafts, but from the dregs, from my tribe and the mid drafts. I have outlawed the abuse of slaves. The Ceres slaves, though still skittish around Vixus and a few of the others, provide our food and fires. They are good for little else. Fifty goats and sheep have been gathered in the castle in case of a siege. So too has firewood been stockpiled. But we have no water. The pumps to the washroom shut off after the first day, and we have no buckets to store water inside in case of a siege. I doubt it was an accident. We hammer shields into basins and use helmets to bring water from the river glen below our high castle. We cut down trees and carve them hollow to make troughs in which to store the water. Stones are pulled up and a well is dug, but we cannot dig far enough to get past the mud. Instead, we line the well with stone and timber and try to use it as a tank for water. It always leaks, so we have our troughs, and that is it. We cannot let ourselves be besieged. The keep is cleaner. After seeing what happened to Titus, I ask Cassius to teach me the blade. I'm an unreasonably fast study. I learn with a straight. I never use my sling blade. It already is like part of my body. And the point is, not to learn how to use the straight blade, which is much like the razors, but to learn how it will be used against me. I also do not want Cassius to learn how to fight the curved blade. If he ever finds out about Julian, the curve is my only hope. I am not as proficient in cravat. I can't do the kicks. I learn how to break tracheas, though, and I learn how to properly use my hands. No more windmill punches. No more foolish defence. I am deadly and fast, but I do not like the discipline cravat requires. I want to be an efficient fighter, that is all. Cravat seems intent on teaching me inner peace. That is a lost cause. Yet now I hold my hands like Cassius, like Julian, in the air, elbows at eye level, so I am always striking or blocking downward. Sometimes Cassius will mention Julian, and I will feel the darkness rise. I think of the proctors watching and laughing about this. I must look like an evil, manipulative thing. I forget that Cassius, Roke, Severo and I are enemies. Red and gold. I forget that one day I might have to kill them all. They call me brother, and I cannot but think of them in the same way. The battle with House Minerva has broken down into a series of war-band skirmishes, neither side gaining enough advantage over the other to ever score a decisive victory. Mustang will not risk the pitched battle that I want, nor can they really be goaded. They're not so easily tempted as my soldiers are to bouts of glory or violence. Still, the Minervans are desperate to capture me. Pax turns into a madman when he sees me. Mustang even tried offering Antonia, or so Antonia claims, a mutual defence compact, a dozen horses, six stunpikes and seven slaves in exchange for me. I don't know if she is lying when she tells me this. You would betray me in a heartbeat if it got you to Primus, I tell her. Yes, she says irritably, as I interrupt her fastidious nail maintenance. But since you expect it, it shan't really be a betrayal, darling. Then why didn't you accept the offer? Oh, the dregs look up to you. It would be disastrous at this point. Maybe after you have failed at something. Yes, maybe then, when the momentum is against you. Or you're waiting for a higher price. Exactly, darling. Neither of us mentions Severo. I know she's still afraid he'll cut her throat if she touches me. 
He follows me now, wearing his wolf skin. Sometimes he walks. Sometimes he rides a small black mare. He does not like armor. Wolves approach him at random, as though he were one of their own pack. They come to eat deer he kills because they've grown hungry as we lock away the goats and sheep. Pebble always leaves them food at the walls whenever we slaughter a beast. She watches them like a child as they come in fours and threes. I killed their pack leader, Severo says when I ask why the wolves follow him. He looks me up and down and flashes me an impish grin from beneath the wolf pelt. Don't worry, I wouldn't fit in your skin. I've given Severo the dregs to command because I know they might be the only people he'll ever like. At first, he ignores them. Then, slowly, I begin noticing that more unearthly howls fill the night than before. The others call them the Howlers, and after a few nights under Severo's tutelage, each wears a black wolf cloak. There are six. Severo, Thistle, Screwface, Clown, Pebble, and Weed. When you look at them, it seems as though each of their passive faces stares out from the open, fanged maw of a wolf. I use them for quiet tasks. Without them, I'm not sure I would still be leader. My soldiers whisper slurs about me as I pass. The old wounds have not healed. I need a victory, but Mustang will not meet in combat, and the thirty-meter walls of House Minerva are not as easy to pass as they were initially. In our war room, Severo paces back and forth and calls the game stupidly designed. They had to know we couldn't gory well get past each other's walls, and no one is dumb enough to send out a force they can't afford to lose, especially not Mustang. Pax might. He's an idiot built like a god but an idiot and he wants your balls. I hear you popped one of his. Both. Should just put Pebble or Goblin in a catapult and launch them over the wall, Cassius suggests. Of course, we'd have to find a catapult. I'm tired of this war with Mustang. Somewhere in the south or west, the jackal is building his strength. Somewhere my enemy the arch-governor's son is readying to destroy me. We are looking at this the wrong way, I tell Severo, Quinn, Roke, and Cassius. They're alone with me in the war room. An autumn breeze brings in the smell of dying leaves. Oh, do share your wisdom, Cassius says with a laugh. He's lying on several chairs, his head in Quinn's lap. She plays with his hair. We're dying to hear. This is a school that has existed for, what, more than 300 years? So, every permutation has been seen. Every problem we face has been designed to be overcome. Severo, you say the fortresses cannot be taken. Well, the proctors have to know that. So that means we have to change the paradigm. We need an alliance. Against whom? Severo asks, hypothetically. Against Minerva, Roke answers. Stupid idea, Severo grunts, and cleans a knife and slides it into his black sleeve. Their castle is tactically inconsequential. No value. None. The land we need is near the river. Think we need Ceres' ovens? Quinn asks. I could do it some bread. We all could. A diet of meat and berries has made us muscle and bones. If the game lasts through the winter, yeah. Severo pops his knuckles. But these fortresses don't break. Stupid game. So we need their bread and their access to the water. We have water, Cassius reminds him. Severo sighs in frustration. We have to leave the castle to get it, Sir Numbnuts. A real siege 
We'd last five days without replenishing our water. Seven if we drank the animal's blood like Morgdy. We need Ceres's fortress. Also, the harvest pricks can't fight to save their lives, but they have something in there. Harvest pricks? Ha ha ha! Cassius crows. Stop talking, everyone. I say. They don't. To them, this is fun. It's a game. They have no urgency, no desperate need. Every moment we waste is a moment the jackal builds his strength. Something in the way Mustang and Fitchner talked about him scares me. Or is it the fact that he's the son of my enemy? I should want to kill him. Instead, I want to run and hide at the thought of his name. It's a sign of my fading leadership that I have to stand up. Quiet, I say. And finally, they are. We've seen fires on the horizon. War consumes the south where the jackal roams. Cassius chuckles at the idea of the jackal. He thinks him a ghost I conjured up. Will you stop laughing at everything? I snap at Cassius. It's not a gory damn joke, unless you think your brother died for amusement. That shuts him up. Before we do anything else, I stress, we must eliminate House Minerva and Mustang. Mustang, Mustang, Mustang. I think you just want a snake, Mustang. Severo sneers. Quinn makes a sound of objection. I snatch Severo's collar and lift him up into the air with one hand. He tries to dart away, but he's not as fast as me, so he dangles from my grip two feet off the ground. Not again, I say, lowering him nearer my face. Registers, Reap. His beady eyes are inches from my own. Off limits. I set him down, and he straightens his collar. So... It's to the Great Woods for this alliance, right? Yes. Then it's to be a merry quest, Cassius declares, sitting up. We'll be a troop. No, just me and Goblin. You aren't going, I say. I'm bored. I think I'll come with. You're staying, I say. I need you here. Is that an order? He asks. Yes. Severo says. Cassius stares at me. You! Giving me orders! He says in a strange way. Perhaps you've forgotten that I go where I want. So you leave control to Antonia while we both go risk our necks? I ask. Quinn's hand tightens on his forearm. She thinks I don't notice. Cassius looks back at her and smiles. Of course, Reaper. Of course I'll stay here. Just as you've suggested. Severo and I make camp in the southern highlands, within view of the great woods. We do not light a fire. Our scouts and others roam these hills at night. I see two horses on a far hill silhouetted against the setting sun behind the bubble roof. The way the sun catches on the roof makes sunsets of purples and reds and pinks. It reminds me of the streets of Yorkton, as seen from the sky. Then it is gone, and Severo and I sit in darkness. Severo thinks this is a stupid game. Then why do you play it? I ask. How was I to know what it'd be like? Think I got a pamphlet? Did you get a slagging pamphlet? He asks irritably. He's picking his teeth with a bone. Stupid. Yet he seemed to know on the shuttle what the passage was. I tell him that. I didn't. And you seem to have every gory skill required for this school. So, if your mother was good in bed, you suppose she's a pink? Everyone adapts. Lovely, I mutter. He tells me to cut to the point of it. You snuck into the keep and stole our standard and buried it, saving it, 
and then you manage to steal Minerva's piece. Yet you don't get a single bar of merit for Primus. Doesn't that strike you as odd? No. Be serious. What should I say? I've never been liked. He shrugs. I wasn't born pretty and tall like you and your butt boy Cassius. I had to fight for what I want. That doesn't make me likable. Just makes me a nasty little goblin. I tell him what I've heard. He was the last one drafted. Fitzner didn't want him, but the drafters insisted. Severo watches me in the dark. He doesn't speak. You were picked because you were the smallest boy, the weakest looking. Terrible scores and so small. They drafted you like they drafted all the other low drafts, because you'd be easy to kill in the passage. A sacrificial lamb for someone they had plans for, big plans. You killed Priam, Severo. That's why they won't let you be Primus. Am I on target? You're on target. I killed them like I'd kill a pretty dog. Quick. Easy. He spits the bone onto the ground. And you killed Julian. Am I on target? We never speak of the passage again. In the morning, we leave the highlands behind for the foothills. Trees intersperse with grass. We move at a gallop in case Minerva's war bands are near. I see one in the distance as we reach the trees. They didn't see us. Far to the south, the sky is smoke. Crows gather over the jackal's domain. I would like to say more to Severo. Ask about his life but his gaze penetrates too deep. I don't want him to ask about me, to see through me as easily as I saw through Titus. It is strange. This boy likes me. He insults me, but he likes me. Even stranger, I desperately want him to like me. Why? I think it is because I feel as though he's the only one, including Roke and Cassius, who understands life. He is ugly in a world where he should be beautiful. And because of his deficiencies, he was chosen to die. He, in many ways, is no better than a red. I want to tell him I'm a red. Some part of me thinks he is too. And some other part of me thinks he'll respect me more if he knows I am a red. I was not born privileged. I am like him but I guard my tongue. There's no doubt the proctors watch us. Quietus does not like the woods. At first, the shrubbery is so thick that we must cut our way forward with our swords. But soon the shrubbery thins and we enter the realm of god trees. Little else can exist here. The colossuses block the light their roots stretching up like tentacles to sap the energy from the soil as they grow tall as buildings. I am in a city again, one where animals bustle, and tree trunks instead of metal and concrete obstruct my view. Then, as we venture deeper into the woods, I'm reminded of my mine, dark and cramped beneath the boughs, as though there is no sky or sun. Autumn leaves the size of my chest crinkle underfoot. I know we are being watched. Severo does not like this. He wants to slink away to find the eyes at our backs. That would defeat the purpose, I tell him. That would defeat the purpose, he mocks. We break for a lunch of pillaged olives and goat meat. The eyes in the trees think I'm too stupid to shift my paradigm, as though I would never suppose they'd hide above me instead of on the ground. Yet, I don't look up. No need to frighten the idiots, or let them know I know their game. I'll have to conquer them soon, if I still am the leader of my house. I wonder if they have ropes to traverse the trees, or are the limbs wide enough?
Severo still itches to pull out his knives and scale one of the trees. I shouldn't have brought him. He's not meant for diplomacy. At last, someone chooses to speak at me. Hello, Mars, one says. Other voices echo it to my right. Stupid children. Should have saved their tricks for the night. It would be miserable in these woods in the dark, voices coming from all around. Something startles the horses. The goddess Diana's animals are the bear, the boar, and the deer. We brought spears for the first two. There are supposed to be huge bloodbacks in these woods, monstrous bears made by carvers because, most likely, the carvers grew bored of making deerlings. We hear the bloodbacks roaring in the deeper parts of the wood. I settle quietus. My name is Darrow, leader of House Mars. I'm here to meet with your primus if you have one. If you don't, your leader will suffice. And if you don't have one of those either, take me to whoever has the biggest balls. Silence. Thank you for your assistance, Severo calls out. I raise an eyebrow at him, and he just shrugs. The silence is silly. It is to make me think they aren't taking orders from me. They do things on their own schedule. What big boys and girls they are. Then two tall girls come from behind a distant tree. They wear fatigues the colour of the woods, bows hanging from their backs, knives in their boots. I think one has a knife in her coiled hair. They've used the berries of the woods to paint the hunting moon on their faces. Animal pelts dangle from their belts. I do not look like war. I have washed my hair till it shines. My face is clean, wounds covered, the tears in my black fatigues stitched. I even washed out the sweat stains with sand and animal fat. I look, as Quinn and Leah both confirmed, devilishly handsome. I do not want House Diana intimidated. That's why I let Severo come. He looks ridiculous and childish, so long as his knives are kept away. These two girls smirk at Severo and can't help but soften their eyes when they see me. More come down. They take most of our weapons, those they can find, and they throw furs over our faces so we cannot know the way to their fortress. I count the steps. Severo counts too. The firs stink of rot. I hear woodpeckers, and I remember Fitchner's prank. We must be close, so I stumble and fall to the ground. No shrubbery. We're spun around again, then led away from the woodpeckers. At first I'm worried that these hunters are smarter than I gave them credit for. Then I realize they are not. Woodpeckers again. Hey, Tamara, we got them down here. Don't bring them up, you chowderheads, a girl shouts. We're not letting them have a free scouting party. How many times do I... Just wait, I'll come down. They walk me somewhere and shove me against a tree. A boy speaks over my shoulder. His voice is slow and languid, like a drifting knife blade. I say we peel the balls off. Shut up, Tactus. Just make them slaves, Tamara. There isn't diplomacy here. Look at his blade. Fraggin Reaper Scythe. Ah, oh, so that's him, someone says. I claim his blade when we decide spoils. I'd also like his scalp if no one else has intentions on it. Tactus sounds like a very unpleasant boy. Shut up, all of you, a girl snaps. Tactus, put that knife away. They take the fur from my head. I stand with Severo in a small grove of trees. I see no castle, but I can hear the woodpeckers. I look around and receive a sharp strike to the head from a lean, wiry youth with bored eyes 
and Bronze hair spiked up with sap and red berry juice. His skin is dark like oak honey, and his high cheekbones and deep set eyes give him a look of permanent derision. So, you're who they call the Reaper, Tactus draws. He swings my blade experimentally. Well, you just look too pretty to be much damage at all. Is he flirting with me? I ask the Tamara girl. Tactus, go away. Thank you, but now go away, says the thin, hawkish girl. Her hair is shorter than mine. Three large boys flank her. The way they glare at Tactus confirms my judgment of his character. Reaper, why are you with the pygmy? Tactus asks gesturing to Severa. Does he shine your boots? Pick things out of your hair? He chuckles to the other boys. Maybe a butler? Go away, Tactus. Tamara snarls. Of course. Tactus bows. I shall go play with the other children, mother. He tosses the blade to the ground and winks at me like we alone know the joke that's about to be played. Sorry about that, Tamara says. He's not quite polite. It's fine, I say. I am Tamara of, I almost said my real family, she laughs, of Diana. And they are, I ask about the boys. My bodyguard. And you are, she holds up a finger. Let me guess, let me guess. Reaper. Oh, we've heard of you. House Minerva doesn't like you at all. Severo snorts at my infamy. And he is? She asks with raised eyebrows. My bodyguard. Bodyguard? But he's so very short. And you look like, Severo growls. So are wolves, I reply interrupting Severo mid-curse. We're more afraid of jackals here than wolves. Maybe Cassia should have come along, just to know I'm not making the bastard up. I ask her about the jackal, but she ignores my question. Help me out here, Tamara says cordially. If someone were to say that Reaper of the Butcher House would come to my glade and ask for diplomacy... I would think it a proctor's joke. So, what do you really want? House Minerva off my back. So you can come here and fight us instead? One of her bodyguards growls. I turn to Tamara with a reasonable smile and tell her the truth. I want Minerva off my back so I can come here and beat you, sure. And then win the stupid game and destroy your civilization, please. They laugh. Well, you're honest, but not too bright, so it seems. Fitting. Let me tell you something, Reaper. Our proctor says your house is not one in years. Why? Because you butchers are like a wildfire. In the early stages of the game, you burn everything you touch. You destroy. You consume. You ruin houses because you can't sustain yourselves. But then you starve because there is nothing more to burn. The sieges, the winter, the advance in technology, it kills your bloodlust, your famous rage. So tell me, why would I shake hands with a wildfire when I can just sit back and watch it run out of things to consume? I nod and dangle the bait. Fire can be useful. Explain. We may starve while you watch, but will you watch as a slave of some other house? Or will you watch from your strong fortress, your armies twice as large and ready to sweep up the ashes? Not enough. I will personally promise that House Mars will brook no aggression toward House Diana so long as our agreement is not violated. If you can help me take Minerva, I will help you. Take Ceres. House Ceres. 
she says, looking over to our bodyguards. Don't be greedy, I say. If you go after Ceres on your own, both Mars and Minerva will set upon you. Yes, yes. She waves an annoyed hand. Ceres is near? Very. And they have bread. I look at the pelts her men wear, which I imagine would be a nice change from all that meat. Her weight shifts on her toes, and I know I have her. Always negotiate with food. I make a note. Tamara clears her throat. So you were saying I could make my army twice as large? Chapter 31 The Fall of Mustang I ride dressed for war, all in black, hair wild and bound by goat gut, forearms covered with durasteel vambraces looted in battle. My durasteel cuirass is black and light. It'll deflect any edge less than an iron blade or a razor. My boots are muddy. Streaks of black and red go across my face. Sling blade on my back. Knives everywhere. Nine red crossbones and ten wolves cover Quietus's flank. Leah painted them. Each crossbone is an incapacitated opponent who are often healed by medbots and then thrown back into the fray. Each wolf a slave. Cassius rides at my side. He shimmers. The juro steel he received as a bounty is polished as bright as his glimmering sword and his hair, which bounces like coiled golden springs about his regal head. It's as though he's never been stood around and pissed on. Well, I do believe I am the lightning, Cassius declares, and you, my brooding friend, are the thunder. And what am I? Roke asks, kicking his horse up beside us. Mud flies. The wind? You're full enough of it, I snort. The hot sort. The house rides behind us. All of it except Quinn and June, who stay behind as our castle's garrison. It's a gamble. We ride slowly so that Minerva knows we are coming. What they do not know is that I was there in the night just hours before and that Sebro is there now. Mud still sticks underneath my fingernails. Minerva's scouts dart across their rocky hilltops. They make a show of mocking us, but really they count our number to better know our strategy. Yet they seem confused when we ride into their country of high grass and olive trees, so confused that they withdraw their scouts behind their walls, We've never come in full force like this. The Howlers, our scouts, ride in full view on their black horses, black cloaks fluttering like crow wings. Our high-draft killers move as the vanguard of the main body, cruel Vixus, craggy Pollux, spiteful Cassandra, many of Titus's band. The slaves jog about their owners, those who captured them. I ride forward with Cassius and Antonia flanking me. She carries the standard today. Only a few archers man the walls, so I tell Cassius to make sure we're not ambushed from the flanks, in case any of Minerva are about. He gallops away. Minerva's fortress is ringed by a hundred metres of barren earth made mud from the torrential rains of the last week. It's the killing field. Step into the ring and the archers will try to kill your horse. If you still do not retreat, they will try to kill you. Nearly twenty horses of both houses litter the field. Cassius led a bloody assault on a Minervan warband up to the very gates of the castle itself just two days before. Beyond the killing field is grass. Oceans of grass, so high in some places that Severo could stand tall and still not be seen. We stand at the edge of the mud ring, amidst a meadow of autumn wildflowers. The ground squishes underfoot, and Quietus whinnies beneath me. Pax! I then shout. Pax! 
I hurl the name against the walls, until their main gate opens ponderously, as ponderously as it once opened that night when Cassius and I snuck inside. Mustang rides out. She trots slowly through the mud and pulls short of us. Her eyes take in everything. Is it to be a duel? She asks with a grin. Packs of wise and noble Minerva versus the reaper of the bloody butcher house. You make it sound so exciting, Antonia yawns. She's not got a spot of dirt on her. Mustang ignores her. And you're sure you've no one hiding in that grass waiting to ambush us when we come out to support our champion? Mustang asks me. Should we burn it and find out? We've brought everyone, Antonia says. You know our numbers. Yes, I can count, thank you. Mustang doesn't look at her, just at me. She seems worried. Her voice lowers. Pax will hurt you. Pax, how are your balls? I shout over her head. She winces as a drum beats suddenly from inside the fortress, except it's not a drum. Pax comes out of the gate. His war axe thumps his shield. Mustang shouts him back and he obeys like a dog, but the beating of the axe on the shield does not cease. We agreed that the stakes should be all the remaining slaves between the two of us. A hefty bounty. I thought Handsome was the duelist, Mustang says, then shrugs. Her eyes keep going to the grass. Where is that mad fellow? Your shadow, the one who leads that wolf pack. Is he hiding in the grass? I don't want him popping up behind me again. I shout for several. A hand rises amongst the howlers. Mud covers the faces that peer out from beneath the black wolf cloaks. Mustang counts. All five howlers accounted for. In fact, all our forces, save one, Quinn, are accounted for. Still, Mustang isn't satisfied. We are to remove our army 600 metres from the edge of the mud ring. She will burn away all the grass within 100 metres of where we now stand. When the grass is done burning, the scorched earth will be the jewel field. Ten men of her choosing will join ten of my choosing in creating a circle in which to fight. The rest of hers will stay inside the city, and mine will stay six hundred metres removed. Don't trust me, I ask. I don't have men in the grass. Good. Then no one will burn. No one burns. When the fire dwindles and the ground is all ash and smoke and mud within the killing field, I leave my army. Ten of mine accompany me. Pax thumps his war axe on a shield emblazoned with a woman's head, her hair all of snakes. Medusa. I've never fought a man with a shield before. His armor is tight and covers everything but his joints. I have to stun pike in the hand I've painted red and a sling blade in the hand I've painted black. My heart rattles as the circle forms around us. Cassius motions me over. Even in the muted light he glows with colour. He shares an ironic smile. Never stop moving. It's like cravat, this. He eyes Pax. And you're faster than this gory bastard, right? I get a wink. He thumps me on the shoulder. Right, brother? Damn right. I return his wink. Thunder and lightning, brother. Thunder and lightning. Pax is built like an obsidian. He's over seven feet tall, easily, and he moves like a bloody damn panther. In this point three seven grav, he could throw me thirty meters or more. I wonder how high he can jump. I jump to stretch my legs. Nearly three meters. I can easily clear his head. The ground still smokes. Jump. 
Chomp, little grasshopper, he grumbles. It'll be the last time you use your legs. What's that? I ask. I said it'll be the last time you use your legs. Odd, I murmur. He blinks at me and frowns. What's odd? You sound like a girl. Did something happen to your balls? You little... Mustang trots up with her standard and says something about girls never challenging each other to stupid duels. The duel is to... Yielding, Pax says impatiently. To the death, I correct. Really, it doesn't matter. I'm just screwing with them at this point. All I have to do is give the signal. To yielding, Mustang confirms. She finishes necessaries, and the duel begins. Almost. A series of pops in the sky above signal sonic booms as the proctors come to join us from Olympus. They spin down from their high-floating mountain, coming from several different towers. Each wears his or her sign today, great headpieces of glittering gold. Their armour is a spectacle. They do not need it, but they love to dress up. Today they've brought a table with them. It floats on its own grav lift, supporting huge flagons of wine and trays of food as they set to having a dinner party. I hope we're sufficient entertainment, I cry up. Mind dropping some wine? It's been a while. Good luck against the Titan, little mortal, Mercury cries down. His baby face laughs jovially, and he slowly brings a flagon of wine to his lips. Some of it tumbles the quarter mile from the sky to fall on my armour. It drips down like blood. I suppose we ought to give them a show, Pax booms. Pax and I share a real grin. It's a compliment of sorts, that they would all come to what? Then Neptune, her trident headdress wobbling as she swallows a quail egg, shouts for us to get on with it, and Pax's axe sweeps at my legs like an evil broom. I know he wants me to jump, because he's about to charge forward with his shield to swat me from the air like a fly. So I step back, then spring forward as his arm finishes its stroke. He's moving too, but upward in anticipation, so I shoot right past his right arm and jab the stun pike into his armpit with all of my strength. It snaps in half. But he doesn't fall, even as electricity courses through him. Instead, he backhands me so hard that I fly through the circle and into the mud. Broken molar, mouthful of mud and blood. Whiplash. I'm already rolling. I stumble to my feet with my sling blade. Mud covers me. I glance at the walls. Their army rings the parapet. Couldn't help but watch the champions fight. This is the point. I could give the signal. The gates are open in case they have to send aid. Our nearest horseman is 600 metres away, much too far. I planned for that. Yet, I do not signal. I want my own victory today, even if it's a selfish one. My army has to know why I lead. I come back into the circle. I have nothing clever to say. He's stronger. I'm faster. That's all we've learned about one another. This is not like Cassius's fight. There is no pretty form. Only brutality. He bashes me with his shield. I stay close so he can't swing his axe. The shield is ruining my shoulder. Every strike shoots agony into my molar. He lunges with it again and I jump, pull on the shield with my left hand and launch myself over him. A knife flickers from my wrist and I stab it at his eyes as I pass. I miss and scrape his helmet's visor. Putting a little distance between us, I reach for a knife and try a familiar trick. He bats the flying blade away contemptuously with his shield, but when he lowers it to look at me, I'm in the air, landing on his shield with all my weight. The suddenness of it pulls the shield down just a hair. I slam mud into his helmet with my offhand. He's blind. 
One hand holds the axe, one holds the shield. Neither can wipe his visor clean. It'd be a simple matter if he could just do that. But he can't. I hit him a dozen times on his wrist till he drops his axe. Then I take the monstrous thing and hit him on the helmet with it. The armor still doesn't break. He almost knocks me unconscious with his shield. I swing the heavy axe again and finally Pax crumples. I fall to a knee, panting. Then I howl. They all howl. Howls fill the lands of Minerva. Howls from my far distant army. Howls from my ten high draft killers who help make this dueling circle. Howls from the killing field. Mustang hears the dread sound behind her and she wheels her horse. Her face is one of terror. Howls from the laughing proctors except Minerva, Apollo and Jupiter. Howls from the bellies of the dead horses in the middle of the killing field, the ones near her open gate. They're in the mud! Mustang shouts. She's almost right. But she thinks like a gold. Someone screams as they see Severo and his howlers cutting their way out of the stitched-up bellies of the dead and bloated horses that litter the mud up to the gate. Like demons being born, they slither from swollen guts and parted stomachs. A half-score of House Diana's best soldiers exit with them. Tactus and his spiked hair burst from the belly of a pale mare. He runs with weed and thistle and clown, all within fifty metres of the ponderously slow gates. The Minervan guards all stand upon the ramparts, watching the duel. They cannot repel the sudden blitz of demon soldiers by closing their slow gates. They hardly manage to knock and draw their bows before Severo, the Howlers, and our allies slip through the closing gate. On the other side of the city, the House Diana's soldiers will be slowly scaling the walls with the ropes they use to climb their silly trees. Yes, the whistle sounds now from the other side. A guard there has seen them. No one will come to help them. My army moves forward. Even the fake howlers we borrowed from Diana and dressed up to look like Severo and his band. We destroy House Minerva in minutes. High above, the proctors still howl and laugh. I think they are drunk. It is over before Mustang can do anything except gallop away across the muddy field through the still smouldering grass. A dozen horses set off in pursuit, Vixus and Cassandra amongst them. She'll be caught before nightfall. And I've seen what Vixus does to prisoners and their ears. So I mount Quietus and set off in pursuit. Mustang abandons her horse at the edge of a small wood to the south. We dismount and leave three men to guard the horses in case she doubles back. Cassandra plunges into the woods. Vixus follows me, purposefully stalking as though I might know where Mustang is hiding. I do not like this. I do not like being in the woods with Vixus and Cassandra. All it would take is a blade in the spine. Either would do it. Unlike Pollux, they still hate me, and my howlers and Cassius are far away. Yet no knife comes. I find Mustang by mistake. Two golden eyes peer out from a pit of mud. They meet mine. Vixus is with me. He swears something about how excited he is to break the gory damn mare, see what she looks like with a bridle on. Standing there, leering into the brush, he looks bent and twisted and evil, like a withered tree after a fire. He has less body fat than anyone I've ever seen, so each of his veins and tendons ripple beneath his tight skin. His tongue flits over his perfect teeth. I know he's goading me, so I lead him away from the mud pit. Eo didn't deserve to die a slave to the society, and despite her colour, Mustang doesn't deserve any sort of bridle. Chapter 32 Antonia I passed this test. 
The interminable war with House Minerva is done. And I've also trapped House Diana. House Diana had three choices before the battle. They could have betrayed me to Minerva and taken my house as slaves, but I had Cassius send pickets to intercept any rider. They could have accepted my proposal, or they could have gone to our castle and tried to take it. I couldn't care less if they chose that option. It was a trap. We left no water inside and could have besieged them easily. Now they have the Minervan fortress, and we are outside in the plains. They could honour their agreement. We would get the standard, they would get the city and all its inhabitants, but I know they'll become greedy. And they do. The gates close, and they think they've a strategic bastion. Good. That's why I have Severo inside with them. Smoke plumes soon rise. He destroys the food stores as they enslave the Minervans and guard the walls from my army. Then he fells the wells with feces and hides with his howlers in the cellars. House Diana is not used to this sort of warfare. They've never really left their woods behind. It is hardly any effort to wait them out. Three days in, and they are apparently still surprised we do not leave. Instead, we camp north and south of the city with our horses and light bonfires all around so they cannot slip away in the night. They are thirsty. Their leader, Tamara, does not receive me. She is too embarrassed at being caught in her betrayal. Eventually, on the fourth day, Tamara offers me ten Minervan slaves and all our enslaved soldiers if I allow her passage home. I send Leah to tell her to go slag herself. Leah giggles like a child when she returns. She flips her hair, grabs my arm, and leans in close to mock Tamara's desperateness. Have decency, she cries. Are you not a man of your word? When they try to break out the fifth night, we capture every last one of them. Except Tamara. She fell from her horse and was trampled to death in the mud. Her saddle was cut through underneath. Severo shows me the cleanly severed strip of leather. Tactus? Probably. His mother's a senator, father's a praetor. Severo spit. Met him when we were children. Beat a girl half to death when she wouldn't kiss him on the cheek. Mad bastard. Let it slide, I say. We can't prove anything. Tactus is our slave, as is all of Diana and Minerva. Even Pax. I sit with Cassius and Roke atop our horses as we watch our new slaves labour in stacking wood and hay throughout the Minervan fortress. They set a massive blaze and we three toast each other in victory. This will be your last bar of merit, Cassius tells me. That makes you primus, brother. He pats my shoulder, and I see only a twinge of jealousy in his eyes. Couldn't be a better pick. Lord on high, I never thought I would see this side of our handsome friend, Roke says. Humility. Cassius, is that truly you? Cassius shrugs. This game is but a year of our lives, maybe less. After that, we have our apprenticeships or academies. After that, we have our lives. I'm only glad that we three were in the same house. Just rewards will be there eventually, for all of us. I squeeze his shoulder. Agreed. He's still looking down unable to meet our eyes till he finds his voice again. I may have lost a brother here. That pain won't fade. But I feel like I've gained two more. He looks up fiercely. And I mean that, lads. I gory well mean that. We'll have to do ourselves proud here. Beat some more houses. Win the whole damn thing but my father will need officers for the ships in his armada. If you are interested, that is. The house Bologna 
always needs Praetors to make us stronger. He says that last part timidly, as though we'd have something better to do. I grip his shoulder once more and nod even as Rogue says something smart-ass about being a politician because he'd rather send people to their deaths than go to his own. The sons of Ares would drool if I became a Praetor to House Bologna. And don't worry, Rogue. I'll mention your poetry to father, Cassius laughs. He's always wanted a warrior bard. Of course, Rogue embellishes. Be sure to let dear Imperator Bologna know that I'm a master with metaphor and a rogue with assonance. Rogue a rogue. Oh, God. I laugh as Severo rides up with Quinn and a girl on a type of horse I have not seen before. The girl wears a bag over her head. Quinn announces her as an emissary from House Pluto. Her name is Lilith, and they found her waiting near the edge of the woods. She wishes to speak with Cassius. Lilith was once a moon-faced girl with cheeks that did smile, but now don't. They are drawn and newly burned pocked and cruel. She's seen hunger, and there's a coldness to her that I don't recognise. I'm frightened. I feel like Mickey when he looked at me. I was a cold, quiet thing he didn't understand. So was she. It's like looking at a fish from an underground river. Lilith's words come slow and linger in the air. I come from the jackal. Call him by his real name, if you will, I suggest. I did not come to speak with you, she says without a hint of emotion. I came for Cassius. Her horse is small and lean, its hooves nicked. Extra clothing makes her saddle fat. I see no weapons other than a crossbow. They are a mountain house. More clothing for colder climates, smaller horses for harder rides. Unless it is deception. I make her show me her ring. It's a mourning tree, the cypress of Pluto. Its roots leak into the ground. Two of her fingers are gone. Burns seal the stumps. So they have iron weapons. Her hair clatters when she moves. I don't know why. She looks me over quietly, as though judging me against her master. Apparently I am lacking. Cassius Albalona. My master desires the reaper. She goes on before either of us can say a word. We're too surprised. Alive, dead, we don't care. In return for him, you will receive fifty of these for your army. She tosses him two iron blades. You can tell your master he should come face me himself, I say. I make no words with dead boys, Lilith says to the air. My master has put the mark on the reaper. Before winter comes... He will be dead, by one hand or another. You can go slag yourself, Cassius replies. She tosses Cassius a small pouch. To help you make your decision. She does not speak again. Quinn raises her eyebrows and shrugs her confusion as she leads Lilith away. I look at the small pouch. Cassius holds in his hands. Paranoia overwhelms me. What is inside? Open it, I say. Nah, no, she's mad as a violet, that one. Cassius laughs. Don't need her to infect us. Yet he tucks the pouch in his boot. I want to scream at him to open it. But I smile as though there is nothing to worry about. Something was wrong in her. Didn't seem human, I say casually. Looked like one of our starved wolves. 
Cassius gives the iron blade a swing. The air shrieks. At least we got these two. Now I can teach you how to duel properly. These'll go straight through duro armor. Dangerous things, really. The jackal knows about me. The thought makes me shiver. Roke's words are worse. Did you notice how her hair clattered? He asks. His face is white. Her braids were laced with teeth. We must prepare to meet the jackal's army. That means consolidating my forces and eliminating lingering threats. I need the remainder of House Diana in the Great Woods destroyed, and I need House Ceres. I sent Cassius with the Howlers and a dozen horsemen to destroy the remainder of Diana. The rest of my army and slaves I take back to our castle to prepare for the jackal. I've not yet devised a plan, but I'll be ready for him if he rears his head. After sleeping in dead horses, our howlers will probably stink them out of the great woods. Cassius laughs as he spurs his horse away from the main column. I'll sick goblin on them and be back before you're even in bed. Severo does not want to go without me. He doesn't understand why Cassius needs his help to mop up the remainders of Diana. I tell him the truth. Cassius has a pouch in his boot, the one Lilith gave him. I need you to steal it. His eyes do not judge, not even now. There are times when I wonder what I did to earn such loyalty. Then others, when I try not to press my look by looking the gift horse in the mouth. That night, as Cassius lays siege to Diana in the Great Woods, the rest of my army feasts behind our tall highland walls in Mars Castle. The keep is clean, and the square merry. Even the slaves are given June's thyme-roasted goat and venison drizzled with olive oil. I watch over it all. The slaves look down out of embarrassment as I pass. Even Pax. The howling wolf on his forehead has crushed his pride. Tactus alone meets my eyes. His dark honey skin is like Quinn's, but his eyes remind me of a pit viper's. He winks at me. After my victory over Pax, my high drafts seem to have finally fully embraced my leadership, even Antonia. It reminds me of how I was treated on the streets after Mickey carved me. I am the gold here. I am the power. It's the first time I've felt this way since sentencing Titus to death. Soon, Vichner will come down and give me the Primus hand from the stone, and all will be well. Roke, Quinn, Leah, and now Pollux eat with me. Even Vixus and Cassandra, who normally sit in commune with Antonia, have come to give their congratulations on the victory. They laugh and clap me on the shoulder. Scipio, Antonia's plaything, is counting the many slaves. Antonia herself does not venture my way, but she does tilt her golden head in approval. Miracles do happen. I am Primus. I have five golden bars. Soon Fitchner will come to bestow the honorifics. In the morning, House Ceres will fall. They have less than one-third our number. With their grain to feed my army and their fortress to use as a base of operations, I will have the power of four houses. We will sweep away whatever is left in the north and then descend upon the south before the first snow even falls. Then I will face the jackal. Roke comes to stand beside me as we watch the feast. I've been thinking of kissing Leah, he says suddenly to me. I see her laughing with several mid-drafts near one of the fires. She's cut her hair short, and she spares us a glance, coquettishly ducking her head when Roke holds her gaze. He blushes, too, and looks away. I thought you didn't like her. She follows you about like a puppy. I laugh. Well, yes. 
At first she didn't intrigue me because I thought she was attaching herself to me as one would to a life raft to stop from sinking. But she's grown. I look over at him and laugh. I can't stop laughing. We look like blonde wolves. We're leaner than when the Institute began. Dirtier. Our hair is long. We have scars. Me more than most. I'm likely too dependent on red meat. One of my molars is split. But I laugh. I laugh till my molar can't take it anymore. I'd forgotten that we are people. Kids who have crushes. Well, don't waste the first kiss, I say. That's my only advice. I tell him to take her somewhere special. Take her somewhere here that means something to him. Or them. I took Eo to my drill. Lauren and Barlow made jokes about that. The thing was off, and in a ventilated tunnel, so we didn't have to wear fry suit lids. Just had to watch for pit vipers. Still, she sweated from excitement. Hair clinging to her face, to the nape of her neck. She gripped my wrist so hard and only let go when she knew she had me. When I kissed her. I grin and slap Roke on the butt for luck. Uncle Nero says it's tradition. He used the flat of a sling blade on me. I think he was lying. I dream of Eo in the night. I do not often sleep without dreaming of her. The castle's high tower bunk beds are empty. Roke, Leah, Cassius, Severo, the Howlers are gone. Except for Quinn, all my friends are off. I am Primus, yet I feel so alone. The fire crackles. Cold autumn wind comes in. It moans like a wind from the abandoned mine tunnels and makes me think of my wife. Eo. I miss her warmth in the bed beside me. I miss her neck. I miss kissing her soft skin, smelling her hair, tasting her mouth as she whispered how she loved me. Then I hear feet, and she fades. Leah bursts through the dormitory door. She talks frantically. I can barely understand her. I stand, towering over her, and put a hand on her shoulder to calm her. It's impossible. Manic eyes look at me from behind her short-cut hair. Roke, she wails. Roke has fallen into a crevice. His legs are broken, I can't reach him. I follow her so fast I don't even bring my cloak or sling blade. The castle is asleep except for the guards. We fly through the gate, forgetting the horses. I shout for one of the guards to come help me. I don't watch to see if she does. Leah runs ahead, guiding me down into the glen, and then up over the northern hills to the highland gulch, where we made our first fires as a tribe. The mists are thick, the night is dark, and I realize how stupid I am. It's a trap. I stop following Leah. I don't tell her. I don't know if they'll come from behind, so I dive to my belly and shuffle to a gully so that I am lost in the mist. I put ferns over myself. I hear them now. The sound of swords, of feet and stunpikes. Curses. How many are there? Leah calls my name frantically. She is not alone now. She has led me to them. I hear crooked vixus. I smell Cassandra's flowers. She's always rubbing them on her skin to cover her body odor. Their voices call to each other in the mist. They know I discovered their trap. How can I get back to my army? I dare not move. How many are there? They look for me. If I run, would I make it? Or would I end up on the end of a sword? I have two knives in my boots. That is it. I pull them out. A reaper! Antonia calls from the mist. She's somewhere above me. Fearless leader. A reaper? There's no need to hide, darling.
We're not mad at you ordering us about like you're our king. We're not indignant enough to bury knives in your eyes. Not at all. Darling! They call taunts, playing on my vanity. I've never had much, but they can't understand that. A boot steps near my head. Green eyes peer through the darkness. I think they see me. They don't. Night optics. Someone gave them night optics. I hear Vixus and Cassandra. Antonia grows frustrated. Reaper, if you do not come out to play, there shall be consequences. She sighs. What consequences, you ask? Why? I will cut little Leah's throat to the bone. I hear a yelp as Leah's hair is seized. Rogue's lover. I don't come out. God damn it. I don't come out. My life is more than my own. It is Eos, my family's. I cannot throw it away, not for my pride, not for Leah, not to avoid the pain of losing another friend. Do they have Roke too? My jaw aches. I clench my teeth. My molar screams. Antonia won't do it. She can't. Last chance, my darling. No. There's a meaty sound, followed by a gurgle and a thump as a body crumples to the ground. Pity. I lose a silent scream as I see the medbot whine through the night's mist. For all the power in my hands, in my body, I'm powerless to stop this. Them. I do not move until the early morning, when I am sure they are gone. The medbots did not take Leah's body away. The proctors left it so I would know she died, so I could not hold on to hope that somehow she lived. The bastards. Her body is fragile in death, like a little bird that has fallen from the nest. I build a cairn over her. The stones are high, but they will not keep the wolves away. I do not find Rogue's body, so I do not know what has become of him. Is my friend dead? I feel a ghost as I pick my way along the highlands, circling around the castle to avoid Antonia's henchmen. I put myself on the path Cassius will take in returning from the Great Woods, hiding beneath shrubs to stay from sight. It is midday when he returns, at the head of a small column of horse and slaves. He kicks his horse forward to greet me as I come from the shrubs. Brother, he calls. I brought you a gift. He hops off and gives me a hug, before pulling out one of Diana's tapestries and wrapping it about my shoulders. He pulls back from me. You're as pale as a ghost. What's the matter? He picks a leaf out of my hair. Maybe that's when he sees the sadness in my eyes. Severo rides up behind him as I tell them what has happened. The bitch, Cassius murmurs. Severo is silent. Poor Leah. Poor Leah. She was a sweetheart. Do you think Rogue is dead? I don't know, I say. I just don't know. Gory damn. Cassius shakes his head. A proctor must have given Antonia night optics, Severo speculates. Or the jackal bribed her. It fits. Who cares about that? Cassius cries flinging out his arm. Roke may be wounded or dead out there, man. Don't you register? He grips the back of my neck and brings my forehead to his. We'll find him, Darrow. We'll find our brother. I nod, feeling a numbness spreading in my chest. Antonia never returned to our castle. Neither did her henchmen, Vixus and Cassandra. They failed to kill me and must have fled. But to where? Quinn flings her hands up in the air and shouts at us as we come through the gate. I didn't know where the gory blazes anyone was. The slaves outnumbered us four to one till you got back. 
but it's fine. It's fine. She grips Cassius's hand when we tell her what's happened. The tears well in her eyes for Leah, but she refuses to believe Roke is dead. She keeps shaking her head. We can use the slaves to search for Roke. Probably wounded and hiding out there. That's it. That has to be it. We do not find him. The entire army searches. Not a sign. We convene in our war room around the long table. He's probably dead at the bottom of a ditch, Severo says that night. I almost hit him, but he's right. The jackal did this, I mutter. Tough shit, he says. Come again? Doesn't matter if he did it, is what Severo means. We can't do anything against the jackal now. Even if he tried to take your life, we're not in a position to hurt him, Quinn declares. Let's deal with our neighbours first. Stupid, Severo mutters. What a surprise. It looks like Goblin disagrees, Cassius snaps. Speak up if you've got something in your craw, pygmy. Don't talk down to me, Severo sneers. Cassius chuckles. Don't piss on my foot because you only come to my knees. I'm every bit your equal. The look on Severo's face is such that I lean forward suddenly, frightened a knife will suddenly appear in Cassius's eye. My equal? At what? Birth? Cassius grins. Oh, wait, I meant height, looks, intelligence, money. Shall I stop? Quinn kicks his chair hard with her foot. What the hell is your problem? She snaps at him. Never mind, just shut the hell up. Severo looks at the ground. I have this sudden urge to put a hand on his shoulder. What were you saying, Severo? Quinn asks. Nothing. Come on. He said nothing. Cassius chuckles. Cassius. My voice alone shuts him up. Severo, please. Severo sighs and looks up at me, cheeks flushed with anger. Just thought we should not pick our butts here while the jackal does whatever he wants. He shrugs. Send me south, and let me cause trouble. Trouble? Cassius asks. What are you going to do, kill the jackal? Yes. Severo looks quietly at Cassius. I'll put a dagger in his throat, and then carve a hole till I see his spine. The tension is enough to make me uneasy. You can't be serious, Quinn says quietly. He's serious. Cassius's forehead creases. And he's wrong. We're not monsters. Not you and I, at least, Darrow. Bologna Praetors aren't knives in the night. We have five hundred years of honour to guard. Piss and lies. Severo dismisses him with a wave. It's in the breeding. Cassius elevates his nose ever so slightly. Severo's mouth twists cruelly. You're a pixie if you buy all that. Think your papa cut his way up to Imperator by being honourable? Call it chivalry, goblin, Cassius sneers. It wouldn't be right trying to murder someone in cold blood, particularly not at a school. I agree with Cassius, I say, breaking my silence. Small wonder. Zevro stands to leave very suddenly. I ask him where he is going. You obviously don't need me. Have all the advice you can handle. Severo. I'm going to search the ditches again. Bet Bologna wouldn't do that. Wouldn't get his precious knees dirty. He bows mockingly to Cassius before leaving. Quinn, Cassius and I remain in the war room until Cassius yawns something about catching a bit of REM before the dawn hits in six hours. Quinn and I are left alone. Her hair has been cut short and jagged though the bangs hang just over her narrow eyes. 
She slouches boyishly in her chair and picks at her nails. What are you thinking on? She asks me. Roke. And Leah. I hear the gurgle in my mind. With it echoes all the sounds of death. Eo's pop. Julian's silence as he twitched in his own blood. I am the reaper, and death is my shadow. Is that all? She asks. I think we should grab some sleep, I reply. She says nothing as she watches me leave. Chapter 33 Apologies Cassius wakes me in the middle of the night. Severo found Roke, he says. He's a mess. Come. Where? North. They can't move him. We gallop away from the castle under the light of twin moons. An early winter snow fills the air with dancing flurries. Sucking sounds come from the mud as we head north toward the North Matos. No sounds but the gurgling of the water and the wind and the trees. Wiping sleep from my eyes, I look over to Cassius. He has our two iron swords. And suddenly a pit opens in my stomach as I realize what's what. He doesn't know where Roke is, but he knows something else. He knows what I have done. This is a trap I cannot ride away from. I guess there are those times in life. It's like staring at the ground as you fall from a height. Seeing the end coming doesn't mean you can dodge it, fix it, stop it. We ride for twenty more minutes. It was no surprise, Cassius says suddenly. What's that? I've known for over a year that Julian was meant to die. The snow falls silently as we move together through the mud. The hot horse moves between my legs. Step by step, through the mud. He made a mess of his test. He was never the brightest, not in the way they wanted. Though he was kind and bright with emotions, he could sense sadness or anger a click away. But empathy is a low-color thing. I say nothing. There are feuds that do not change, Darrow. Cats and dogs, ice and fire, Augustus and Bologna, my family and the arch-governors. Cassius's eyes are fixed ahead, even as his horse stumbles and his breath makes fog in the air. But despite what it portended, Julian was excited when he received the acceptance letter stamped with the arch-governor's personal seal. Didn't seem right to me, or my other brothers. Never thought Julian would be the sort to make it in. I loved him, all my brothers and cousins did. But you met him. Oh, you've met him. He wasn't the keenest of mind, but he wasn't the dullest. He wouldn't have been the bottom one per cent. No need to cull him from the stock. But he had the name Bologna, a name which our enemy loathes. And so our enemy used bureaucracy, used his title, his duly appointed powers, to murder a kind boy. To turn down an invitation to the Institute is an illegal act. He was so delighted, and we, my mother and father and brothers and sisters and cousins and loved ones, were so hopeful for him. He trained so hard. His voice takes a mocking tone. But in the end, Julian was fed to the wolves. Or should I say, wolf? He pulls his horse to a halt, eyes burning into me. How did you find out? I ask, staring ahead over the dark water. Flakes of snow disappear into the black surface. The mountains are but shadowed mounds in the distance. The river gurgles. 
I do not dismount. That you did Augustus's dirty work? He laughs scornfully. I trusted you, Darrow. So I did not need to see what the jackal sent me. But when Severo tried to steal it from me, as I slept in the great woods, I knew something was the matter. He notices my reaction. What? You thought you consorted with dullards? Sometimes, yes. Well, I watched it tonight. A hollow. With Roke and Leah, I'd forgotten about the package. Better that I had. Better that I had trusted him and not sent Severo to steal it. Maybe he would have discarded it then. Maybe things would be different. Watched what? I ask. A hollow that shows you killing Julian, brother. The jackal got a hollow, I snort. His proctor gave it to him then. Guess that means the game is rigged. Suppose it doesn't matter to you that the jackal is the arch-governor's son, and that he's manipulating you into getting rid of me. He flinches. Didn't know the jackal was his son, eh? I reckon you'd recognize him if you saw him, and that's why he sent Lilith. I wouldn't recognize him. I've never met the bastard spawn. He kept them hidden from us before the Institute, and my family kept me from him after... His voice fades, and his eyes sink into a distant memory. We can beat him together, Cassius. We needn't be divided. Because you killed my brother, he spits. There is no we, you feckless quim. Get off your gory damn horse. I dismount, and Cassius throws me one of the iron swords. I stand facing my friend in the mud. No one to watch but the crows and the moons and the proctors. My sling blade is on the saddle. It, at least, has a curve. But it's useless against an iron blade. Cassius is going to kill me. I didn't have a choice, I tell him. I hope you know that. You will rot in hell, you manipulative son of a bitch, he cries. You allowed me to call you brother. So what would you have had me do? Should I have let Julian kill me in the passage? Would you? That freezes him. It's how you killed him. He's quiet for a moment. We come as princes, and this school is supposed to teach us to become beasts. But you came a beast. I laugh bitterly. And what were you when you ripped apart Titus? I was not like you, Cassius shouts. I let you kill him, Cassius, so the house wouldn't remember that a dozen boys took a good long piss on your face, so don't treat me as though I'm some monster. You are, he sneers. Oh, shut your goddamned gob, and let's just cut to it, hypocrite. The duel is not long. I have been practicing with him for months. He has played at duels his entire life. The blades echo across the moving river. Snow falls. Mud sticks and sloshes. We pant. Breath billows. My arms rattle as the blades clang and scrape. I'm faster than him, more fluid. Almost get his thigh, but he knows the mathematics of this game. With a little flick of his wrists to move my sword sideways, he steps in and drives his iron blade through my armor into my belly. It should cauterize instantly and destroy the nerves, leaving me damaged, though alive. But he has the iron charge off so I only feel a horrible tightness as alien metal slides into my body and warmth gushes out. I forget to breathe. Then I gasp. My body shivers, 
hugs the sword. I smell Cassius's neck. He's close, close as when he used to cup my head and call me brother. His hair is oily. Dignity leaves me and I begin to whimper like a dog. Throbbing pain blossoms, begins like a pressure, a fullness of metal in my stomach, becomes an aching horror. I shudder for breaths, gulp at them, can't breathe. It's like a black hole in my gut. I fall back moaning. There is pain, that is one thing. This is different. It is terror and fear. My body knows this is how life ends. Then the sword is gone, and the misery begins. Cassius leaves me bleeding and sniveling in the mud. Everything that I am goes away, and I am a slave to my body. I cry. I become a child again. I curl around the wound. Oh, God, it is horrible. I don't understand the pain. It consumes me. I am no man, I'm a child. Let me die faster. I sink in the cold, cold mud. I shiver and weep, I can't help it. My body does things, it betrays me. The metal went through my guts. My blood goes out. With it go dancers' hopes, my father's sacrifice, Eo's dream. I can hardly think of them. The mud is dark and cold. This hurts so much. Eo, I miss her. I miss home. What was her second gift? I never found out. Her sister never told me. Now I know pain. Nothing is worth this. Nothing. Let me be a slave again. Let me see Eo. Let me die. Just not this. Part 4 Reaper The elder women of Lycos say that when a man is bitten by a pit viper, all the poison must be drawn out of the bite, for the poison is wicked. When I was bitten, Uncle Nero left some in on purpose. Chapter 34 The Northwoods There is agony and claustrophobia. I am sick and wounded. The pain is in dreams. It is in darkness, in the pit of my stomach. I wake up and scream into a gentle hand. I glimpse someone. Eo? I whisper her name and reach up. My muddy hand smears her face, her angel's face. She's come to take me to the veil. Her hair has turned golden. I always thought she could be golden. Her colours are golden wings. No red sigil on her hands. It took death. I sweat, despite the rains and snows that come. Something shelters me. I shiver clutch my scarlet headband. Lost the Hemanthus. When was that again? Mud in my hair. Eo washes it away. Tenderly strokes my brow. I love her. Something inside me bleeds. I hear Eo speak to herself, to someone. I haven't long. Have I time at all? Am I in the veil? There is mist. 
There is sky and a great tree. Fire. Smoke. I shiver and sweat. Rot in hell, Cassius. I was your friend. I might have killed your brother, but I had no choice. You did. You arrogant slag. I hate him. I hate Augustus. I see them hanging Eo together. They mock me. They laugh at me. I hate Antonia. I hate Fitchner. I hate Titus. I hate. I hate. I am burning and mad and sweating. I hate the jackal, the proctors. I hate. I hate myself for all I've done. All I've done. For what? To win a game? To win a game for someone who will never know about anything I do. Eo is dead. It isn't as if she will ever be coming back to see all I have done for her. Dead? Then I wake. The pain is there in my gut. It goes through me. But I no longer sweat. The fever is gone and the angry red lines of infection have faded. I'm in a cave's mouth. There's a small fire and a sleeping girl just inches away. Furs cover her. She breathes softly the smoky air. Her hair is tousled and gold. She isn't Eo. Mustang. I cry silently. I want Eo. Why can't I have her? Why can't I will her back to life? I want Eo. I don't want this girl beside me. It aches worse than the wound. I can never fix what happened to Eo. I couldn't even run my army. I couldn't win. I couldn't beat Cassius, not to mention the jackal. I was the best hell diver. I'm nothing here. The world is too big and cold. I am too small. The world has forgotten Eo. It has already forgotten her sacrifice. There's nothing left. I sleep again. When I wake, Mustang sits by the fire. She knows I'm awake, but lets me pretend otherwise. I lie there with my eyes closed, listening to her hum. It's a song I know. It's a song I hear in my dreams. The echo of my love's death. The song sung by the one they call Persephone. Hummed by an aureate. An echo of Eo's dream. I weep. If ever I've felt there was a god, it is now, as I listen to the mournful chords. My wife is dead, but something of hers lingers still. I speak to Mustang the next morning. Where did you hear that song? I ask her without sitting up. From the HC, she says, blushing. A little girl sang it. It's soothing. It's sad. Most things are. It has been four weeks, Mustang tells me. Cassius is primus. Winter has come. Ceres is no longer under siege. Jupiter's soldiers sometimes come into the woods. There are sounds of battle between the two superpowers of the north, Jupiter and Mars. Jupiter to the west, Mars to the east. Since the river froze, they've been able to cross and raid one another. Our buzzards have risen out of their winter gulches. Hungry wolves howl at night. Crows flock from the south. But Mustang really knows very little, and I grow impatient with her. Keeping you breathing was a little distracting, she reminds me. Her standard lies underneath a blanket near my feet. She's the last of House Minerva, yet unbridled. 
and she didn't enslave me. Slaves are stupid, she says, and you're already a gimp. Why make you stupid too? It is days before I'm able to walk. I wonder where those nifty medbots are now, tending someone the proctors like, no doubt. I won Primus, and they never gave it to me. Now I know why the jackal will win. They are getting rid of his competition. Mustang stalks with me through the woods during the next weeks. I move stiffly through the thick snow, but my strength is returning. She credits medicine she found lying conspicuously under a bush. A friendly proctor placed it there. We pause when we spot the deer. I draw the bow, but I can't get the string to my ear. My wound aches. Mustang watches me. I try again, pain deep inside. I let the arrow fly. I miss. We eat leftover rabbit that night. It tastes funny and gives me cramps. I always have cramps now. It's the water, too. We have nothing to boil it in. No iodine, just snow and a little creek to drink from. Sometimes we can't have fire. You should have killed Cassius or sent him away, Mustang tells me. Would have thought you nobler than that, I say. I like to win, family trade, and sometimes cheating is in the rule book. She smiles. You get a merit bar every time you recapture your standard, so I arranged for it to be lost to House Diana by someone else several times. Then rode out to capture it. Got to Primus in a week. Tricky. Yet your army liked you, I say. Everyone likes me. Now eat your damn rabbit. You're skinny as a razor. The winter grows colder. We live in the deep north woods, far north of Ceres, northwest of my former highlands. I have not yet seen a soldier of Mars. I don't know what I would do if I did. I've hidden from everyone but you, Mustang says. It keeps me alive and ticking. What's your plan? I ask. She laughs at herself. To be alive and ticking. You're better at it than I am. How do you mean? No one in your house would have betrayed you. Because I didn't rule like you, she says. You have to remember, people don't like being told what to do. You can treat your friends like servants and they'll love you. But you tell them they're servants and they'll kill you. Anyway, you put too much stock in hierarchy and fear. Me? Who else? I could spot it a mile away. All you cared about was your mission, whatever it is. You're like a driven arrow with a very depressing shadow. First time I met you, I knew you'd cut my throat to get whatever it is you want. She waits for a moment. What is it that you want, by the way? To win, I say. Oh, please, you're not that simple. You think you know me? The coals crackle in our small fire. I know you cry in your sleep for a girl named Eo. Sister, or a girl you loved. It's a very off-color name. Like yours. I'm a far planet hayseed. Didn't they tell you? They wouldn't tell me anything. I don't get out much. Strict father. She waves a hand. Anyway, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that no one trusts you because it's obvious you care more about your goal than you do about them. And you're something different. Oh, very much so, Sir Reaper. I like people more than you do. You are the wolf that howls and bites. I am the mustang that nuzzles the hand. People know they can work with me. With you? Hell, kill or be killed. 
She's right. When I had a tribe, I did it right. I made every boy and girl love me. Made them earn their keep. I taught them how to kill a goat, as if I knew how. I gave them fire, as if I had created the matches. I shared a secret with them, that we had food, and Titus didn't. They saw me as their father. I remember it in their eyes. When Titus was alive, I was a symbol of goodness and hope. Then, when he died, I became him. Sometimes I forget that the Institute is meant to teach me things, I say to Mustang. The golden girl tilts her head at me. Like how we must live for more. Her words strike my heart. They echo through time from another's lips. Live for more. More than power. More than vengeance. More than what we're given. I must learn better than them, not simply beat them. That is how I will help Reds. I am a boy. I am foolish. But if I learn to become a leader, I can be more than an agent of the sons of Ares. I can give my people a future. That is what Ea wanted. Deep winter. The wolves are hungry now. They howl in the night. When Mustang and I make a kill, we sometimes have to scare them off. But when we kill a caribou at dusk, a pack descends from the Northlands. They come from the trees like dark spectres, shadows. The biggest of them is my size, his fur is white. The fur of the others is grey, no longer black. These wolves change with the season. I watch how they surround us. Each moves with individual cunning, yet each moves as part of the pack. This is how we should fight. I whisper to Mustang as we watch the wolves approach. Could we talk about this later? We take down the pack leader with three arrows. The rest flee. Mustang and I set to skimming the big white brute. As she slips her knife along beneath the fur, she looks up, nose red from the cold. Slaves aren't part of the pack, so we can't fight like them. Not that it matters. The wolves don't have it right either. They take too much from their pack leader. Cut off the head, the body retreats. So, the answer is autonomy, I say. Maybe. She bites her lip. Later that night, she elaborates. It's like a hand. She sits close and cosy, leg touching mine close enough for guilt to crawl along my spine. The caribou roasts, filling the cave with a cozy, thick aroma. A blizzard rages outside, and the wolf fur dries over the fire. Give me your hand, she says. Which is your best finger? They are all better at different things. Don't be obstinate, I tell her my thumb. She has me try to hold a stick with only my thumb. She easily pulls it from my grasp. Then she has me hold it without my thumb and only the other fingers. With a twist, the stick is free. Imagine that your thumb is your house members. The fingers are all the slaves you have conquered. The primus or whoever is the brain. It all works pretty gory seamlessly, yeah? She can't pull the stick from my grip. I set it down and ask her the point. Now try to do something beyond simply grabbing the standard. Just move your thumb counterclockwise and your fingers clockwise, except your middle. I do it. She stares at my hands and laughs incredulously. Ass! I ruined her demonstration. Helldivers are dexterous. I watch her hands as she tries to do it too. Of course, she fails. I understand. 
A hand is like the society, I say. It is the structure of the armies at the Institute. The hierarchy is good for simple tasks. Some fingers are more important than others. Some are better at certain things. All fingers are controlled by the highest order, the brain. The brain's control is effective. It makes your thumb and fingers work together. But the single brain's control is limited. Imagine each one of the fingers had a brain of its own that interacted with the main brain. The fingers obey, but they function independently. What could the hand do then? What could an army do? I twirled the stick along my fingers in intricate patterns. Exactly. Her eyes linger on mine, and her fingers trace along my palm as she explains. I know she wants me to react to her touch, but I force my mind to be lost on other things. This idea of hers isn't part of the proctor's lesson. Their lesson is about the evolution from anarchy to order. It is about control, about the systematic accumulation of power, the structure of that power, and then its preservation. It is a model to show that the rule of hierarchies is the best. The society is the final evolution, the only answer. She just slagged that rule, or at least showed its limitations. If I could earn the voluntary allegiance of the slaves, the army created would look nothing like the society. It would be better. Like if the Reds of Lycos thought they could actually win the Laurel. They would be so much more productive. Or if a Praetor on board his star cruiser could utilize not only his own genius, but that of his crew of blues. Mustang strategy is Eo's dream. It's like an electric shock jolts through me. Why didn't you try it with the slaves you captured? She pulls her hand away from mine after I don't respond to her touch. I tried. She's quiet the rest of the night. Near morning, she develops a cough. Mustang takes sick over the next few days. I hear fluid in her lungs and feed her broth made from marrow and wolf and leaves boiled in a helmet I found. She looks like she will die. I don't know what to do. We're low on food, so I hunt. But the game is scarce and the wolves are hungry. Prey has fled these woods, so we survive on small hares. All I can do is keep her warm and pray a medbot descends from the clouds. The proctors know where we are. They always know where we are. I find human tracks in the woods the next week, a set of two. I follow them to an abandoned campsite, hoping they might have food I can steal. There are animal bones and embers still hot. No horses, though. Probably not scouts, then. Oath-breakers. The shame to have broken their vows after being enslaved. There's plenty of them now. I follow their tracks through the woods for an hour before I grow worried. They circle back around, leading somewhere familiar, leading to our cave. It is night by the time I return. I hear laughter from the home I share with Mustang. The arrow feels thin in my fingers as I knock it on the bowstring. I should kneel to gather my breath. My wound aches. I pant. But I can't give them more time, not if they have Mustang. They cannot see me as I stand at the edge of the frozen caribou skin and hard-packed snow that walls off our cave from sight and elements. The fire crackles inside. Smoke seeps out through vents Mustang and I took a day in making. Two boys sit together, eating what's left of our meat, drinking our water. They are dirty and ragged, hair like greased weeds, stained complexions, blackheads, once beautiful, I'm sure. One boy sits on Mustang's chest. The girl who saved my life is gagged and in her undergarments, she shivers from the cold. One of the boys bleeds from a bite wound on his neck. 
They are planning on making her pay for that wound. Knives heat red in the fire. One boy obviously enjoys the sight of her nakedness. He reaches to touch her skin as though she is a toy meant for his pleasure. My thoughts are primal, wolf-like. A terrifying emotion sweeps over me, one that I did not know I had for this girl, not till now. It takes a moment to calm myself and stop my hands from shaking. His hand is on the inside of her thigh. I shoot the first boy in the kneecap, the second I shoot as he reaches for a knife. I'm a bad aim. I get his shoulder instead of his eye socket. I slide into the shelter with my skinning knife, ready to finish the boys off as they howl in pain. Something in me, the human part, has turned off, and it's only when I see Mustang's eyes that I stop. Jaro, she says softly. Even shivering, she is beautiful. The small, quick-smiling girl who brought me back to life. The bright-eyed soul who keeps Eo's song alive. I shudder with anger. If I had been ten minutes later in returning, this night could have broken me forever. I cannot bear another death, especially not Mustangs. Jarrow, let them live, she says again, whispering it to me as Eo would whisper she loved me. It cuts to my core. I can't take the sound of her voice, the anger inside me. My mouth doesn't work. My face is numb. I can't lose the grimace of rage that controls it. I drag the two boys out by their hair and kick them till Mustang joins us. I leave them moaning in the snow and return to help her dress. She feels so fragile as I pull her animal skins around her bony shoulders. Knife or snow? She asks the boys when she's dressed. She holds the knives heated in the fire in her trembling hands. She coughs. I know what she's thinking. Let them go, and they kill us as we sleep. Neither will die from their wounds. The medbots would come if that were the case. Or maybe they won't for oathbreakers. They choose snow. I'm glad. Mustang didn't want to use the knife. We tie them to a tree at the edge of the woods and light a signal fire so that some house will find them. Mustang insisted on coming along, coughing all the way, as if she were worried I wouldn't do as she asked. She was right to think that. In the night, after Mustang has gone to sleep, I get up to go back and kill the Oathbreakers. If Jupiter or Mars finds them, then they will spill where we are, and we will be taken. Don't, Darrow, she says as I pull back the caribou skin. I turn. Her face peers out from our blankets. We will have to move if they live, I say. And you're already sick. You'll die. We have warmth here. Shelter. Then we will move in the morning, she says. I'm tougher than I look. Sometimes that is true. This time, it is not. I wake in the morning to find that she shifted in the night to curl into me for warmth. Her body is so frail. It trembles like a leaf in the wind. I smell her hair. She breathes softly. Salt tracks mark her face. I want Eo. I wish it were her hair, her warmth. But I don't push Mustang away. There's pain when I hold her, but it comes from the past, not from Mustang. She is something new, something hopeful, like spring to my deep winter. When morning comes, we move deeper into the woods and make a lean-to shelter against a rock face with fallen trees and packed snow. We never find out what happened to the Oath Breakers, or our cave. Mustang can barely sleep, she coughs so much. When she sleeps curled into me, I kiss the nape of her neck softly, softly, so that she will not wake. 
though I secretly wish she would, if just to know that I'm here. Her skin is hot. I hum the song of Persephone. I can never remember the words, she whispers to me. Her head lies in my lap tonight. I wish I did. I have not sung since Lycos. My voice is raspy and raw. Slowly, the song comes. Listen, listen, remember the wane of sun's fury and waving grain. We fell and fell and danced along to croon an knell of rights and wrongs. And my son, my son, remember the burn when leaves were fire and seasons turned. We fell and fell and sang a song to weave a cell all autumn long. And down in the vale, hear the reaper swing, the reaper swing, the reaper swing down in the vale hear the reaper sing a tale of winter long my girl my girl remember the chill when rains froze and snows did kill we fell and fell and danced along through icy hell to the winter song. My love, my love, remember the cries when winter died for spring skies. They roared and roared, but we grabbed our seed and sowed a song against their greed. My son, my son, remember the chains when gold ruled with iron reins. We roared and roared and twisted and screamed for hours a veil of better dreams. And down in the veil, hear the reaper swing, the reaper swing, the reaper swing. Down in the vale, hear the reaper sing a tale of winter done. It is strange, she says. What is? Father told me that there would be riots because of that song, that people would die, but... It is such a soft melody. She coughs blood into a pelt. We used to sing songs by the campfire, out in the country, where he kept us out of... Coughs again. Of the public... I... When... My brother died. Father never sang with me again. She will soon die. It's only a matter of time. Her face is pale. Her smile's feeble. There's only one thing I can do since the medbots haven't come. 
I will have to leave her to seek out medicine. One of the houses might have found some or received injectables as a bounty. I'll have to go soon, but I need to get her food first. Someone follows me that day as I hunt alone in the winter woods. I wear my new white wolf cloak. They are camouflaged as well. I do not see whoever it is, but he is there. I pretend my bowstring needs fixing and steal a glance back. Nothing. Quiet. Snow. The sound of wind on brittle branches. They still follow as I move along. I feel them behind me. It's like the ache in my body from my wound. I pretend to see a deer and pass quickly through a thicket, only to scramble up a tall pine on the other side. I hear a pop. They pass beneath me. I feel it on my skin, in my bones. So I shake the branches under my legs. Gathered snow tumbles down, a distorted hollow in the shape of a man forms in the snowfall. It is looking at me. Fitzna! I call down. His bubblegum pops again. You may come down now, boyo. Fitzna barks up. He deactivates his ghost cloak and grav boots and sinks into the snow. He's wearing a thin black thermal. My layered fatigues and stinking animal skins don't keep me half as warm. It's been weeks since I last saw him. He looks tired. Going to finish what Cassius started? I ask as I hop down. He looks me over and smirks. You look horrible. You do too. The soft bed, warm food and wine giving you trouble. I point up. We can just barely see Olympus between the skeletal branches of the winter trees. He smiles. Readout says you've lost twenty pounds. Baby fat, I tell him. Cassius's iron sword carved it off. I pull up my bow and point it at him. I wonder if he's wearing a pulse shield. It'll stop anything short of pulse weapons and razors. Only recoil plate can gird off those weapons, and even then, not well. I should shoot you. You wouldn't dare. I'm a proctor, boyo. I shoot him in the thigh. Except the arrow loses velocity before it hits the invisible pulse shield, which flickers, iridescent, and the arrow bounces to the ground. So, they wear it at all times, even when they don't wear recoil armor. Well, that was petulant. He yawns. Pulse shield, grav boots, ghost cloak. Looks like he has a pulse fist too, and those famous razors. Snow melts as it touches his skin. He saw me in the tree, so I'm guessing his eyes have injected optics. Certainly thermal scopes and night vision. He has a widget and an analyzer mod too. He knew my weight. Probably knows my white blood cell count. What about spectrum analysis? He yawns again. Little sleep these days on Olympus. Busy days. Who gave the jackal the hollow of me killing Julian? I ask. Well, you don't dally away time. He did something, just as I spoke, and the sound around us localizes. I can't hear anything beyond an invisible five-meter bubble. Didn't know they had toys like that. The Proctors gave it to the jackal, he tells me. Which ones? Apollo. All of us. Doesn't matter. I don't understand. I assume it's because they favor the jackal. Am I right? As usual. His gum pops. Unfortunately, you're just not allowed to win, and you were gaining momentum. So? I ask him to explain. He says he just did. His eyes are ringed and tired despite the collagen and cosmetics he now wears to cover his fatigue. His stomach has grown, 
arms are still skinny. Something worries him, and it isn't just his appearance. Allowed to, I echo. Allowed to. No one can be allowed to win. I thought the gory damn point was to carve our own ladder to the top, so if I'm not allowed to win, that means the jackal is. Peg did. He doesn't sound very happy. Then that doesn't make any lick of sense. It corrupts the entire thing, I say hotly. You broke the rules. The best of gold is supposed to rise, yet they already have chosen a winner. Not only does this ruin the Institute, it ruins the society. The fittest reign, that's what they say. Now they've betrayed their own principles by taking sides in a schoolyard fight. This is the laurel all over again. Hypocrisy. So, this kid is what? A predestined Alexander? A Caesar? A Genghis? A Wigan? I ask. This is slagging nonsense. Adrius is the son of our dear arch governor Augustus. That's all that matters. Yes, you've told me that. But why is he supposed to win? Simply because his father is important? Unfortunately, yes. Be more specific. He sighs. The arch-governor has secretly threatened and bribed and cajoled all twelve of us till we came to agree upon the fact that his son should win. But we have to be careful in our cheating. The drafters, my real bosses, watch every move from their palaces, ships, etc. They are very important people as well. And then there's the board of quality control to worry about, and the sovereign and senators and all the other governors themselves, because though there are many schools, any of them can watch you whenever they like. What? How? He taps my wolf ring. Biometric nanocam. Don't worry, it's showing them something else right now. I threw down a jam field, and anyway there's a half-day delay for editing purposes. All other times, any drafter, any scard, can watch you to see if they would like to offer you an apprenticeship when this is over. Oh, do they like you. Thousands of Oriots have been watching me. My insides, already cold, tighten. Demetrius Al Bologna, Imperator of the Sixth Fleet, father of Cassius and Julian, Drafter of House Mars has watched me kill one son and deceive the other. It takes the wind out of me. What if I had told Titus that I knew he was a red because I was a red? Did they notice him say bloody damn? Did I say he was a red out loud? Or was that just in my head? What if I take the ring off? Then you disappear. Except for the cameras we have hidden in the battlefield. He winks. Don't tell anyone. Now, if the drafters discover the Arch-Governor's scheme, there will be hell to pay. Tension between the schoolhouses, certainly, but more importantly, there could be a blood war between the Augustuses and Bologna's. And you'll be in trouble if they find out about the bribery. I'll be dead. He fails in trying a smile. That's why you look like hell. You're in the middle of a shitstorm. So how do I fit into this? He chuckles dryly. Many drafters like you. Those of House Mars get to offer you your first apprenticeships, but you can entertain offers outside the house. If you die, they will be very unhappy, especially the sword of House Mars. His name is Lorne Au Arcos. No doubt you've heard of him. He is prime good with his razor. How do I fit in? I repeat. You don't. Stay alive. Stay out of the jackal's path. Otherwise, Jupiter or Apollo will kill you 
and there will be nothing I can do to stop it. So they're his guard dogs, eh? Amongst others, yes. Well, if they kill me, the drafters would know something is wrong. They won't. Apollo will use other houses to do it, or we'll do it ourselves and edit out the footage from the nanocams. Apollo and Jupiter are not stupid, so don't fiddle with them. Let the jackal play and you'll have a future. And so will you. And so will I. I understand, I say. Good. Good. I knew you'd see sense. You know, many of the proctors like you. Minerva even does. She hated you at first, but since you let Mustang go, she's been able to stay around on Olympus. Much less embarrassing that way. She's allowed to stay around on Olympus? I ask innocently. Naturally. It's the rules of the Institute. Once your house is defeated, the proctor heads home to face the music and explain what went wrong to the drafters. Fitchner's smile contorts when he sees the sudden glimmer in my eyes. So, if their house is destroyed, they have to leave. And it was Apollo and Jupiter who want me dead, you say? No, he begs, suddenly hearing the menace in my voice. I tilt my head. No. You can't, he sputters, confused. I just told you, the sword of the damn house Mars wants you as an apprentice. And there are others, senators, politicos, praetors. Don't you want a future? I want to rip the jackal's balls off. That's all. Then I will find my apprenticeship. I imagine it will be an impressive one if I do that. Darrow, be reasonable, man. Vidna. My friends Roke and Leah died because of the Arch-Governor's meddling. Let's see how he likes it when I make his son, the Jackal, my slave. Your matters are red, he says with a shake of his head. You're screwing with the Proctor's livelihoods. None are content with their current station. They're all looking to ascend as well. If you threaten their futures, Apollo and Jupiter will come down and they will cut off your head. Not if I destroy their houses first. Because don't they have to leave if I do that? Someone reliable told me those were the rules. I clap my hands together. Now, I have another friend who is dying, and I'd like some antibiotics. It'd be prime if you could give me some. He gobs at me. After this? Why would I? Because you've been a piss-poor proctor up until now. You owe me bounties, and you have your own future to look after. He snorts. A defeated laugh. Fair enough. He takes an injectable from a med case on his leg and hands it to me. I notice how the pull shield doesn't hurt me when his hand touches mine. So, they can turn it off. I thank him by clapping his shoulder affectionately. He rolls his eyes. The armor is turned off over the entire body. Then it's back. I hear the microhome at his waist, where the contraption sits. Now that I've got proctors for enemies, it's a good thing to know. So what will you do? Fitchner asks. Who is more dangerous, Apollo or Jupiter? Be honest, Fitchner. Both are monsters of men. Apollo is more ambitious. Jupiter is simple, he just enjoys playing God here. Then House Apollo first. After that I'll crush Jupiter. And when they are gone, who will protect the jackal? The jackal, he says dryly. Then we'll see if he really does deserve to win. Before I go, Fitchner tosses a small package to the ground. Not that it matters now, but this was given to me. I was told to say that you're to know that your friends have not forsaken you. Who? I cannot say. Whoever gave it to him is a friend, because inside the box is my Pegasus, and inside that is Eos Hymanthus Blossom. I put the Pegasus necklace 
about my neck. Chapter 35 Oathbreakers My friends are with me. What would they mean by that? Which friends? The sons of Ares? Or was the mystery friend being more general, alluding to those who support my chances at the Institute? Do they know the significance of the Pegasus? Or were they simply reuniting me with something they thought I might miss? So many questions. None of them matter. They are outside the game. The game. What else is there but the game? All the true things in the world, all my relationships, all my aspirations and needs are wrapped up in this game, wrapped up in me winning. To win, I'll need an army. But it cannot be made of slaves. Not again. I now need, as I'll need at the head of a rebellion, followers, not slaves. Man cannot be freed by the same injustice that enslaved it. A week after I inject Mustang and her fever fades, we set off to the north. Her strength grows the more we move. Her cough is gone, and her quick smile returns. Sometimes she needs a rest, but soon she comes close to outpacing me. She lets me know it, too. We make as much noise as possible when we move to draw our prey to us. On the sixth night of setting obnoxiously large fires, we get our first nibble. The oathbreakers come along a stream, using its sound to mask their approach. I like them immediately. Were our fire not a trap, they could have caught us unawares. But it is a trap and when two step into the light, we almost spring it. Yet, if they are smart enough to come along the stream, they are smart enough to leave someone in the dark. I hear an arrow knock on a bowstring. Then there's a yelp. Mustang takes the one in the dark, I take the other two. I stand up from my snow pile, my wolf cloak shedding snow, and knock them down from behind with the flat of my bow. Afterward, the one Mustang struck nurses his swollen eye by our fire as I speak with their leader. Her name is Milia. She's a tall willow with a long horse face and a slight hunch to her shoulders. Rags and stolen furs cover her bony frame. The other uninjured one is Dax. Short, comely, with three frostbitten fingers. We give them extra furs and I think that makes all the difference in the conversation. You understand we could make you slaves, yes? Mustang asks, brandishing her standard. So you'd be twice oathbreakers and twice shunned once this game is over. Milia doesn't seem to care. Dax does. The other just follows Milia. Could give a rat's prick... No difference between one and twice, Milia says. They all bear the slave mark of Mars. I don't recognize them, but their ring says they are from Juno. Rather bear shame than bruise my knees. Do you know my father? I don't care about your father. My father, she persists, is Gaius Autracus, Judiciar of the Southern Martian Hemisphere. I still don't care. And his father was, I don't care. Then you're a fool, she drawls. Twice a fool if you think to make me your slave. I will cut you in the night. I nod to Mustang. She stands suddenly with the standard and puts it to Milia's head. The mark of Mars becomes that of Minerva. Then she erases the Minerva mark. Dax's eyes widen. Even if I free you, I ask Milia, you're still going to cut me. She doesn't know what to say. Millie, Dax says quietly, what are you thinking? No slavery, 
I elaborate. No beatings. If you dig a shit pit, I dig two shit pits for the camp. If someone cuts you, I rip them apart. So, will you join our army? His army, Mustang corrects. I look over at her with a frown. And who's he? Milia asks, her eyes not leaving my face. He's the Reaper. It takes a week to gather ten Oathbreakers. The way I look at it is, those ten already made it clear they don't want to be slaves. So they might like the first person who will give them purpose, food, furs, who's not demanding that they lick a boot heel. Most of them have heard of me, but all are disappointed that I don't have the famous sling blade I used to beat Pax. Apparently he's become quite the legend. They say he picked up and threw a horse and rider into the Argos as Mars's slaves fought Jupiter's. As we grow, we hide from the larger armies. Mars may be my house, but with Roke dead and Cassius an enemy, only Quinn and Severo are left as friends. Pollux, perhaps, but he'll go whatever way the wind blows. Rat bastard. I cannot be with my house. There's no place for me there. I may have been their leader, but I remember how they looked at me. And now it is crucial they know I am alive. Despite the war between Mars and Jupiter, stalwart Ceres stands unconquered by the riverside. Behind their high walls, bread smoke still rises. Mounted war bands from both armies roam the plains around Ceres, crossing the frozen Argos at will. They carry low-charged iron swords now, so they can electrocute and maim one another with a brush of metal. Medbots scream over the battlefield when skirmishes break into pitched frays, healing wounded students as they bleed or moan from broken bones. The champions of each army wear iron armor to protect themselves against the new weapons. Horses smash together. Iron arrows fly. Slaves mill about hitting each other with older, simpler weapons across the wide plain that separates the highlands from the great river Argos. It is a spectacular thing to see. But foolish. So foolish. I watch with Mustang and Milia as two armoured warbands of Mars and Jupiter streak toward each other across the plains in front of Phobos Tower. Pennants flap. Horses trample the deep snow. It's a clash of armoured glory when the two metal tides collapse into one another. Lances spark with stunning electricity on broad shields and armour. Dazzling swords slam other blades like their own. High drafts battling high drafts. Slaves run in scores to smash into each other, pawns in this giant chess match. I see Pax in a rusty bulk of crimson armour, so ancient it looks like a fry suit. I laugh as he tackles a horse and rider, but if ever there was a picture of a perfect knight, it would not be Pax. No, it'd be Cassius. I see him now. His armour glows as he stuns opponent after opponent, galloping through the enemy, his sword humming left and right, flickering like a tongue of fire. He can fight, but I'm shocked at how foolishly he chooses to, diving nobly into the enemy's gut with a force of lancers, capturing enemies. And then the surviving troops regroup and do the same to him, over and over, neither side taking substantial advantage. What idiots, I say to Mustang. All that pretty armour and swords blinded them. I know. Maybe if they slam into one another three or four more times, it may just work. They've got tactics, she says. Look, a wedge formation there, and a feint there that'll turn into a flank sweep. Yet I'm right. Yet you're not wrong. She watches for a moment. Like our little war all over again, except you're not running around howling at people like a moon-touched wolf. 
Mustang sighs and puts a hand on my shoulder. Ah, the good old days. Milia watches us with a wrinkled nose. Tactics win battles. Strategy wins wars, I say. Oh, I am Reaper, god of wolves, king of strategy. Mustang pinches my cheek. You are just too adorable. I swat her away. Melia rolls her eyes. So, what is our strategy, my lord? Mustang asks me. The longer I draw out any conflict with an enemy, the more chances the proctors will get to ruin me. My rise must be meteoric. I don't tell her this. Speed is our strategy, I say. Speed and extreme prejudice. The next morning, House Mars's war band finds their bridge across the Metas blocked by trees felled in the night. As expected, the war band turns around and rides back to the castle, fearing some sort of trap. Their watchmen in Phobos and Deimos cannot see us. They peer down and send smoke signals that there is no enemy in the barren deciduous woods around the bridge. They do not see us because we have been belly down in the same position in the woods, fifty yards from the bridge, since black dawn. Each of my oathbreakers has a white or grey wolf cloak now. It took a week to find the wolves, but perhaps that was for the better. The hunt created a bond. My ten soldiers are a scrappy lot. Liars, wicked cheats who would rather ruin their futures than be slaves in this game. So a proud, practical, but not very honourable lot. Just the sort I need. Their faces are painted white with bird dung and grey clay, so we've the look of spectral winter beasts as breath billows from our grinning maws. They like being valued by someone fearsome, Milia told me the night before, her voice as cold and brittle as the icicles hanging from the aspen trees. As do I. Mars'll take the bait, Mustang whispers to me now. Not so much brain power left in the house. Not with Roke gone. She chose a place close to me in the snow, so close that her legs stretch along mine, and her face twisted sideways as she lies on her belly, is only inches from my own underneath our white cloaks. When I inhale, the air is already warm from her breath. I think this is the first time I've thought of kissing her. I chase the thought away and summon the sight of Eo's mischievous lips. It is midday when Cassius sends troops, mostly slaves for fear of an ambush, to clear the felled trees from the bridge. In fact, Cassius plays too clever a game. Since he believes he is fighting Jupiter, his assumption is that the ambush will be a sudden cavalry charge once the bridge is clear. So he has his horses go around the river, south through the highlands, and loop around on the far side of the bridge near Phobos, to spring an ambush on the cavalry he assumes will come from the Great Woods or the Plains. Milia, the shifty girl, brings me news of this movement of horse in the form of a howl from her perch nearly a mile off, where she serves as lookout in the high pines. It is time to move. We do not howl or shout as we ten sprint through the leafless woods toward the toiling slaves. Four high drafts sit on horses watching the work. One is Scipio. We sprint faster, faster through the barren trees, coming from their flank. They do not see us. We fan out, racing one another to make the first strike. I win. Jumping five meters forward in the low grav, I fly out of the woods like a demon possessed and take Scipio at the shoulder with a blunted sword. He spills from the saddle. Horses whinny. Mustang takes down another hydraft with her standard. My troops swarm forward, silent and shadowed with white and grey. Two more of my oathbreakers leap onto the hydraft's horses and bludgeon the riders with clubs and blunted axes. 
I ordered no killing. It's over in four seconds. The horses don't even know where their riders went. My troops flow past the horses into the slaves as they clear the bridge of the felled logs. Half don't even hear us till Mustang has turned six into Minerva slaves and ordered them to help us subdue the rest. Then there's shouting, and the Mars slaves turn their axes against my troops. Those from Minerva recognize Mustang and are set free when she clears away the mark of Mars. It's like a shifting tide. Six slaves are ours. They tackle Mars's other slaves and pin them down as Mustang runs over and converts them. Eight by the same process. Ten. Eleven till only one offers trouble. And he's the prize. Pax. He doesn't have his armor, thank God. He's here for labor, but it still takes seven of us to take him to the ground. He's roaring and screaming his name. I dive at him and take a fist to the face. I'm spitting and laughing as we pile on till there's twelve of us holding the genetic monster down. Mustang frees him of the mark of Mars, and his roars become laughter so high-pitched it sounds like a girl's. Freedom! He roars. He jumps up, looking for someone to maim. Darrow our Andromedus! He shouts at me, ready to break my face till Mustang shouts him down. He's on our side, Mustang says. The truth? Pax asks. His giant face splits into a smile. What news? And he's got me in a bear hug. Freedom, brothers, ancestors, sweet freedom. We leave Scipio and the other hydrafts moaning on the ground. The smoke signals plume up from Phobos and Deimos as we sprint through the Vale's woods into the Dwarf Mountains to the north, before the horsemen of Mars can loop back around the blocked bridge to assail us. The watchmen saw it all, and they must be horrified. It happened in less than a minute. Pax won't stop laughing like a girl. House Mars will be confused by the sudden depletion of their ranks, but I need more than that. I need them to replace the vision they have of me, one of a flawed leader, with something supernatural, something beyond their understanding. I need to be like the jackal, nameless and superhuman. That night, I slither through the snow north of Castle Mars. Riders patrol the glen. Their hooves are soft on the grass in the night. I hear their bridles clinking in the darkness, I do not see them. My wolf cloak is white as the falling snow. I've pulled its head up, so I look like a guardian creature from the colder levels of hell. The rock face is steeper than I remember. I nearly fall as I pull myself along the snowy vertical. I reach the castle wall. Torches flicker on the ramparts. Wind whips the flames about. Mustangs should be about to light the blaze. I strip away my cloak and ball it up. My skin is coated in charcoal. I push the metal tongs into the spaces between the stones. It's like climbing my drill again, except I'm stronger and I'm not wearing a fry suit. Easy. The pegasus bounces against my chest as I pull myself up. I'm not even panting when I reach the top six minutes later. My fingers cling to the stone just beneath the ramparts. I hang, listening to the passing sentry. Of course, it is a slave. And she's not stupid. She sees me as I pull myself over the rampart and shoves a spear against my throat. I flash my Mars ring and hold my finger to my lips. Why should I not call out? She asks. She was once of Minerva. Did they tell you to guard the wall for enemies? I'm sure they did, but I'm of House Mars. The ring says so. I can't be an enemy then, yes? She frowns. The Primus told me to watch the walls for intruders and to kill or call out. This is my home. I am rightful Primus of House Mars. I am your master and I demand you continue to watch the wall for intruders. 
It is imperative. I wink. I swear Virginia would be happy if you followed your orders to the letter. She cocks her head at Mustang's real name and looks me over. My Primus is alive. House Minerva has not yet fallen, I say. The girl's face almost breaks, she smiles so hard. Well, then, I suppose this is your home. Can't stop you from entering it. Bound by oath to obey, I am. Wait. I know you. They said you were dead. Thank your primus that I draw breath. I learned from her that the house members sleep while the slaves guard the fortress at night. That is the problem with slaves. They are so willing to find a way around their duty and so excited to share secrets. I leave her behind and steal into the keep using a key she accidentally dropped into my hand. Sneaking through my home, I am tempted to pay Cassius a visit, but I'm not here to kill him. Violence is the fool's way out. Sometimes I'm the fool, but tonight I'm feeling smart. I'm also not there to steal the standard. They will be guarding that. No, I'm there to remind them that they once were afraid of me, that I am the best of them all. I can go where I please, do what I please. I stay in the shadows even though I could use the same argument on every slave guard they have. Instead, I carve a sling blade on every door in the keep. I slip into the war room and carve a sling blade into the huge table there to create the myth. Then I carve a skull into Cassius's chair and slab a knife deep into the back of the wood chair to create the rumor. As I leave the way I came, I see the hillside north of the castle erupt in flame. The brush, stacked in the shape of the reaper's sling blade, burns hot in the night. Severo, if he is still with Mars, will find me. And I could use the little bastard's help. Chapter 36 A Second Test in order to have an army, I must be able to feed it. So I will take the ovens of Ceres that Jupiter and Mars both lust over. The new members of our band from House Minerva find it perfectly reasonable to accept my authority. I don't fool myself. Yes, they were impressed by me hiding my howlers inside dead horses months ago, and they remember me defeating Pax, but it's only because Mustang trusts me that they obey. We leave those of House Diana as slaves for now. I need to earn their trust. Tactus, oddly, is the only one who seems to trust me. Then again, the laconic youth was all smiles when I told him I'd be sewing him inside of a dead horse over a month ago. There are two more of Diana that I sewed away. The others call them the dead horses, and they each wear braids of white horsehair. I think they're a bit mental. If there is anything in the woods and highlands, it is an abundance of wolves. We hunt them to train our new recruits in my way of fighting. No glamorous cavalry charges, no damn lances, and certainly no stupid rules of engagement. Everyone gets cloaks, which are smelly things as they dry and we peel away the rot. Everyone, except Pax, they haven't yet made a wolf big enough for him. How Ceres is no stranger to siege, Mustang says. She's right. At night, they seem to have more soldiers awake than in the day. They watch for sneak assaults. Blazing bundles of tinder light the base of their walls at night. Somehow, they have dogs now. Those prowl along the battlements. The way from the water is guarded ever since I tried sending Severo in through the latrines long ago, during a sneak attack I arranged when we were at war with Minerva. He barely forgave me for that one. The Ceres students come out no longer. They've learned the risk of battling stronger houses on open ground. They'll hole up for the winter, 
and when the cold and hunger have weakened the other houses, they'll emerge from their fortress in the spring, strong, prepared, and organized. But they'll never make it to the spring. So we attack during the day, Mustang guesses. Naturally, I say. Sometimes I wonder why we even bother speaking. She knows my thoughts, even the mad ones. This idea is an especially mad one. We practiced it in a clearing in the North Woods for a whole day after flattening out the wood with axes. Pax makes the plan possible. We hold competitions to see who has the best balance on the wood. Mustang wins. Horse-faced Milia is second, and she's spitting bitter that she doesn't beat Mustang. I'm third. As we did when springing the trap on House Mars, we sneak as close as we dare the night before and bury ourselves in the deep snow. Again, Mustang and I pair off, huddling tight with one another under the snow. Tactus tries pairing with Milia, but she tells him to go slag himself. If you look at it properly, I was trying to do you a favor. He mutters over at Milia as he huddles down under Pax's smelly armpit. You're about as pretty as a gargoyle's wart, so when else would you get a chance to snuggle with the likes of me? Ungrateful sow. Mustang and the other girls snort their derision. Then the quiet of the night and the chill of the open ice plain bite into us, and we grow silent. Come morning, Mustang and I shiver into one another, and a new snowfall threatens to ruin our plan, burying us even deeper in the plain. But the wind is manageable, and the flakes do not bury us too deep as they spin through the air. I'm first up, though I do not move, and soon after I yawn away the last vestige of sleep, my army wakes organically, one student stirring and grumbling into another, till there's a snake of sniffing and coughing golds buried together in a shallow tunnel beneath the snow's surface. I can't see them, but I hear their waking, despite the sound of the snowstorm's wind. Ice formed around me in the night, outside my thick cloaks. Mustang's hands are inside my pelts, warm against my side. Her breath heats my neck. As I stir, she yawns and straightens, pulling a little away as she stretches cat-like under the snow. Snow crumbles in between us. Gory hell, this is miserable. Dax, Milia's companion mutters. I can't see him in our snow tunnel. Mustang nudges me. We can just barely see Tactus curled into the hollow of Pax's armpit. The two men snuggle together and wake like lovers, only to flinch away from one another when their ice-crusted eyelids flutter open. Wonder which is Romeo? Mustang whispers, her throat raspy. I chuckle and carve a hole in the roof of our tunnel to see that my band of twenty-four is alone in the plains, except for early morning horse scouts in the distance. They'll not be a problem. Wind rolls in from the North River biting deep into my face. You ready for this? Mustang asks me with a grin as I bring my head back into our shelter. Or are you too cold? It was colder in the lock when I first tricked you, I say, smiling. Ah, the old days. All part of my master plan to win your trust, little man. She smirks mischievously. She sees the worry in my eyes, so she grips my thigh and comes close so the others can't hear. Think I'd be squatting here with you in the snow if this plan could go belly up? Negative. But I'm freezing my balls off, and the wind is dying. So let's go, Reaper. I give the countdown, and we're up, snow crumbling around us, wind stinging our faces, and sprinting the hundred meters across the plains to the walls. All twenty-four of us silent again. The wind comes in fits. We carry the long tree between us, 
huddling tight to it as we did in the night when it shared our tunnel with us. It's heavy, but we're twenty-four and Pax's parents gave him the genes to knock over bloody damn horses. Panting, legs burning, gritting as the wood weighs down our shoulders in the deep snow. It's a trudge. A shout comes from the wall, a lonely, hollow call that echoes over the still winter morning. More shouts, still few, barks, confusion. An arrow whistles past, then another. It's amazing how quiet the world is as the arrows sail, carrying death. The wind has faded again. Sun peaks from behind a cloud layer, and we're bathed with morning warmth. We're at the wall. Shouts spread beyond the stone fortification from their towers. A signal horn, barking of dogs. Snow falls from the parapets as archers lean over the stone battlements. An arrow shivers in the wood by my hand. Someone goes down bloody like Dax. Then Pax roars the word, and he, Tactus, and five more of our strongest take the long wood beam we cut from the tree trunk and shove the tip as hard as they can into the wall. They hold it there, at an angle. They are roaring from the burden. It's still five metres short of the top of the wall, but I'm already sprinting up the thin slope. Pax grunts like a boar as he heaves against the angled strain. He's shouting, roaring. Mustang is right behind me, then Milia. I almost slip. My balance and helldiver hands keep me scrabbling up the knotted wood. In our fur, we look like squirrels, not wolves. An arrow hisses through my cloak. I'm against the wall at the top of the wobbling beam. Pax and his boys roar gutturally from the exertion. Mustang is coming. I cup my hands. She stirps her foot at the run, and I hurl her up the last five meters to clear the battlements. Her sword slashes, and she screams like a banshee. Then Milia launches the same way off my hands, and the rope she has tied to her waist dangles after her. She anchors up top as I use it to pull myself up the last five metres. The wooden beam crashes to the ground behind me. My sword is out. It's mayhem. How Ceres was caught unaware. They've never had an enemy on the battlements. And there are three of us, screaming and slashing. Rage and excitement fill me, and I begin my dance. They only have bows. It's been months since they've used swords. Ours aren't sharp or fused with electricity, but cold juro steel is nasty to take in any form. The dogs are the hardest to manage. I kick one in the head, throw another off the battlements. Milia is down. She bites a dog in the neck and punches it in the balls till it whimpers off. Mustang tackles someone off the battlements. I slide tackle one of the arches as he levels his bow at her. Outside, Pax shouts for me to open the gates. He's actually crying for combat. I follow Mustang down into their courtyard, jumping from the parapet down to where she fights a big Ceres student. I end the boy with my elbow and take my first glimpse of the bread fortress. The castle is an unfamiliar design, a courtyard leading to several buildings and a huge keep where the bread bakes, making my stomach rumble. But all that matters to me is the gate. We rush to it, shouts from behind us, too many for us to fight. We get to the gate just as three dozen House Ceres students run at us across the courtyard from their keep. Hurry! Mustang shouts. Oh, hurry! Milia shoots arrows at the enemy from the parapets. Then I open the gate. Pax! Autelemanus! Pax! Autelemanus! He shoves me aside. He's shirtless, massive, muscled, screaming. His hair is painted white and spiked with sap to form two horns. A piece of wood, as long as my body, serves as his club. The house series students flinch back. Some fall, some stumble. A boy screams as Pax thunders close. Pax Autelemanus! Pax Autelemanus! He wants no nickname as he charges forward like a minotaur possessed. 
when he hits the mass of House Ceres students, it is ruin. Boys and girls fly through the air like chaff on reaping day. The rest of my army sprints in behind the mad bastard. They begin to howl, not because I told them to, not because they think they are Severo's howlers, but because it was the sound they heard when my soldiers cut their way out of horses' bellies, the sound that made their hearts sink as they were conquered. Now it's their turn to howl as they turn the battle into a mad melee. Pax screams his name, and he screams mine, as he conquers the citadel almost single-handedly. He picks a boy up by the leg and uses him as a club. Mustang drifts about the battlefield like some Valkyrie, enslaving those who lie stunned on the ground. In five minutes, the ovens and citadel are ours. We shut their gates, howl, and eat some bloody damn bread. I free the house Diana slaves who helped me capture the fortress and take a moment with each to share a laugh. Tactus sits on some poor boy's back, braiding the prisoner's hair in girlish pigtails, till I nudge him to get off. He slaps at my hand. Don't touch me, he snaps. What did you say? I growl. He stands fast, his nose coming only to my chin, and speaks very quietly so only we can hear. Listen, big man. I am of the Gens Valii. My pure blood goes back to the conquering. I could buy and sell you with my weekly allowance. So you don't demean me in this little game like all the others, you schoolyard king. Then louder so others can hear. I do as I like, because I took this castle for you and slept in a dead horse so we could take Minerva. I deserve to have some fun. I lean close. Three pints. He rolls his eyes. Whatever are you growling about? That's how much blood I'm about to make you swallow. Well, might makes right. He chuckles and turns his back on me. Then, mastering my anger, I tell the members of my army that they will never be slaves in this game again, so long as they wear my wolfskin. If they don't like that notion, they can clear out. None do, but that's expected. They want to win, but to follow my orders, to understand that I don't think I'm some high and mighty emperor, their proud hearts need to feel valued. So I make sure they know they are. I pay each student a specific compliment, one they remember forever. Even when I am ruining their society at the vanguard of a billion screaming reds, they will tell their children that Darrow of Mars once clapped them on the shoulder and paid them a compliment. The defeated students from House Ceres watch me free my army's slaves, and they gape. They don't understand. They recognize me, but they don't comprehend why there isn't a single other Mars student, or why I'm in power, or why I think it is allowed to free slaves. While they are still gaping, Mustang enslaves them with the symbol of House Minerva, and they become doubly confused. Win me a fortress! And you get your freedom too, I tell them. Their bodies are different from ours, softer from much bread and little meat. But you must be starving for some venison and wild meat. Some protein is missing in your diets, I think. We brought plenty to share. We free several slaves taken by House Ceres months prior. There are few, but most are House Mars or Juno. They find this new alliance strange, but it is an easy pill to swallow after months of toiling in the ovens. The night ends on a sour note, as I am woken an hour into sleep. Mustang sits on the edge of my bed as my eyes flutter open. When I see her, I feel a spike of terror in me, assuming she's come for a different reason. That her hand on my leg means something simple, something human. Instead, she brings me news 
I wished never to hear again. Tactus flouted my authority and tried to rape a Ceres slave during the night. Milia caught him, and Mustang barely stopped her from cutting Tactus a thousand different ways. Everyone is up in arms. It's bad, Mustang says. The Diana students are in their war gear, and are about to try to take him back from Milia and Pax. They're mad enough to fight Pax. Yeah. I'll get dressed. Please. I meet her in the Ceres war room two minutes later. The table is already carved with my sling blade. I didn't do it, and it's much better work than I could have managed. Thoughts? I fall into the seat opposite Mustang. We're a council of two. It's times like this I miss Cassius, Roke, Quinn, all of them. Especially Severo. When Titus did this, you said we make our own law if I remember right. You sentenced him to death. So, are we still doing that? Or are we doing something more convenient? She asks me, as though she already thinks I'm letting Tactus off the hook. I nod, surprising her. He'll pay, I say. This, it just pisses me off. She takes her feet off the table and leans forward to shake her head. We're meant to be better than this. That's all peerless are supposed to be, transcendent of urges that, she holds up ironic air quotes, enslave the weaker colors. It isn't about urges. I tap the table in frustration. It's about power. Tactus is of House Valii, Mustang exclaims. His family is ancient. How much power does that asshole want? Power over me, I mean. I told him he couldn't do something. Now he's trying to prove that he can do whatever he wants. So he's not another heathen like Titus? You've met him. Of course he's a heathen. But no, this was tactical. Well, the clever shit has put you in a tight spot. I slapped the table. I don't like this. Someone else picking the battle or the battlefield. That's how we will lose. It's a no win, really. We can't come out ahead. Someone is going to hate you either way. So we just have to figure out which way is the least damaging. Prime? What about justice? I ask. Her eyebrows float upward. What about winning? Isn't that what matters? You trying to trap me? She grins. Just testing you. I frown. Tactus killed Tamara, his primus. Cut her saddle, and then rode over her. He's wicked. He deserves any punishment we give him. Mustang raises her eyebrows as if this is all to be expected. He sees what he wants, and he takes it. How admirable, I mutter. She tilts her head at me, lively eyes going over my face. Rare. What's that? I was wrong. About you. That's rare. Am I wrong about Tactus? I ask. Is he wicked really? Or is he just ahead of the curve? Does he just grasp the game better? No one grasps the game. Mustang puts her muddy boots on the table again and leans back. Her golden hair falls past her shoulders in a long braid. The fire crackles in the hearth. Her eyes dance over my face. I don't miss my old friends when she smiles like that. I ask her to explain. No one grasps the game because no one knows the rules. No one follows the same set of rules. It is like life. Some think honor universal, some think laws binding. Others know better. But in the end, don't those who rise by poison die by poison? I shrug. In the storybooks, 
In life, there's no one left to poison them, often. They expect an eye for an eye, the house Ceres slaves. Punish Tactus, you piss off the Diana kids. They get you a fortress, and you spit on them for it. Remember, as far as they're concerned, Tactus hid in a horse's belly half a day for you when you took my castle. Resentment will swell like a copper bureaucracy. But if you don't punish him, you lose all of Ceres. Can't do that, I sigh. I failed this test before. I put Titus to death and I thought I was meeting out justice. I was wrong. Tactus is an iron gold. His blood is as old as the society. They look at compassion, at reform, as a disease. He is his family. He will not change. He will not learn. He believes in power. Other colors are not people to him. Lesser golds are not people to him. He is bound to his fate. Yet I'm a red, acting like a gold. No man is bound to his fate. I can change him. I know I can. But how? What do you think I should do? I ask. Ha! The great reaper. She slaps her thigh. When have you ever cared what anyone thinks? You're not just anyone. She nods and, after a moment, speaks. I was once told a story by Pliny, my tutor, a ghastly fellow, really, and a politico now, so take this all with a shipload of salt. Anyway, on earth there was a man and his camel. I laugh. She keeps going. They were traveling across this grand desert full of all sorts of nasties. One day, as the man prepared camp, the camel kicked him for no reason. So the man whipped the camel. The camel's wounds grew infected. It died and left the man stranded. Hands, camels, you and metaphors. She shrugs. Without your army, you're a man stranded in a desert. So tread carefully, Reaper. I speak with Nyla, the Ceres girl, in private. She's a quiet one, smart as a whip, but not physical in any way. Like a shuddering songbird, like Leah. She has a bloody swollen lip. It makes me want to castrate Tactus. She didn't come in wicked like the rest. Then again, she got through the passage. He told me he wanted me to rub his shoulders. Told me to do what he said because he was my master, because he spent blood taking the castle. Then he tried, well, you know. A hundred generations of men have used that inhuman logic. The sadness her words create in me makes me miss home. But that happened there too. I remember the screams that made the soup ladle tremble in my mother's hand. Remember how my cousin earned antibiotics from that gamma. Nyla blinks and stares for a moment at the floor. I told him I was Mustang's slave. House Minerva's. It's her standard. I didn't have to obey him. He just kept pushing me down. I screamed. He punched me, and he just held my throat till things started to fade, and I barely smelled his wolf cloak anymore. Then that tall girl, Milia, knocked him off, I guess. She didn't mention that there were other Diana soldiers in the room. Others watched. My army. I gave them power, and this is how they use it. It's my fault. They are mine, but they are wicked. That will not be fixed by punishing one of them. They have to want to be good. What would you like for me to do to him? I ask her. I don't reach out to comfort her. 
She doesn't need it, even though I think I do. She reminds me of Evie, too. Nyla touches her dirty curls and shrugs. Nothing. Nothing isn't enough. To fix what he tried to do to me. To make it right. She shakes her head and her hands clutch her sides. Nothing is enough. The next morning, I assemble my army in the Ceres Square. A dozen limp. Few Oriot bones can really be broken because of their strength, so most of the injuries suffered in the assault were superficial. I smell the resentment from Ceres students, from Diana students. It's a cancer that'll eat away at the body of this army, no matter who it is focused on. Pax brings Tactus out and shoves him to his knees. I ask him if he'd tried to rape Nyla. Laws are silent in times of war, Tactus draws. Don't quote Cicero to me, I say. You are held to a higher standard than a marauding centurion. In that, you're hitting the mark at least. I am a superior creature, descended from proud stock and glorious heritage. Might makes right, Darrow. If I can take, I may take. If I do take, I deserve to have. This is what peerless believe. The measure of a man is what he does when he has power. I say loudly. Just come off it, Reaper. Tactus replies, confident in himself, as all like him are. She's a spoil of war. My power took her, and before the strong, bend the weak. I'm stronger than you, Tactus, I say, so I can do with you as I wish, no? He's silent, realizing he's fallen into a trap. You are from a superior family to mine, Tactus. My parents are dead. I am the sole member of my family. But... I am a superior creature to you. He smirks at that. Do you disagree? I toss a knife at his feet and pull my own out. I beg you to voice your concerns. He does not pick his blade up. So, by right of power, I can do with you as I like. I announce that rape will never be permitted, and then I ask Nyla the punishment she would give. As she told me before, she says she wants no punishment. I make sure they know this, so there are no recriminations against her. Tactus and his armed supporters stare at her in surprise. They don't understand why she would not take vengeance, but that doesn't stop them from smiling wolfishly at one another, thinking their chief has dodged punishment. Then I speak. But I say... You get twenty lashes from a leather switch, Tactus. You try to take something beyond the bounds of the game. You gave in to your pathetic animal instincts. Here, that is less forgivable than murder. I hope you feel shame when you look back at this moment fifty years from now and realize your weakness. I hope you fear your sons and daughters knowing what you did to a fellow gold. Until then, Twenty lashes will serve. Some of the Diana soldiers step forward in anger, but Pax hefts his axe on his shoulder, and they shrink back, glaring at me. They gave me a fortress, and I'm going to whip their favorite warrior. I see my army dying as Mustang pulls off Tactus's shirt. He stares at me like a snake. I know what evil thoughts he's thinking. I thought them of my floggers, too. I whip him twenty brutal times, holding nothing back. Blood runs down his back. Pax nearly has to hack down one of the Diana soldiers to keep them from charging to stop the punishment. Tactus barely manages to stagger to his feet, wrath burning in his eyes. A mistake, he whispers to me. Such a mistake. Then I surprise him. I shove the switch into his hand. 
and bring him close by cupping my hand around the back of his head. You deserve to have your balls off, you selfish bastard, I whispered to him. This is my army. This is my army, I say more loudly. This is my army. Its evils are mine as much as yours, as much as they are Tactus's. Every time any of you commit a crime like this, something gratuitous and perverse, you will own it. And I will own it with you, because when you do something wicked, it hurts all of us. Tactus stands there like a fool. He's confused. I shove him hard in the chest. He stumbles back. I follow him, shoving. What were you going to do? I push his hand, holding the leather switch back toward his chest. I don't know what you mean. He murmurs as I shove him. Come on, man. You were going to shove your prick inside someone in my army. Why not whip me while you're at it? Why not hurt me, too? It'll be easier. Milia won't even try to stab you, I promise. I shove him again. He looks around. No one speaks. I strip off my shirt and go to my knees. The air is cold. Knees on stone and snow. My eyes lock with mustangs. She winks at me and I feel like I can do anything. I tell Tactus to give me twenty-five lashes. I've taken worse. His arms are weak, and so is his will to do it. It still stings, but I stand up after five lashes and give the lash to Pax. They start the count at six. Start over, I shout. A little rapist cur can't swing hard enough to hurt me. But Pax bloody well can. My army cries in protest. They don't understand. Golds don't do this. Golds don't sacrifice for one another. Leaders take. They do not give. My army cries out again. I ask them, how is this worse than the rape they were all so comfortable with? Is not Nyla now one of us? Is she not part of the body? Like reds are. Like obsidians are. Like all the colours are. Pax tries to go light, but it's Pax, so when he's done, my back looks like chewed goat meat. I stand up, do everything I can to prevent myself from wobbling. I'm seeing stars. I want to wail, want to cry. Instead, I tell them that anyone who does anything vile, they know what I mean, will have to whip me like this in front of the entire army. I see how they look at Tactus now, how they look at Pax, how they look at my back. You do not follow me because I am the strongest. Pax is. You do not follow me because I am the brightest. Mustang is. You follow me because you do not know where you are going. I do. I motion Tactus to come toward me. He wavers, pale, confused as a newborn lamb. Fear marks his face. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the pain I willingly bore. Fear when he realizes how different he is from me. Don't be afraid, I tell him. I pull him forward into a hug. We are blood brothers, you little shit. Blood brothers. I am learning. Chapter 37 South Shit on a pike! I yelp as Mustang puts Sav on my back in the war room. She flicks my back with a finger. Why? I moan. The measure of a man is what he does when he has power. She laughs. You mock him for Cicero and then spit out Plato. Plato was older. He trumps Cicero. Ow! And what was that about blood brothers? That means absolutely nothing. You might as well have said you were pinecone cousins. 
nothing binds like pain shared. Well, here's some more of that. She pulls a bit of leather out of a wound. I yelp. Pain shared, I shudder. Not inflicted. Psychotic. Ow. You sound like a girl. Thought martyrs were tough. Then again, you could be barking mad. Fever when you were stabbed, probably. You traumatized Pax, by the way. He's crying. Good work. I actually hear Pax's sniffles from the armory. But it did work, eh? Sure, Messiah. You made yourself a cult. She mocks dryly. They're building idols to you in the square, kneeling in supplication of your wisdom. Oh, mighty Lord. I will laugh when they find out they don't like you and can have you flogged any time they do a naughty. Now hold still, you pixie, and stop talking. You annoy me. You know, when we graduate, maybe you should look into being a pink. Your touch is so tender. She smirks. Send me to a rose garden. Huh. <laughs> now that would tickle my father pink. Oh, stop squealing. The pun wasn't that bad. The next day, I organize my army. I give Mustang the duty of choosing six squads of three scouts each. I have fifty-six soldiers. More than half are slaves. I make her put a series in each group, the most ambitious. They get six of the eight comm units I found in Ceres' war room. The things are primitive, crackling earpieces, but they give my army something I've never had, an evolution beyond smoke signals. So, I'm assuming you have a plan besides just going south like some Mongol horde, Mustang says. Of course. We're going to find the House Apollo. True to my promise to Fitchner. The scouts strike out that night from House Ceres, fanning out to the south in six directions. My army follows at dawn, just before the winter sun rises. I will not squander this opportunity. Winter has forced the houses into fortresses. Deep snows and hidden ravines make heavy cavalry sluggish, less useful. The game has slowed, but I won't. Mars and Jupiter can battle it out for all I care. I'll come back for both later. At nightfall on the second day of our move south, we see the fortress of Juno, already conquered by Jupiter. It lies to the west on a tributary of the Argos. Mountains frame it. Beyond that are the wintry six-kilometre-high walls of Valles Marineris. My scouts bring me news of three enemy scouts, cavalry, in the fringes of the woods to the east. They think it is Pluto, the jackal's men. The horses are black, and the hair of the riders is dyed the same. They wear bones in their hair. I hear that they rattle like bamboo wind chimes as they ride. Whoever the riders are, they never come close, never fall into my traps. A girl is said to lead them. She rides a silver horse draped with a leather mantle sewn with unbleached bones. Apparently the medbots are not so good in the south. Lilith, I think. She and her scouts disappear south as a larger warband appears from the southeast and skirts along the great woods. These are now real armies of heavy horse. A single rider comes forward from the larger warband. He carries the archer pennant of Apollo. His hair is long and unbraided, his face hard from the winter winds that roll in from the southern sea. A cut on his forehead nearly claimed both his eyes, eyes that stare now at me like two burning coals set in a face of hammered bronze. I walk forward to meet him after telling my army to look as weathered and pathetic as humanly possible. Pax manages poorly. Mustang makes him go to his knees so he looks relatively normal. She stands on his shoulders for comic relief and starts a snowball fight as the emissary comes near. It's a rowdy, foolish affair, and it makes my army look wonderfully vulnerable. I fake a limp 
toss away my wolf cloak. Fake a shiver. Make sure my pathetic durosteel sword looks more a cane than a weapon. Bend my long body as he approaches, and I spare a look back at my playing army. My look of embarrassment is almost split in half with a laugh. I swallow it down. His voice is like steel dragged over rough stone. No humour to him, no recognition that we're all teenagers playing a game and that the real world still flows on outside this valley. In the South, things have happened to make them forget. So when I offer him a self-effacing smile, he does not return it. He is a man, not a boy. I think it is the first time I've seen someone fully transformed. And you are but a ragged remnant from the North. The Apollo Primus, Novas, scoffs. He tries guessing the house we hail from. I've made sure the Ceres standard is the one he sees. His eyes flicker. He wants it for his own glory. He also happily notices that more than half my army of fifty-six is enslaved. You will not last long in the South. Perhaps you would like shelter from the cold, warm food, and bed. The South is harsh. I can't wager it'll be worse than the North, man, I say. They have raised us, and Pulsar are there. Proctors turned their favour from us. They are not there to favour you, weakling, he says. They help those who help themselves. We helped ourselves as best we could, I say meekly. He spits on the ground. Little child, do not whine here. The South does not listen to tears. But, but, the South cannot be worse than the North. I shudder and tell him of the Reaper from the Highlands. A monster, a brute, a killer, evil, evil things. He nods when I speak of the Reaper. So, he has heard of me. The Reaper of yours is dead. A shame. I would have liked to test myself against him. He was a demon. I protest. We have our own demons here. A one-eyed monster in the woods, and a worse monster in the mountains to the west. The jackal. He confides as he continues with his pitch. I would be allowed to join Apollo as a mercenary, not a slave. Never a slave. He would help me defeat the jackal, then retake the north. We would be allies. He thinks me weak and stupid. I look at my ring. The Proctor of Apollo will know what I say here. I want him to know I am going to ruin his house. If he wants to try to stop me, this is his invitation. No, I say to Novas. My family would shame me. I would be nothing to them if I joined you. No. I'm sorry. I smile inside. We have enough food to march through your lands. If you let us, we will brook no... He slaps me across the face. You are a pixie, he says. Stiffen your quivering lip. You embarrass your colour. He leans toward me over his saddle pommel. You are caught between giants, and you will be crushed... But make a man of yourself before we come for you. I do not fight children. It is then that Mustang throws a snowball at his head. Naturally, her aim is true, and her laugh is loud. Novas does not react. All that moves is his horse beneath him, as it wheels to take him back to his roving warband. I watch the man go, and feel disquiet seep into me. Ride on home, little archer, Tractus calls out. Ride home to your mommy. Novas rejoins his thirty heavy horse. Our only cavalry is our scouts. 
They cannot stand against iron blades and iron lances at full tilt, even with the deep snowbanks to muddle their heavier horses. Our weapons are still juro steel. Armour no better than juro plate or wolfskin. I don't even wear armour. I don't plan on fighting a battle where I need to for a while. We've not had a bounty after capturing Ceres's fortress and their standard. The proctors have forsaken me, but the weather has not. Normally, infantry falls like dry wheat to cavalry, but the snow and its treacherous depths protect us. We camp on the western bank of the river that night, nearer the mountains, away from the open plains in front of the dark great woods. Apollo's heavy cavalry now has to cross the frozen river in the darkness if they want to raid our camp as we sleep. I knew they'd try when they thought us weak, ripe for the taking. They failed miserably. Arrogance. As dusk settled, I had Pax and his strongmen take axes out to soften the thick ice of the river bordering our camp. We hear hoarse screams and plunging bodies in the night. Medbots whine down to save lives. Those boys and girls are out of the game. We continue south, aiming for where my scouts guess Apollo's castle lies. At night, we eat well. Soups are made from the meat and bones of animals my scouts bring back. Bread is kept stored in makeshift packs. It is the food that keeps my army content. As the great Corsican once said, an army marches on its stomach. Then again, he didn't fare so well in the winter. Mustang walks beside me as I lead the column. Though she's swaddled with wolf cloaks as thick as my own, she hardly comes up to my shoulder. And when we walk through deep snow, it's almost a laugh to see her try to keep a pace with me. But if I slow, I earn a scowl. Her braid bounces as she keeps up. When we reach easier ground, she glances over at me. Her pert nose is red as a cherry in the cold, but her eyes look like hot honey. You haven't been sleeping well, she says. When do I ever? When you slept next to me. You cried out the first week in the woods. After that, you slept like a little baby. Is this you inviting me back? I ask. I never told you to leave. She waits. So, why did you? You distract me, I say. She laughs lightly before drifting back to walk beside Pax. I'm left confused both by my response and by her words. I never thought she'd care one way or the other if I left. The stupid smile spreads on my face. Tactus catches it. Smitten as a lovebird, he hums. I hurl a handful of snow at his head. Not a word more. But I need another word. A serious word. He steps closer, takes a deep breath. Does the pain in your back give you a hard-on like it gives me? He laughs. Are you ever serious? His sharp eyes sparkle. Oh, you don't want me serious. How about obedient? He claps his hands together. Well, you know I'm not prime fond of the idea of a leash. Do you see a leash? I ask pointing to his forehead where his slave mark could be. And since you know I don't need a leash, it may do to tell me where we are bound. I would be more effective that way. He's not challenging me, because he speaks quietly. After the whipping we both received, he's taken to me in a frighteningly loyal way. Despite all the smiles and sneers and laughs, I have his obedience, and his question is sincere. We're going to ruin Apollo, I tell him. But why Apollo? he asks. 
Are we merely checking off the houses at random, or should I know something? The tone in his voice makes me cock my head. He's always reminded me of some kind of giant cat. Maybe it's the frighteningly casual way in which he lopes along, like he'd kill something without even tensing his muscles. Or maybe it's because I can imagine him coiling up on a couch and licking himself clean. I've seen things in the snow, Lipa, he says quietly. Impressions in the snow, to be specific. And these impressions are not made by feet. Paws. Hooves. No, dear leader. He steps closer. Linear impressions. I get his meaning. Grav boots flying very low. Do tell me, why are the proctors following us? And why are they wearing ghost cloaks? All his whispers mean nothing because of our rings, yet he doesn't know that. Because they are afraid of us, I tell him. Afraid of you, you mean? He watches me. What do you know that I don't? What do you tell Mustang that you don't tell us? You want to know, Tactus? I've not forgotten his crimes, but I take his shoulder and bring him close like he's a brother. I know the power touch can have. Then knock House Apollo off the gory damned map, and I will tell you. His lips curl into a feral smile. A pleasure, good reaper. We stay away from the open plains and cling to the river as we move farther south, listening to our scouts relay news of enemy holdings over the comms. Apollo seems to control everything. All we see of the jackal are his small bands of scouts. There's something strange about his soldiers, something that chills the heart. For the thousandth time, I think of my enemy. What makes the faceless boy so frightening? Is he tall, lean, thick, fast, ugly? What gives him his reputation, his name? No one seems to know. The Pluto scouts never come near, despite the temptation we offer them. A half packs carry the banner of Ceres high, so that every Apollo cavalryman in the surrounding miles can see it glimmer. Each realizes the chance for glory. Parties of cavalry dash into us. Scouts think they can pry our pride away and gain themselves status in their house. They come stupidly in threes, in fours, and we ruin them with the Ceres archers, or Minerva's spearmen, or with buried pikes in the snow. Little by little, we gnaw at them as the wolf gnaws at the elk. Always we let them escape, though. I want them angry as hell when I arrive on their doorstep. Slaves like them would slow us down. That night, Pax and Mustang sit with me by a small fire and tell me of their lives outside the school. Pax is a riot when you get him going. A surprisingly energetic talker, with a penchant for complimenting everything in his stories, including the villains. So half the time you don't know who is good and who is bad. He tells us of a time he broke his father's scepter in half, and another time he was mistaken for an obsidian and nearly shipped off to the Agoge, where they train in space combat. I notion you could say I've always dreamt of being an obsidian, he rumbles. When he was a boy, he would sneak from his family's summer manor in New Zealand, Earth, and join the obsidians as they performed the Nagoge, the nightly necessity of their training, in which they looted and stole in order to supplement the paltry diet they were given at the Agoge. He would scrap and fight with them for morsels of food. He says he would always win. That is, until he met Helga. Mustang and I lock eyes and try not to burst out with laughs as he waxes grandiloquent on Helga's ample proportions, her thick fists, her ample thighs. Theirs was a large love, I tell Mustang. A love to shake the earth, she replies. 
I'm woken the next morning by Tactus. His eyes are cold as the dawn's freeze. Our horses have decided to run away. All of them. He guides us to the series, boys and girls, who were watching the horses. None of them saw a thing. One minute the horses were there, the next they were gone. Poor horses must be confused, Pax says sorrowfully. It was stormy last night. Perhaps they ran for safety to the woods. Mustang hauls up the ropes that held the horses during the night, pulled in half. Stronger than they looked, she says dubiously. Tact us. I nod my head to the scene. He looks over at Pax and Mustang before answering. There are foot tracks. But why waste my breath? He shrugs. You know what I'm going to say. Proctors pulled the ropes apart. I do not tell my army what happened, but rumor spreads quickly when people huddle together for warmth. Mustang does not ask questions even though she knows I'm not telling her something. After all, I did not simply find the medicine I gave her in the Northwoods. I try to look at this newest kink as a test. When the rebellion begins, things like this will happen. How do I react? Breathe the anger out. Breathe it out and move. Easier said than done for me. We move to the woods to the east. Without horses, we've no more play to make in the plains near the river. My scouts tell me the castle of Apollo is near. How will I take it without horses, without any element of speed? As night falls, another kink reveals itself. The soup pots we brought from Ceres to cook over our fires are cracked through. All of them and the bread which we kept so securely wrapped in paper in our packs is full of weevils. They crunch like juicy seeds as I eat a supper of bread. To the drafters it will look an unfortunate turn of events, but I know it is something more. The proctors warn me to turn back. Why did Cassius betray you? Mustang asks me that night as we sleep in a hollow beneath a snowdrift. Our Diana sentries watch the camp's perimeter from the trees. Don't lie to me. I betrayed him, actually, I say. I... It was his brother that I had to kill in the passage. Her eyes widen, and after a moment she nods. I had a brother die. It's not, it wasn't the same thing. But a death like that, it changes things. Did it change you? No, she says, as though she just realized it. But it changed my family, made them into people I don't recognize sometimes. That's life. I suppose. She pulls back suddenly. Why did you tell Cassius that you killed his brother? Are you that mad, Reaper? I didn't tell him slag. The proctors did it through the jackal. Gave him a hollow cube. I see. Her eyes go cold. So they are cheating for the arch governor's son. I leave her and the warmth of the fire to piss in the woods. The air is cold and crisp. Owls hoot in the branches, making me feel watched in the night. Darrow, Mustang says from the darkness. I wheel about. Mustang, did you follow me? Darrow, not Reaper. Something is amiss. Something in the way she says my name that she says my name at all. It is like seeing a cat bark, 
but I can't see her in the darkness. I thought I saw something, she says, still in shadow, voice emanating from the deeper woods. It's just over here. It'll blow your mind. I follow the sound of her voice. Mustang, don't leave the camp. Mustang. We've already left it, darling. Around me the trees stretch ominously upward. The branches reach for me. The woods are silent. Dark. This is a trap. It is not Mustang. The proctors? The jackal? Someone watches me. When something watches you, and you don't know where it is, there is only one sensible thing to do. Change the bloody damn paradigm. Try to even the playing field. Make it have to look for you. I break into movement. I sprint back toward my army. Then I dash behind a tree, scramble up it, and wait. Watching. Knives out. Ready to throw. Cloak curled about me. Silence. Then the snapping of twigs. Something moves through the woods. Something huge. Pax! I call down. No response. Then I feel a strong hand touch my shoulder. The branch I crouch in sinks with the new weight as a man deactivates his ghost cloak and appears from thin air. I've seen him before. His curly blonde hair is cut tight to his head and frames his dusky godlike face. His chin is carved from marble and his eyes twinkle evilly, bright as his armour. Proctor Apollo. The huge thing moves again below us. Darrow, Darrow, Darrow. He clucks over at me in Mustang's voice. You are a favourite puppet, but you're not dancing as you ought. Will you reform and go north? I refuse. No matter. He shoves me off the branch, hard. I hit another on the way down, fall into the snow. I smell dander. Fur. And then the beast roars. Chapter 38 The Fall of Apollo The bear is huge, bigger than a horse, big as a wagon, white as a bloodless corpse, eyes red and yellow, razor black teeth long as my forearm. Nothing like the bears I've seen on the HC. A strip of red runs along its spine. Its paws are like fingers, eight on a hand. It's unnatural. Made by the carvers for sport. It's been brought to these woods to kill, to kill me in particular. Severo and I heard it roaring months back as we went to make peace with Diana. Now I feel it spittle. I stand there stupid for a second. Then the bear roars again and lunges. I roll, run. I sprint faster than I ever have in my life. I fly. But the bear is faster, if less agile. The woods shudder as it crashes through brush and trees. I run beside a massive god tree and dive through bramble. There the ground creaks beneath my feet, and I realise, as leaves and snow crumble under my feet, where I stand. I put the place between myself and the bear and wait for the bear to tear through the underbrush. It bursts clear and lunges for me. I jump back. Then it is gone, shrieking as it plummets through the trapdoor onto a bed of wooden spikes. My joy would have been longer lived if I didn't dance back and step into a second trap. The earth flips. Well, I do. My leg snaps upward and I fly into the air on the end of a rope. I dangle for hours, too frightened to call to my army for fear of Proctor Apollo. My face tingles and itches from the blood rushing to my head. Then a familiar voice cuts the night. Well, 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 it sneers from below. Looks like we've two pelts to skin. Severo smirks when I tell him I've allied with Mustang. At camp, 
where Mustang was preparing search parties to send out for me, his reputation precedes him amongst the Northerners. The Minervans fear him. Tactus and the other dead horses, on the other hand, are delighted. Why, if it isn't my belly buddy, Tactus drawls. Why the limp, my friend? Your mother rode me ragged, Severo grunts. Bah, you'd have to stand on your tiptoes to even kiss her chin. Wasn't her chin I was trying to kiss. Tactus claps his hands together in laughter and draws Severo in for an obnoxious hug. They are two very peculiar people. But I suppose snuggling in horse corpses gives a bond, makes twins of a morbid sort. Where were you? Mustang asks me quietly to the side. In a second, I say. Severo has only one eye now. So he is the one-eyed demon the Apollonian emissary warned me about. I always wondered what sort of mad little fellows you howlers were, Mustang says. Little, Severo asks. I didn't mean to offend. He grins. I am little. Well, we of Minerva thought you were ghosts. She pats his shoulder. You're not, and I'm not a real Mustang, if you are wondering. No tail, you see. And no, she interrupts Tactus, I've never worn a saddle since you were going to ask. He was. She'll do, Severo mutters sideways to me. I like them, Mustang says of the howlers a few moments later. Make me feel tall. Perfect. Tactus picks up the bloodback pelt with a grunt. Looky, look. They found something in Pax's size. Before we join the group at the large fire that Pax dogs, Severo pulls me aside and produces a blanket. Inside is my sling blade. Kept it safe for you after finding it in the mud, he says. And I made it sharper. Time for using a dull blade is over. You're a friend. I hope you know that. I clap him on the shoulder. Not a game friend. A real friend now, when we're out of here. You know that, yes? I'm not an idiot. He blushes all the same. I learned from him around the campfire that he and the howlers, Thistle, Screwface, Clown, Weed and Pebble, the dregs of my old house, stayed no longer than a day after I disappeared. Cassius said the jackal took you, Severo says through a mouthful of weevily bread. Delicious nuts. He eats like he hasn't seen food in weeks. We sit fireside in the great woods, bathed in the light of crackling logs. Mustang, Milia, Tactus and Pax join us in leaning on a fallen tree in the snow. We're all bundled like animals. I sit close with Mustang. Her leg is entwined with mine beneath the furs. The bloodback fur stinks and crackles over the fire. Fat drips into the flames. Pax will wear it when it dries. Severo sought the jackal after Cassius fed him the lie. My small friend doesn't get into details. He hates details. He just taps his empty eye socket and says, The jackal owes me. You saw him then? I ask. It was dark. I saw his knife. Didn't even hear his voice. I had to jump off the mountain. It was a long fall back to the rest of the pack. He says it so plainly. Yet, I did notice his limp. We couldn't stay in the mountains. His men, everywhere. But we took some of the mountains with us, Thistle says. She pats the scalps on her waist with a motherly smile. Mustang shudders. It's been chaos in the south. Apollo, Venus, Mercury and Pluto are all that's left, but I hear Mercury has been reduced to a force of roving vagabonds. A pity. I was fond of their proctor. He almost chose me in the draft, 
Would have, if he could have. Wonder how things would have gone then. Severo, with that leg, how fast can you run? Say, two kilometres? I ask. The others are puzzled by the question, but Severo just shrugs. Doesn't slow me. Minute and a half in this low graph. I make a note to tell him my idea later. We have more important things to discuss, Reaper. Tactus smiles. Now, I heard you were dangling upside down in the woods from this one here's trap. He pats little Thistle on her thigh. She smiles as he lets his hand linger. It's the scalp collection that draws his affection. You didn't think you'd sneak out of telling the tale, did you? It's not so funny a thing as he might suspect. I finger my ring. Telling them would be signing their death warrants. Apollo and Jupiter listen to me now. I look at Mustang and feel hollow. I'll risk losing her just to win their rigged game. If I were a good person, I would keep the ring on. I would hold my tongue. But there are plans to make, gods to undo. I take my ring off and set it on the snow. Let us for one moment pretend we are not from different houses, I say. Let's all of us talk as friends, ringless. Without horses, without mobility, I have no advantage over my enemy in the surrounding lands. Another lesson to be learned. I make an advantage for myself, a new strategy. I make them fear me. My tactics are ones of fragmentation. I split my army into six pieces of ten under myself, Pax, Mustang, Tactus, Milia, and, due to a surprising recommendation for Milia, Nyla. I would have given Severo his own unit, but he and his howlers will not leave my side again. They blame themselves for the scar on my belly. My army sets into Apollo's holdings like starving wolves. We do not assail their castle, but we raid their forts. We bring fire to their supply stores. We shoot arrows at their legs. We fell their water supplies and tell prisoners false news and let them escape. We murder their goats and pigs. We hack their riverboats with axes. We steal weapons. I do not allow prisoners to be taken except if they are students from Venus, Juno, or Bacchus enslaved by Apollo. All others we let escape. The fear and legend must spread. This my army understands better than anything else. They are dogmatic. They tell each other tales of me around the campfires. Pax is their ringleader. He thinks I am myth-made man. Many of my soldiers begin carving my sling blade into trees and walls. Tactus and Thistle carve sling blades into flesh. And the more industrious members of my army make standards of stained wolf pelts that we take into battle on the end of spears. I split the slaves of House Ceres and the other captured slaves from one another to integrate them into the various units. I know their allegiances are shifting, bit by bit. They begin to refer to themselves not as Ceres or Minerva or Diana, but by their unit name. I place four Ceres soldiers, the smallest, with Severo in the Howlers. I do not know if the Bakers will make for elite warriors as Mars's dregs did, but if anyone can carve off their baby fat, it's Severo. Fear gnaws at Apollo for a week. Our ranks swell. Theirs diminish. Freed slaves tell us of the terror in the castle, the worry that I will appear from the shadows with my bloody wolf cloaks to burn and maim. I do not fear House Apollo. They are lumbering fools who cannot adjust to my tactics. What I fear is the proctors and the jackal. To me, they are one and the same. After Apollo's failed attempt on my life, I fear they will be more direct. When will I wake with a razor in my spine? This is their game. At any time, I could die. 
I must destroy House Apollo now. Get Proctor Apollo out of the game before it is too late. My lieutenants and I sit around our fire in the woods to discuss the tactics of the next day. We are less than two miles from House Apollo's castle, but they dare not attack us. We are in the deep woods. They huddle in fear of us. We also don't attack them. I know Proctor Apollo would ruin even the cleverest of night assaults. Before we can begin, Nyla asks about the jackal. Severo's voice is quiet as he tells her what he learned in the mountains. It grows louder as he realises we are all listening. His castle is somewhere in the low mountains. Subterranean, not in the high peaks. Just near Vulcan. Vulcan got off to a prime start. Fast-like. They blitzed Pluto on the third day. Efficient turds. Pluto wasn't ready. So the jackal took control and had them retreat into their deep tunnels. Vulcan came howling in with advanced weapons from their forges. It was all going to be over. The jackal would have been a slave from the first week on. So he collapsed the tunnel. No plan. No way out. In order to preserve his chance to win the game. Killed ten of his own house. Tons of hydrafts. Medbots couldn't save anyone. Stranded forty of the rest in the dark caves. Plenty of water. No food. They were there for nearly a month before they dug their way out. He smiles, and I remember why Fitchner called him Goblin. Guess what they ate? If a jackal is caught in a trap, it'll chew off its own leg. Who told me that? The fire crackles between us. I would have expected Mustang to shift uncomfortably, but instead, what I see from her is anger as the details are relayed. Pure anger. Her jaw flexes, and her face loses a shade. I grip her hand beneath the blanket, but it does not grip back. How did you find all that out? Pax rumbles. Severo taps one of his curved knives with a fingernail, allowing a soft ding into the night air. It echoes into the woods, bouncing off trees and returning to our ears like a lost phrase. Then I can hear nothing from the woods. Nothing beyond the fire. My heart leaps into my throat, and I catch Severo's eye. He'll have to find Tactus. A jam field envelops us. Hello, children, a voice says from the darkness. Such a bright fire is dangerous at night. And you're like little puppies, all snuggled together. No, don't get up. His voice is melodious, frivolous, eerie to hear after so many months of hardship. No one's voice sounds like that. He strolls in lightly and plops down beside Pax. Apollo. This time he brought no bear. Only a grand spear that drips purple sparks along its business end. Proctor Apollo, welcome, I say. Sentinels perch above us in the trees, their arrows pointed at the proctor. I wave the trap away and ask the proctor why he is here, as if we've never met. His presence sends a very simple message. My friends are in danger. To tell you to return home, my dear nomads. He opens up a flagon of wine and passes it around. No one drinks, except Severo. He holds on to the flagon. Proctors aren't supposed to interfere with things. It's in the rules, Pax says in confusion. By what right do you come here? This is dirty play. Mustang seconds his question. The Oriot sighs, but before he can say anything, Severo stands and belches. He begins walking off. Where are you going? Apollo snaps. Don't walk away from me. Going to piss. Drank all your wine. Rather I piss here. He cocks his head and touches his small stomach. Maybe shit too. Apollo wrinkles his nose and looks back to us 
dismissing Severo. Influencing is hardly dirty play, my giant friend, he explains. I merely care for your well-being. I am here, after all, to guide you in your studies. It would be best for you all to return to the north, that is all. Better strategy, let's say. Finish your battle there, consolidate your power, then expand out. It is the rules of war. Do not expose yourself when weak. Do not push your enemy to fight when you are inferior. You have no cavalry, no shelter, meagre weapons. You are not learning as you ought. His grin is welcoming. It slashes through his beautiful face like a crescent moon as he twirls the rings on his finger, waiting for our response. It is kind of you to consider our well-being, Mustang replies in mocking high lingo. I do say, very kind, warms my bones, paying special attention, no less, to the fact that you're from another house. But tell me, does my proctor know you're here? Does Mars's? She nods over to silent Milia. Does Juno's? Are you doing a naughty-naughty, good sir? If you're not, then why the jam field? Or do others watch? Apollo's eyes harden, though his smile remains. To be quite frank, your proctors don't know what you children are playing at. You had your chance, Virginia. You lost. Don't allow yourself to be bitter. Darrow here beat you fair and sound. Or did your winter together blind you to the fact that there can only be one winning house? Only one victorious primus? Were all of you truly so blinded? This boy can give you nothing. He looks around at each of them. I shall repeat, since you are a rusty lot, Darrow's win will not mean you win. No one will offer you an apprenticeship because they see him being the key to your success. You merely follow, like General Ney or Ajax Minor. And who remembers them? This Reaper does not even have his own standard. He is using you, that is all. He is embarrassing you and ruining your chances for careers beyond this first year. You're quite annoying, all due respect, Proctor, Nyla says without her usual kindness. And you're still a slave, Apollo points to her mark fit for all sorts of abuse. Only till I earn the right to wear one of those, Nyla gestures to Mustang's wolf cloak. Your loyalty is touching, but Pax interrupts. Would you let me whip you, bloody Apollo? Darrow did. Let me whip you and I'll obey like a pink. Promise on the graves of my ancestors, those of Telamanus and the— You're nothing more than a bureaucratic pixie, Milia hisses. Do us a favor and piss off. My lieutenants are loyal, though I shudder to think what Tactus or Severo would have said had they been around the fire with us. I lean forward to stare down Apollo. Still, I must provoke him. Do a solid, eh? Take your advice, shove it up your ass, and piss off. Someone laughs in the air above us, a woman's laugh. Other proctors watch from inside the jam field. I see silhouettes in the smoke. How many what? Jupiter? Venus, maybe, by the laugh. That would be perfect. The fire flickers above Apollo's face. He is angry. Here is the logic I know. The winter could get colder, children. When it gets cold outside, things die. Like wolves, like bears. 
like Mustangs. I have a reply, and it is perfectly long-winded. I wonder, Apollo, what happens if the drafters find out that you are arranging to have the Arch-Governor's son win? If you were, say, rigging the game like a bizarre crime lord. Apollo freezes. I continue. When you tried killing me in the woods with that stupid bear, you failed. Now you come here like the desperate fool you are to threaten my friends when they do not slaver at the idea of betraying me. Will you kill us all? I know you can edit what you like from the footage the drafters see, but however will you explain to all our drafters how we all died? My lieutenants feign their shock. I go on. Say an imperator of a fleet, say a legate, say any of the drafters of any of the other houses found out that the arch-governor was paying the proctors to cheat, to eliminate the competition so that his son would win and their children would lose. Do you think there would be consequences for the proctors being bribed? For the arch-governor? Do you think they might care that their children are dying in a rigged game? Or that you're getting paid to ruin the meritocratic system? The best shall rise. Or is it the best connected? Apollo's jaw tightens. He looks up to the other proctors. They wisely stay invisible. He must have drawn the short straw to come down here to be the face of their cheating. My lieutenants stay silent as he speaks. If they did find out, children, then there would be consequences for everyone. Apollo threatens. So feel free to guard your tongues while you have them. Or what? Mustang asks violently. What do you think you're going to do? You, of all people, should know, he says. I don't understand his point, but this charade has run its course. I've counted the seconds since several left. The proctors have not. I turn to Mustang. How fast can Severo run two kilometers? A minute and a half in this gravity, I do believe, though he's a little liar, so likely faster. And how far is Apollo's castle? Oh... I'd say three kilometers, maybe a little more. Apollo jumps to his feet, looking around for several. Splendid, I say. Say, Mustang, do you know what I like most about jam fields? That no sound can get out? No, that no sound can get in. Apollo disengages the jam field, and we hear the howls. They come from the distance two miles away from ramparts, from Apollo's castle. Medbots wail toward the cries, streaking across the distant sky. Venus! Why are you not watching them? You stupid! Apollo snarls at the empty air. The little one took off his ring! An invisible woman cries. They all took off their rings. I can't see anything without their rings on, and not in a jam field. But they're all back on by now, I say. So pull up your data pad and tell me what you see. You little... Apollo's hands clench. I flinch back. Mustang steps between us, as does Pax. Uh-oh. Pax booms, thumping his huge axe against his chest. The armor beneath his wolf cloak thumps rhythmically. Uh-oh. Snow flies as Apollo soars out of the woods, the other proctors on his heels. They will be too late. Edit all they like. Interfere all they like. The battle for House Apollo has begun, and Severo and Tactus have claimed the ramparts. My lieutenants and I arrive at the battle in time to see Tactus climbing the highest tower, a knife in his teeth. There, standing on the edge of the hundred-meter parapet, like some careless Greek champion, he pulls down his pants and pisses on the banner of House Apollo. 
He scrawled through shit to earn that banner. The slaves we captured throughout the week told us of the castle's weaknesses, large latrine holes, and so Tactus, Severo, and the Howlers exploited them in dreadfully efficient time. House Apollo's soldiers woke to demons covered in dung. Oh, how terribly my conquering soldiers smell as they open the gates for me. Inside, it's a mass of chaos. The castle is tall, white, ornate. Its plaza stands round and has six grand doorways that lead to six grand spiralling towers. Sheep and cows crowd makeshift pens on the far side of the plaza. Apollo guards have retreated there. More of their allies stream from the tower doorways behind them. My men are outnumbered, three to one, but mine are freemen, not slaves. They will fight better. Yet, it is not numbers that threatens to turn the tide against my invading army. It's the Apollo Primus, Novas. The proctor gave him his own pulse weapon. A spear that glimmers with purple sparks. Its tip touches one of the dead horses from Diana, and the girl flips ten feet backward like a broken toy convulsing on the ground as its gears fall off their tracks. I gather my forces near the gatehouse, just inside the plaza. Many are still in the towers, like Tactus. I've got Pax, Milia, Nyla, Mustang, and thirty others at my back. The enemy Primus marshals his own forces. His weapon alone could ruin us. Mustang, ready with that standard? I ask. I feel her hand on the small of my back, just beneath my breastplate. I wear no helm. My hair is bound by leather. My face is dark with soot. My right hand carries my sling blade, the left a shortened stun pipe. Nyla carries the standard of Ceres. Pax, we're the scythe. Girls, you're the pickers. My men in the towers howl as they sprint and jump down from their perches to join the battle, streaming into the plaza from all angles. Their stained wolf cloaks reek. The cobblestones between my band and Apollo's lie thick with ankle-high drifts of snow. Proctors glint in the air above, waiting for the pulse spear to make short work of my army. Take their primus, Mustang whispers in my ear. She points to the tall, hard boy and smacks my butt. Claim him. Twenty meters and stop, Pax. He nods at my command. The primus is mine! I roar to my army and to theirs. Novas, you gory whore! You are mine, you piss-eating snail, you foul piece of shit! As the tall, mad invader with the sling blade screams at their primus, Apollo's forces shirk instinctively away. Enslave the rest! I howl. Then Pax and I charge. The rest stream after, trying to catch my heels. I let Pax overtake me. He's screaming with his war axe and charging at Novas and his band of bodyguards, heavily armoured boys and girls with crimson handprints on their helmets. They lead the charge of the enemy host, going straight at Pax, lowering their spears to stop his mad charge. These are the tall sort, the dashing killers who have long since grown too arrogant to understand they are in danger or to feel fear as they make plans to meet Pax in arms. Then Pax stops. And without breaking stride, I jump so his hand catches my foot. I push off and he launches me ten metres forward into the air. I'm howling the entire way like a thing torn from bloody damn nightmares until I smash into the bodyguards. Three go down. A random spear catches my stomach and scrapes along my ribs, spinning me just as a trident pierces the air where my head had been. I gain my feet, swing horizontally, sweeping legs. I spin away from a thrust and hack down diagonally as I come from my spin, shattering someone tall at the collarbone. Another spear comes at me. I slap it to the side and run along its length, jumping to bury my knee into the face of an Apollo high draft. He falls back, taking me with him, my knee stuck in his helmet's visor. 
I slash madly as I go from the high vantage, stunning three other high drafts with looping blows till I teeter down to the ground. We hit the snow. The high draft's nose is broken and he's unconscious, but my knee is numb and bloody from the impact as I jerk it out of his helmet. I roll away, expecting spears to fillet me. They don't. I shatter the head of the Apollo army in one mad charge. Pax and my army sweep in like an iron curtain till I'm left with Novas in the center of the chaos. He's tall and strong. A sweeping arc from his spear shatters a howler's shield. He blasts Milia backwards and catches Pax in the arm with the spear, knocking him to the ground like a toy. I'm taller and stronger. Novas, you little girl, I shout. You snivelling pink. His eyes flash when he sees me coming. The battle takes a collective breath as he wheels toward me like an elk turning on the leader of a wolf pack. We stalk toward one another. He lunges first. I dodge and spin along the length of the spear till I'm behind him. Then, with one massive swing, like I'm hacking down a tree with my sling blade, I break his leg and take his spear. He moans like a child. I sit on his chest, smug with the satisfaction that I did not moan like this when my legs were broken and rewoven in Mickey's carve shop. I make a show of yawning despite the chaos swirling around me. Mustang takes the reins of battle. Only one member of House Apollo escapes. A girl. A fast girl, but an unimportant member of their house. Somehow, she jumps from the highest tower and simply floats down to the ground with her house's standard. Almost like magic. But I see the distortion around her. Proctor Apollo preserves his position in the game. The girl finds a horse and rides away from my horseless army. Pax hurls a spear at her from a distance. His aim is true and would have pinned the horse to the turf through the neck. But a freakish wind miraculously knocks the spear wide. In the end, it's Mustang who takes a horse from the Apollo stables and chases the girl down with the howlers, thistle and pebble. She brings her back, bent over her own horse's neck, spanking her butt with the standard as they gallop back. My army roars as Mustang trots into the conquered castle square. We've already freed the House Ceres slaves. They've earned their place in my army. I wave down at Mustang from my perch beside Severo and Tactus on the high ramparts. Our feet dangle carelessly over the edge. House Apollo has fallen in less than thirty minutes despite Apollo's interference with the pulse spear. Proctor Apollo confers with Jupiter and Venus in the sky. They glitter in the dawn light, as though nothing has happened. But I know he will have to leave the game. The standard and the castle are taken. He cannot hurt me any longer. You're through, I taunt Apollo. Your house has fallen. My army roars once more. I bask in the sound and the winter air as the sun peeks over the western lip of the Valis Marineris. Most of those voices would be slaves. Instead, they follow willingly. Soon, even those of House Apollo will follow me. I laugh wildly. The fire of victory is hot in my veins. We have beaten one proctor, but Jupiter can still hurt us. His house is unbent, unbroken, far to the north. A quick rage overtakes me along with another, darker passion, one of arrogance, furious, mad arrogance. I grab the pull spear, cock my arm, and hurl the weapon as hard as I can at the gathered proctors. My army watches this act of impudence. The three proctors scatter after the pull spear goes through their shielding. They turn to look at me. Fire glitters in their eyes but the passion in me was not quenched by a mere spear throw. I hate these scheming fools. I will ruin them. Jupiter, you are next, 
You are next, you piece of dog shit. Then Pax bellows my name. And then Tactus's voice echoes it. Then Nyla from a far tower. And soon a hundred voices chanted throughout the conquered castle, from the courtyard to the high parapets and towers. They beat their swords and spears and shields. And then they throw them at the proctors. A hundred missiles thump harmlessly into pulse shields, and many of my army must scatter so they are not impaled by the falling weapons, but it is a sweet sight, a sweet sound of metal rain on cobbled stone. And again, they take up my name. They chant and chant the name of the Reaper at the Proctors, because they know whom we now fight. Chapter 39 The Proctor's Bounty My army sleeps well into the morning. I have no need of rest, though I keep company with several and half a dozen others on the ramparts. They stand close, as though any space might present the Proctors an opportunity to kill me. Severo has freed five Mercury students from the Apollo slave groups. They cluster around him on the ramparts, playing games of speed, slapping each other's knuckles to see who can move the fastest. I don't play, because I win too easily. Best to let the children have their fun. After the taking of the castle, even though Severo and Tactus did the heavy lifting, my boys and girls think that makes me some sort of marvel. Mustang told me it is a rare thing. It's as if they think you're something out of time. I don't understand. Like, you're one of the old conquerors. The ancient golds who usurped Earth, destroyed her fleets and all that. They use it as an excuse not to compete with you, because how could Hephaestus compete with Alexander, or Antonius with Caesar? My inside's not. This is but a game, and they love me this much. When the rebellion comes, these boys and girls will be my enemies, and I will replace them with reds. How fanatical, then, will those reds be? And will that fanaticism matter a lick if they have to stand against creatures like Severo, like Tactus, like Pax and Mustang? I watch Mustang slink toward me along the rampart. She limps ever so slightly from a sprained ankle, Yet she's all grace. Her hair is a nest of twigs. Circles ring her eyes. She smiles at me. She is beautiful. Like Eo. From the ramparts, we can see over the great woods that glimpse the beginnings of Mars's highlands to the north. The mountains glower at us from the west to our left. Mustang points to the sky. Proctor, incoming. My bodyguards tighten around me, but it's only Fitchner. Severo spits over the ramparts. Our prodigal parent returneth. Fitchner descends with a smile that tells a tale of exhaustion, fear, and a little bit of pride. May we talk? He asks me, looking about at my scowling friends. Fitchner and I sit together in the Apollo war room. Mustang stokes the fire. Fitchner eyes her sceptically, disliking her presence. He has an opinion on most things, like someone else I know. You've made such a mess of things, lad. Let's agree that you won't call me lad, I say. He nods. There's no gum in his mouth. He doesn't know how to say what he wants to tell me. It's the worry in his eyes that cues me in. Apollo has not left Olympus, I say. He stiffens, surprised at my guess. Correct. He's still there. And what does that mean, Fitchner? Mustang comes to sit beside me. Just that. Fitchner answers, looking at me. 
He has not left Olympus like he ought. It's all a mess. Apollo was getting a juicy appointment at the jackal one. Same with Jupiter and some of the others. There was talk of one of the Praetor night positions opening up on Luna. And now that choice is slipping away, Mustang says. She glances over at me with a smirk. Because of a boy. Yes. I laugh. The jam field makes the sound echo. So what is to be done? You still want to win, yes? Fitchner asks. Yes. And that is the point of all this? He asks me, though it's clear there's something else in his head. You'll get an apprenticeship, no matter. I lean forward and tap my finger on the table. The point is to show them that they can't gory well cheat in their own game. That the arch-governor can't just say his son is best and should beat me just because he was born lucky. This is about merit. No, Fitchner says, leaning forward. It's about politics. He glances at Mustang. Will you send her away already? Mustang stays. Mustang, he mocks. So, Mustang, what do you think about the arch-governor cheating for his son? Mustang shrugs. Kill or be killed. Cheat or be cheated. Those are the rules I've seen Oriots follow, especially peerless scarred. Cheat or be cheated. Fitzner taps his upper lip. Interesting. You should know about the cheating part, she says. You need to let Darrow and me have a word, Mustang. She stays. It's okay, she mutters cryptically. She squeezes my shoulder as she leaves. I am bored of your proctor anyway. When Mustang is gone, Fitchner stares at me. He reaches to his pocket, hesitates, then pulls something out. A small box. He tosses it on the table and gestures for me to open it. Somehow I know what is inside. Well, you bastards do owe me a few bounties. I laugh bitterly as I slip Dancer's knife ring onto my finger. I flex the joint, and a blade pops out, extending along the top of the finger eight inches. I flex the joint again, and it slithers home. The obsidians took it from you before you went through the passage, yes? I was told it was your father's. Someone told you that. I pick at the war room table with the blade. How very inaccurate of them. You don't need to be snide, lad. My eyes flick up to look into Fitchness. You came here to win an apprenticeship. You've done that. If you keep pushing the proctors, they will kill you. I seem to remember us already having this conversation. Darrow, there is no slagging point to what you are doing. It is reckless. No point, I echo. If you beat the arch-governor's boy, then what? What does that achieve? Everything, I snap. I shudder with anger and stare at the fire till my voice finds control again. It proves I am the best gold in this school. It shows that I can do whatever they can. Why should I even speak to you, Fitchner? I've done all this without your help. I don't need you. Apollo tried to kill me and you did nothing, nothing. So what exactly do I owe you? Maybe this. I let the blade slither out. Darrow. Fitchner. I roll my eyes. He slaps the table. Don't talk to me like I'm a fool. Look at me. Look at me, you condescending little twit. I look at him. His stomach paunch has grown. His face is haggard for a gold his hair yellow and slicked back. He's never been handsome, less now than ever. Look at me, Darrow. Everything I have, I've had to fight for. I was not 
born to an arch-governor's household. This is as far as I could ever go, yet I should go much further. My son should go further, but he can't, and he won't. He'll die if he tries. Everyone has a limit, Darrow, a limit they can't skip past. Yours is higher than mine, but it's not as high as you'd gory well like. If you go past it, they'll knock you down. He stares away, as if ashamed, glowering at the fire. His son. It's in their colouring. In the face. In the disposition and the way they speak to one another. I'm a fool for not saying it out loud sooner. You're Severo's father, I say. He does not respond for some time. When he does, his voice is pleading. You make him think he can climb higher than he can. You'll kill him, Boyo, and you'll kill yourself. Then help us, I urge him. Give me something I can use against Apollo, or better, fight them with me. Gather the other proctors, and we'll take the battle to them. I can't, Boyo. I can't. I sigh. No, I thought you wouldn't. My career would be over in a pinch if I helped you. All I've slaved for, all the many things, would be risked. For what? Just to prove a point to the arch-governor? Everyone is so frightened of change, I say, before smiling sincerely at the broken man. You remind me of my uncle. There will be no change. Fitchner grumbles as he stands. Never is. Know your damn place, and you won't make it out of this, boyer. He looks like he wants to reach and touch my shoulder. He doesn't. Hell, the trap's already set for you. You're walking right into it. I'm ready for the jackal's traps, Fitchner. Or Apollo's. It makes no difference. They won't be able to stop what's coming for them. No, Fitchner says, hesitating for a moment. Not their traps. The girls. I answer him in a way he will understand. Fitchner, do not play me for a fool with vague, annoying references to duplicity. My army is mine, one in heart and body and soul. They can no more betray me at this point than I can betray them. We are something you have not seen before, so stop. He shakes his head. This is your fight, Boyo. Yes, it is my fight. I smile. Now is the time I've been waiting for. It's no hold up, I say, before he reaches the door. He stops and looks back. I kick back my chair and stride over to him. He eyes me curiously. Then I stick out my hand. Despite everything, thank you. He clasps it. Good luck, Tao, he says. But take care of Severo. The little shit will follow you anywhere, no matter what I say. I'll take care of him. I promise. My helldiver grip tightens on his hand. For a moment, if only a moment, we are friends. Then he winces at the pressure my hand is putting on his. He laughs at first, then he understands, and his eyes widen. Sorry, I say. That's when I break his nose and slam my elbow into his temple till he no longer moves. Chapter 40 Paradigm Fitchner left, she asks me. Through the window, I say. I watch Mustang across Apollo's white war room table. A blizzard has risen outside, no doubt meant to keep my army inside the castle, around their warm fires and hot pots of soup. Her hair coils about her shoulders, held by leather bands. 
She wears the wolf cloak like the others, though hers is streaked with crimson. Muddy boots with spurs are kicked up on the table. Her standard, the only weapon she really favours, leans on a chair beside her. Mustang's face is a quick one, quick to mocking smiles, quick to pleasant frowns. She gives me the smile and asks what is on my mind. I am wondering when you will betray me, I say. Her eyebrows knit together. You're expecting that? Cheetah be cheated, I say, echoed by your own lips. Are you going to cheat me? She says. No, because what advantage would you gain? You and I have beaten this game. They would have us believe one must win at the cost to all the rest. That isn't true. And we're proving it. I say nothing. You have my trust because when you saw me hiding in the mud after taking my castle, you let me escape. She explains thoughtfully. And I have your trust because I pulled you from the mud when Cassius left you for dead. I do not respond. So there is your answer. You are going to do great things, Darrow. She never calls me Darrow. Maybe you don't have to do them alone? Her words make me smile. Then I bolt upright, startling her. Get our men, I order. I know she was looking forward to resting here. I was too. The smell of soup tempts me. So does the warmth and the bed and the thought of spending a quiet moment with her. But that is not how men conquer. We're going to surprise the proctors. We're going to take Jupiter. We can't surprise them. She taps her ring. The jam field Fitchner had is gone. We'd ditched the rings completely, but they are our insurance. The proctors may be able to edit out a few things here and there, but common sense dictates that they can't tamper with the footage too much, or the drafters will get suspicious. And even if we make it through this storm, what will taking Jupiter accomplish? She asks. If Apollo didn't leave when his house lost, Jupiter won't either. You're just going to provoke them into interfering. We should go after the jackal now. I know the proctors are watching me plan this. I want them to know where I'm going. I'm not ready for the jackal, I tell her. I need more allies. She looks at me, eyebrows pinched together. She doesn't understand, but it doesn't matter. She will, soon enough. Despite the blizzard, my army moves swiftly. We bundle ourselves in cloaks and furs so thickly that we look like animals stumbling through the snow. At night, we follow the stars, moving despite the mounting winds and the piling snow. My army does not grumble. They know I will not lead them purposelessly. My new soldiers press themselves harder than I would have thought possible. They have heard of me. Pax makes sure of that. And they are desperate to impress me. It becomes problematic. Wherever I walk, the procession around me suddenly doubles their effort so that they overtake those in front or outpace those behind. The blizzard is vicious. Pax always stands close to me and Mustang as though he means to block us from the wind. He and Severo are always stepping on each other's toes to be nearest me, though Pax would likely want to light my fires and tuck me in bed at night if I let him, while Severo would tell me to pick my own ass. I see his father in him every time I look at him now. He seems weaker now that I know his family. There's no reason that should be the case. I guess I just supposed he really did spring from the loins of a she-wolf. Eventually the snows cease, and spring comes fast and hard, which confirms my suspicions. The proctors are playing games. The howlers make sure all eyes are to the sky in case proctors decide to harass us as we make our way. None do. Tactus keeps an eye out for their tracks, but it is quiet. 
We see no enemy scouts, hear no war trumpets in the distance, see no smoke rising except to the north, in Mars's highlands. We raid provision stores in burnt and broken castles as we push toward Jupiter. There are jugs from Bacchus's castle that Severo was disappointed to discover full of grape juice instead of wine, salted beef from Juno's deep cellars, molding cheeses, fish wrapped in leaves, and bags of the ever-present smoked horse meat. They keep us full as we march. In four rugged days, I have reached and besieged Jupiter's triple-walled castle in the low mountain passes. Snow melts swiftly enough to make the ground soggy for our horses. Streams flow through our camp. I do not bother devising a plan of action. I simply tell Pax's, Milius, and Nihilus divisions that whoever gives me the fortress will win a prize. The defenders are very few, and my army takes the outer fortifications in a day by making a series of wooden ramps under intermittent arrow barrages. My other three divisions scout the surrounding territory en force in case the jackal decides to stick his nose into this. Jupiter's main army, it seems, is stranded across the now thawed Argos, laying siege to Mars's castle. They did not expect the river to thaw so quickly. Still, there's no sign of the jackal's men or of the proctors. I wonder if they found Fitchner locked in one of the Apollo castle cells yet. I left him food and water and a face full of bruises. On the third day of the siege, a white flag is flown from Jupiter's ramparts. A thin boy of middling height and timid smiles slips out of Jupiter's castle's postern gate. The castle lies on high, rocky ground. It is sandwiched between two huge rock faces, so its three-tiered walls bow outward. Soon I would have tried sending men down the rock faces, it would have been a job for the howlers, but they've had enough glory. This siege belongs to the soldiers captured when we fought Apollo. The boy walks tentatively in front of the main gate. I meet him there with Severo, Milia, Nyla and Pax. We are a fearsome lot, even without Tactus and Mustang, though Mustang could never really be called fearsome in appearance, maybe spirited at best. Milia looks like something out of a nightmare. She's taken to wearing trophies like Tactus and Thistle. And Pax has cut notches along his huge axe for each slave he has taken. In front of my lieutenants, the boy shows his nervousness. His smiles are quick, almost as if he's worried we might disapprove of them. The ring on his finger is that of Jupiter. He looks hungry because it barely fits in him any longer. Name is Lucian, the boy says, trying to sound manly. He seems to think Pax is in charge. Pax booms a laugh and points to me and my sling blade. Lucian flinches when he looks at me. I think he well knew I was the leader. So we here to swap smiles, I ask. What's your word? The word is hunger. He laughs piteously. We've not eaten anything but rats and raw grain and water for three weeks. I almost pity the boy. His hair is dirty, eyes teary. He knows he's giving up a chance at an apprenticeship. They'll shame him for surrendering for the rest of his life. But he's hungry. So are the seven other defenders. Oddly, all are of Jupiter, not slaves. Their primus left their weak instead of the slaves behind. The only condition they have in surrendering the castle is that they must not be enslaved. Only Pax grumbles something honourable about them needing to earn their freedom like all the rest of us, but I agree to the boy's request. I tell Milia to watch them. If they act seditious, she'll make trophies of their scalps. We tether our horses in the courtyard. The stone is cobbled and dirty. A tall, angular keep stretches up and into the cliff's wall. Darkness seeps through the clouds. A storm is coming to the mountain pass, so I bring my force into the castle and bar the gates. Mustang and her troop stay beyond the walls, 
and will return later in the evening from scouting with Tactus. We speak over the comm units, and Tactus curses us for having a dry roof over our heads. The night's rain is heavy. I make sure our veterans get the first beds in Jupiter's dormitories before we eat. My army may be disciplined, but they'll shiv their own mothers for a warm bed. It's the one thing most of them never got used to, sleeping on the ground. They miss their mattresses and silk sheets. I miss the small cot I used to share with Eo. She's been dead now, longer than we were married. I'm surprised how much it hurts to realise that. I think I'm eighteen now, earth metric. Not rightly sure. Our bread and meats are like heaven to the starved defenders of Jupiter. Lucian and his lot, all skinny, tired-looking souls, eat so fast that Nyla is fussing about them ripping their guts. She runs around telling each of them that the smoked horse meat isn't galloping off anywhere. Pax and his bloodbacks occasionally throw bones at the meek lot. Pax's laugh is infectious. It booms out of him and then turns into something feminine as it continues past two seconds. No one can keep a straight face when he gets rolling. He's talking about Helga again. I look for Mustang so we can laugh about it, but she'll be away for hours more. I miss her, even then. And I swell a little inside my chest because I know she will curl into my bed this night, and together we'll snore like Uncle Narol after Yuletide. I call Milia to the head of the table. My army lounges around Jupiter's war room. They are easy in conquest. Jupiter's map is destroyed. I cannot make out what they know. What do you think of our host? I ask Milia. I say put them under the sigil. I cluck my tongue. You really don't like to keep promises, do you? She looks very much like a hawk, face all angles and cruelty. Her voice is of a similar breed. Promises are just chains, she rasps, both meant for breaking. I tell her to leave the Jupiterians alone, and then loudly command her to fetch the wine we scavenged on our trek to Jupiter. She takes some boys and brings up the barrels from Bacchus's store. I stand foolishly on the table. And I order you to get drunk, I roar to my army. They look at me like I'm mad. Get drunk, one says. Yes, I cut him off before he can say more. Can you manage that? Act like fools for once. We'll try, Milia cries, won't we? She's answered in cheers. Sometime later, as we drink Bacchus's stores, I loudly offer some to the Jupiterians. Pax stumbles up in protest at the idea of sharing good wine. He's a good actor. Are you contradicting me? I demand. Pax hesitates but manages to nod his giant head. I draw my sling blade from its back scabbard. It rasps in the humid war room air. A hundred eyes go to us. Thunder rolls outside. Pax wobbles forward with a giant inebriated step. His own hand is on his axe's hilt, but he does not draw it. After a moment, he shakes his head and goes to a knee. He's still almost my own height. I sheathe my sword and pull him up. I tell him he's to run patrols. Patrols? But in the storm and rain? You heard me, Pax. With a grumble, the bloodbacks wobble after him to go about their punishment. They're all smart enough to have figured out their parts, even if they don't know the play. Discipline, I brag to Lucian. Discipline is the best of mankind's traits, even in big brutes like that. But he's right. No wine for you tonight. That you must earn. In Pax's absence, I make a show of giving ceremonial wolf cloaks to the slaves of Venus and Bacchus who earned their freedom in taking this fortress. Ceremonial because we don't have any time to find wolves. There is laughter and lightness. Merriment for once, 
though no one discards their weapons. Nyla is coaxed into singing a song. Her voice is like an angel's. She sings at the Mars Opera House and was scheduled to perform in Vienna until a better opportunity came along in the form of the Institute. The opportunity of a lifetime. What a lark. Lucian sits in the corner of the war room with the other seven defenders, watching our soldiers make a show of falling asleep at top tables, in front of the fire, along the walls. Some slink away to steel beds. The sound of snores tickles my ears. Severo stays close to me, as though the proctors could rush in and kill me at any moment. I tell Severo to get drunk and leave me be. He obeys and is soon laughing, then snoring atop the long table. I stumble over my sleeping army to Lucian, a smile across my face. I have not been drunk since before my wife died. Despite Lucian's meekness, I find him curious. His eyes rarely meet mine, and his shoulders slump. But his hands never go to his trouser pockets, never fold to guard himself. I ask him about the war with Mars. As I thought, it's almost won. He says something about a girl betraying Mars. Sounds like Antonia to me. I must move quickly. I don't know what will happen if my house's standard and castle are taken, even though I have my independent army. I could technically lose. Lucian's friends are tired, so I give them leave to go try to find beds. They won't be a problem. Lucian stays to talk. I invite him over to the war room table. As Lucian's friends file out, I hear Mustang in the hall. She waltzes into the room. Thunder rolls outside. Her hair is damp and matted, wolf cloak soaked, boots tracking mud. Her face is a model of confusion when she sees me with Lucian. Mustang, darling, I cry. I fear you're too late. Went straight through Bacchus's stores already. I gesture to my snoring army and wink. Maybe fifty remain, sprawled out in various states of sleep across the large war room. All drunk as ne'er all on Yuletide. Getting shit-faced seems a prime idea at a time like this, she says strangely. She looks back to Lucian, then to me. She doesn't like something. I introduce her to Lucian. He mumbles how nice it is to meet her. She snorts a laugh. How did he convince you not to make him a slave, Dara? I don't know if she understands what game I'm playing. He gave me his fortress. I wave my clumsy hand to the half-destroyed stone map on the wall. Mustang says she will join us. She begins to call some of her men in from the hall, but I cut her off. No, no, me and Lucian here were becoming prime friends. No, girls, take your men and go find Pax. But go find Pax, I command. I know she's confused, but she trusts me. She murmurs goodbye to me and Lucian and closes the door. The sound of her boot heels slowly fades. Thought she'd never leave, I laugh to Lucian. He leans back in his chair. He really is very slim, nothing excess to him at all. His blonde hair is clipped plainly, his hands thin and useful. He reminds me of someone. Most people don't want pretty girls to leave, Lucian says, smiling sincerely. He even blushes a little when I ask if he really thinks Mustang is pretty. We talk for nearly an hour. Gradually, he lets himself relax. He lets his confidence grow, and soon he is telling me of his childhood, of a demanding father, of family expectations. But he's not pitiful when he does this. He's realistic, a trait I admire. It's no longer necessary for him to avoid my eyes when we talk. 
His shoulders don't hunch quite so much, and he becomes pleasant, even funny. I laughed loudly half a dozen times. The night grows late, but we still talk and joke. He laughs at the boots I wear, which are swaddled in animal furs for warmth. They are hot now that the snow melts, but I need to wear the pelts. But what of you, Darrow? We gab and gab over me. I think it's your turn. So tell me, what is it that's taken you here? What pushes you? I don't think I've heard of your family. Not people you would care to hear about, to tell it true. But I think it comes down to a girl, that's all. I'm simple. So are my reasons. The pretty one, Lucian blushes. Mustang? She hardly seems simple. I shrug. I told you everything, Lucian protests. Don't be a vague purple on me. Cut to it, man. He raps the table impatiently. Fine, fine. The whole story, I sigh. See that pack beside you? There's a bag inside it. Reach and grab it for me, will you? Lucian pulls the bag out and tosses it to me. It clinks on the table. Let me see your hand. My hand? He asks with a laugh. Right, just put it out, please. I pat the table. He doesn't react. Come on, man. There's this theory I've been working on. I pat the table impatiently. He puts his hand out. How does this tell your story or theory? His smile is still on. It's a complicated one. Better to show you. Fair enough. I open the bag and dump out its contents. A score of golden sigils roll across the table. Lucian watches them roll. These all come from the dead kids. The kids the medbots couldn't save. Let's see. I shuffle through the pile of rings. We have Jupiter, Venus, Neptune, Barkas, Juno, Mercury, Diana, Ceres. We might have a Minerva right here. I frown and rummage around. Hmm. Odd. I can't find a Pluto. I look up at him. His eyes are different. Dead. Quiet. Oh, there's one. Chapter 41 The Jackal He jerks back his hand. He is fast. I am faster. I bury my dagger through his hand, pinning it to the table. His mouth gasps open at the pain. Some weird sort of feral exhalation hisses from his mouth as he jerks at the dagger. But I am bigger than him, and I drove the dagger four inches into the table. I hammer it down with a flagon. He can't pull it out. I lean back and watch him try. There's something primal to his initial frenzied panic. Then something decidedly human in his recovery, which seems more brutally cold than my act of violence. He calms himself faster than anyone I've ever seen. It takes a breath, maybe three, and he leans back in his chair, as though we were at drinks. Well... Shit, he says tightly. I thought we should become better acquainted, I say. I point to myself. Jackal, I am Reaper. You've the better name, he replies. He takes a breath. Another. How long have you known? That you were the Jackal? A hopeful guess. That you were up to no good. 
before I entered the castle. No one surrenders without a fight. One of your rings didn't fit. And hide your hands next time. Insecure sobs always hide or fiddle with their hands. But really, you had no chance. The proctors knew I was coming here. They thought to make it a trap to ruin me by telling you I was coming. So you would sneak in here, try to catch me with my pants down. Their mistake. Your mistake. He watches me, wincing as he turns to look at my sober-as-day soldiers rising from the ground. Nearly fifty of them. I wanted them to see the ruse. Ah! The jackal sighs as he sees how futile his trap has become. My soldiers? Which ones? The ones that were with you, or the ones you hid in the castle? Maybe in the cellars? Maybe beneath the floor in a tunnel? I don't wager their smiles and giggles right now, man. Pax is a beast, and Mustang will be helping him just in case. So that's why you sent her away. And so she wouldn't accidentally ask why we were pretending to be drunk on grape juice. Pax will have found their hiding place. Thunder still rolls. I hope the jackal sank a large size of his force into this ambush. If he didn't, it'll be a hassle. Because if he has Jupiter's castle, he probably has Jupiter's army, which has Juno and much of Vulcan, and soon Mars's. But I have him here. The jackal is pinned, bleeding, and surrounded by my army. His ambush undone. He has lost, but he is not helpless. He is no longer Lucian. It's almost like his hand isn't impaled. His voice doesn't waver. He's not angry, just pissing your boots scary. He reminds me of me before I go into a rage. Quiet. Unhurried. I wanted my soldiers to see him squirm. He doesn't. So I tell them to leave. Only the ten howlers, old and new, stay. If we're to have a conversation, please take this dagger out of my hand. The jackal says to me. Believe it or not, it hurts. He is not as playful as his words suggest. Despite his resolve, his face is pale and his body has begun to tremble from shock. I smile. Where is the rest of your army? Where is that girl, Lilith? She owes my friend an eye. Let me go, and I will give you her head on a platter if you want. If you lend me an apple, I'll even put that in her mouth so she looks like a pig at feast. Your choice. There. Now that's how you got your name, isn't it? I say with mocking applause. The jackal clicks his tongue regrettably. Lilith liked the sound of it. It stuck. That's why I'll put the apple in her mouth. Wish I could have been something more... regal than jackal, but reputations tend to make themselves. He nods to several, like the little goblin there and his toadstools. What do you mean, toadstools? Thistle asks. That's what we call you. Toadstools for reaper and goblin to squat on. But if you would like a better name beyond this little game, you need simply kill big nasty reaper here. Don't stun him. Kill him. Drive a sword into his spine, and you can become imperators, governors, whatever. Father will be happy to oblige. Very simple stuff. Quid pro quo. Severo pulls out his knives and glares at his howlers. Not so simple. Thistle doesn't move. Worth a try, the jackal sighs. I confess, I am a politico, not a fighter. So, if we're to converse, you must say something, Reaper. 
You look like a statue. I don't speak statue. His charisma is cold, calculating. Did you really eat your own house members? After months in darkness, you eat whatever your mouth finds, even if it's still moving. It isn't very impressive, really. Less human than I would have liked, very much like animals. And anyone would have done it. But dredging up my foul memories is no way to negotiate. We aren't negotiating. Humans are always negotiating. That's what conversation is. Someone has something, knows something. Someone wants something. His smile is pleasant, but his eyes, there is something wrong with him. A different soul seems to have filled his body since the time he was Lucian. I've seen actors, but this is different. It is as though he is reasonable to the point of being inhuman. Reaper, I will have my father give you whatever you like. A fleet, an army of pinks to screw, crows to conquer with, whatever. You'll have prime placement if I win this little year of schooling. If you win, there's still more schooling, still more tests, more hardship. I hear your family is dead and poor. It will be difficult for you to rise on your own. Almost forgot I had a fake family. I will make my own laurels. Reaper, Reaper, Reaper. You think this is the end of the line? He makes a clicking sound of disgust with his tongue. Negative, negative, Goodman. But if you let me go, then hardship. He makes a brushing motion with his free hand. Gone. My father will become your patron. Hello, command. Hello, fame. Hello, power. Just say goodbye to this. He gestures to the knife. And let your future begin. We were enemies as children. Now let us be allies as men. You're the sword. I am the pen. Dancer would want me to accept the offer. It would guarantee my survival, guarantee my meteoric rise. I would be inside the halls of the Arch-Governor's mansion. I would be near the man who killed Eo. Oh... I want to accept. But then I would have to let the proctors beat me. I'd have to let this little whore-fart win and let his father smile and feel pride. I'd have to watch that smug smile spread across his bloody damn face. Slag that. They'll feel pain. The door opens, and Pax ducks into the room. A smile splits his face. Gory fine night, Reaper, he laughs. Caught the little turds in the well, fifty. Seems they had long tunnels down there like rats. Must be how they took the castle. He slams the door and sits on the edge of the table to gnaw on a piece of leftover meat. It was wet work. <laughs> we let them come up and it was dandy fine carnage, I tell you, dandy fine. Helga would have loved it. They're all slaves now. Mustang is making them as we speak. But, oh, she's in an odd mood. He spits out a bone. Ha! <laughs> this is him, then. The jackal. He looks pale as a red's ass. He peers closer. Shit, you nailed him down. I think you've taken bigger shits than him, Pax. Severo adds. Prime have. More colourful ones, too. He's drab as a brown. Guard your tongue. Fool, the jackal tells Pax. It may not always be there. Neither will your prick if you keep sassin. <laughs> Is it as small as you? Pax booms. The jackal does not like being mocked. He stares silently at Pax before flicking his eyes back to me as a serpent might flick its tongue. Did you know the proctors are helping you? 
I ask. That they've tried to kill me. Of course, he says with a shrug. My bounties are above average. And you don't mind cheating, I ask. Cheat or be cheated, no? Familiar. Well, they're not helping you anymore. It's too late for that. Now it's time to help yourself. I stab another knife down into the table. He knows what it's for. I once heard that if a jackal becomes trapped, it will chew off its own leg to free itself. That knife might be easier than using teeth. His laugh is quick and short, like a bark. So, if I cut my hand off, I can leave. Is that really it? There's the door. Pax, hold the knife down so that he doesn't cheat. Even if he ate others, he won't do it. He can sacrifice friends and allies, but not himself. He will fail this test. He is an Oriot. He has no one to fear. He is small. He is weak. He is just like his father. I find his Pluto ring in his boot and put it around his finger so his drafters and father can watch their pride and joy give up. They will know I am better. The proctors may be nudging me, but I still have to earn it, Darrow. We're waiting. He sighs. I told you, I am something different than you. A hand is a peasant's tool. A gold's tool is his mind. Where you have better breeding, you may have realized this sacrifice means so very little to me. Then he starts to cut. Tears stream down his face as the blood first wells. He's sawing, and Pax can't even watch. The jackal is halfway done when he looks up at me with a sane smile that convinces me of his complete insanity. His teeth chatter. He is laughing. At me. At this. At the pain. I've not met anyone like him. Now I know how Mickey felt when he met me. This is a monster in the flesh of a man. The jackal is about to break his own wrist to make the job easier. When Pax curses and gives him an iron blade, it will go through in a single stroke. Thank you, Pax, the jackal says. I don't know what to do. Everything inside me is screaming sense. I should kill him now, put a blade through his throat. This is someone you do not let go. This is someone you do not piss on and then send back into the wild. He is so far beyond Cassius, it makes me want to laugh. Yet I told him he could leave if he cut. And he's cutting. Dear God. You're gory mad, Pax breathes. The jackal mutters something about fools. It's just a hand, he says. My hands are my everything. To him, they are nothing. When he has finished, he sits there with a mostly cauterized stump. His face is like snow, but his belt is fastened into a tourniquet. There's a shared moment between us, where he knows I'm not going to let him leave. Then I see a distortion move through an open window. The proctors came, as I hoped, but I'm distracted, unprepared. And when I see a small sonic detonator clatter onto the table and the jackal grab it with his one hand, I know I've made such a mistake. I gave the proctors time to help him. Everything slows, yet I can only watch. With the same hand that holds the tiny detonator, the jackal lashes upward with Pax's iron blade. He sticks the blade into my big friend's throat. I shout and lunge forward just as the jackal presses the detonator's button. A sonic blast rips out from the device, throwing me across the room. The howlers slam into the walls. Pax flips into the door. 
Cups, food, chairs scatter like rice in the wind. I am on the floor. I shake my head, trying to gain my bearings as the jackal comes toward me. Pax staggers to his feet, blood dripping from his ears, from his throat. The jackal says something to me, holds up the blade. Then Pax launches himself forward, not onto the jackal, but onto me. His weight crushes me, and his body covers mine. I can barely breathe. I do not see what happens, but I feel it through Pax's body. A shudder, a spasm, ten impacts as the jackal stabs at Pax, trying furiously to get at me like some rabid animal digging in the dirt, digging through Pax to kill me while I'm down. Then there is nothing. Blood drips onto my face, warms my body. It is my friend's. I try to move, Pax. I manage to squeeze out from under him. The jackal has fled and Pax is bleeding to death. A banshee wails in my ears. The proctors are gone as well. The howlers stumble to their feet. When I look back to Pax, he is dead. His mouth pulled into a quiet smile. Blood slithers along the stone. My own chest tightens and I fall to a knee, sobbing. He had no last words. He had no goodbye. He threw himself upon me and was savaged. Dead. Loyal Pax. I clutch his huge head. It hurts to see my titan fallen. He was meant for more. Such a soft heart and such a hard form. He will never laugh again. Never stand on the bridge of a destroyer. Never wear the cape of a knight or carry the scepter of an imperator. Dead. It shouldn't have been this way. It is my fault. I should have just ended things quickly. What a future he could have had. Severo stands behind me, face pale. The howlers are up and seething, four weep silent tears. Blood trickles from their ears, the world is soundless. We cannot hear, but a pack of wolves does not need words to know that it is time to hunt. He killed Pax, now we kill him. The jackal's trail of blood leads to one of the keep's short spires. From there, it disappears into the courtyard. Rain has washed it away. We jump in a pack of eleven from the spire to a lower wall, rolling as we hit. Then we're down in the courtyard, and Severo, our tracker, leads the way through a postern gate into the rugged low mountains. The night is hard. Rain and snow sweep sideways. Lightning flashes. Thunder rumbles, and I hear it as though in a dream. I run with the howlers in a staggered line. We roll over dark crags along precipitous drops in search of our quarry. My swaddled boots slow me, but they must be covered. My plan can still work, even after all this. I do not know how several guides us. I'm lost in the chaos. My mind is on Pax. He shouldn't have died. I cornered a jackal and let him chew his way out. I remember how Mustang looked at him. She knew who he was. She knew, and she wanted to talk to me in private. Whatever their connection, her loyalty was mine. But how does she know him? Severo takes us into the high mountain passes where snow still stacks knee high. Tracks here. Snow flurries around us. I'm chilled. My cloak is soaked. The sling blade bounces on my back. My shoes squish, and blood dots the snow. We sprint uphill through a snowy pass between two rugged peaks. I see the jackal. He's stumbling one hundred metres distant. He goes down in the snow, then he's up again. He's ironed to have made it this far. We will catch him, and we will kill him for what he did to Pax. He didn't have to stab my titan. My pack begins to howl sorrowfully. The jackal looks back and stumbles on. He will not escape. We sprint up the snowy incline, 
night and darkness. Wind sweeps sideways. I howl, but it is muffled after the sonic blast, like the sound has been swaddled in cotton. Then something strange distorts the flurries in front of us. A shape. An invisible, intangible shape outlined by the falling snow. A proctor. A stone sinks down into my stomach. This is where they kill me. This is what Fitchner warned me about. Apollo deactivates his cloak. He smiles at me through his helmet and calls something. I cannot hear what he says. Then he waves a pulse fist, and Severo and the Howlers scatter as a tiny sonic boom blows five of our pack back down the hill. My eardrums wail. They may never be the same. Pulse fist again. I dive away. Pain lances my foot, pins me. Then the pain is gone. I'm up and sprinting at Apollo. His fist flickers a distortion of force at me. I dodge three blasts. Spinning, turning like a top, I jump. My sword comes down on his head and stops cold. Pulse shield, when activated, cannot be penetrated by anything but a razor. I knew this, but there has to be some showmanship. Apollo watches me, impervious in his armor. My pack has been blasted back down the hill. I see the jackal struggling on the mountainside. He seems stronger now. A distortion follows him, some other proctor giving him strength. Venus, I think. I scream out the rage that's been building in me since I went under Mickey's knife. Apollo says something I can't hear. I curse him and swing my blade again. He catches it and tosses it into the snow. The invisible layer of pulse shield around his fist strikes my face, never touching, yet sending agony into the nerves. I scream and fall. Then he picks me up by the hair and we rise into the storm. He soars on grav boots till we're three hundred metres up. I dangle from his hand. The snow swirls around us. He speaks again, adjusting some frequency so my damaged ears can hear. I will use small words so that you are sure to understand. We have your little Mustang. If you do not lose in your next encounter with the Arch-Governor's son, so all the drafters can bear witness, then I will ruin her. Mustang. First Pax. Now the girl who sang Eo's song by the fire. The girl who pulled me from the mud. The girl who curled beside me as the smoke swirled in our little cave. Brilliant Mustang, who would follow me out of choice. And this is where I led her. I did not expect this. I did not plan for this. They have her. My stomach sinks. Not again. Not like father. Not like Eo. Not like Leah. Not like Roke. Not like Pax. They will not kill her too. This son of a bitch will not kill anyone. I'm going to rip out your bloody damn heart. He punches me in the belly, still holding me by my hair. His face is strange as he tries to place the word. Bloody damn. We're floating in the air now. High. Very high. I dangle like a hanging man as he hits me again. I moan. But as I do, I remember one thing I learned from Fitchner as I clapped his shoulder in the woods. If Apollo was holding my hair and I do not feel his pulse shield, then it is turned off. And it is turned off over his entire body. He has physical recoil armor everywhere else except one place. You are a stupid little puppet, I realize now, he says idly. A mad, angry little puppet. You won't do as I say, will you? He sighs. I'll find another way. Time to cut your strings. He drops me. And I float there, inches from his outstretched hand. I go nowhere because beneath fur and cloth, I'm wearing the grav boots I stole from Fitchner when I assaulted him in Apollo's war room. And Apollo's shield is down, 
and he's pissed me off. He gawks at me, confused. I flex the knife ring's blade out and punch him in the face, jamming the blade through his visor into his eye socket four times, jerking upward so that he dies. You reap what you sow! I scream at him as he fades. All the rage I felt swells in me, blinding me, and fills me with a pulsing, tangible hatred that sweeps away only as Apollo's boots deactivate, and he tumbles down through the swirling storm. I find my howlers around his body. The snow is red. They stare at me as I descend, my knife ring wet with the blood of a peerless scarred. I had not intended to kill him. But he should not have taken her, and he should not have called me a puppet. They took Mustang, I tell my pack. They look on silently. The jackal no longer matters. So now we take Olympus. The smiles they give one another are as chilling as the snow. Sevro cackles. Chapter 42 War on Heaven There is no time to waste in going back to the fortress. I have the boys and girls I need. I have the hardest of all the armies. The small, the wicked, the loyal and quick. I steal Apollo's recoil armor. The golden plate coils around my limbs like liquid. I give his grav boots to several, but they are ludicrously large on him. I strip off my own boots, his father's, so he can wear them, they jammed my toes something awful. I put on Apollo's boots instead. Whose are these? Severo asks me. Daddy's, I tell him. So, you guessed, Severo laughs. He's locked in Apollo's dungeons. They're stupid pixie, he laughs again. They have an odd relationship. I keep Apollo's razor, his helmet, his pulse fist and his pulse shield, along with his recoil armor. Severo gets the ghost cloak. I tell him to be my shadow, and then I tell my howlers to tie their belts together. Grav boots can lift a man in star shell as he carries an elephant in each arm. They are easily strong enough to lift me and my howlers, who hang from my arms and legs on belt harnesses as I carry us through the swirling snowstorm up and up to Olympus. Severo carries the others. The proctors have played their games. They pushed and pushed for so long. They knew I was something dangerous, something different. Sooner or later, they had to know I would snap and come to cut them down. Or perhaps they think I'm still a child. The fools. Alexander was a child when he ruined his first nation. We rise through the storm and fly over the slopes of Olympus. It floats nearly a mile above the Argos. There are no doors, no dock. Snow covers the slopes. Clouds mask its glittering peak. I lead the howlers to that bone-pale citadel at the top of the steep incline. It strikes up out of the mountain like a marble sword. Howlers unfasten their belts in pairs, dropping down on the highest balcony. We crouch on the stone terrace. From here we can see the misty lands of Mars, the rocky hills and fields of Minerva, the great woods of Diana, the mountains where my army garrisons Jupiter. I would be down there. The fools should have left well enough alone. They shouldn't have taken Mustang. I wear recoil armor of gold. It is a second skin. My face alone is exposed. I take ash from one of the howlers and streak it across my cheeks and mouth. My eyes burn with anger. Blonde hair is wild to the shoulders, unbound. I pull my sling blade and clench the shortwave pulse fist in my left. A razor hangs from my waist. I don't know how to use it. Dirt under my nails, frostbite on my pinky and middle finger of the left hand. I stink. My cloak stinks like the dead thing it is. It hangs limp behind me, white, stained with a proctor's blood. I pull up the hood. We all do. We look like wolves, and we smell blood. The drafters better enjoy this, or I'm a dead man. We want Jupiter, I tell my howlers. Find me him. Neutralize the others if we come across any. 
Thistle, you take my grav boots and fetch reinforcements. Go. Barefoot, I blow open the doors with my pulse fist. We find Venus lying in bed in a silk shift, her armor dripping snow from its stand by the fire. She's only just returned from helping the jackal. Grapes, cheesecake, and wine are on a nightstand. The howlers pin her down, four just for effect. We tie Venus to the bedposts. Her golden eyes are wide with shock. She can hardly speak. You cannot! I am scarred! I am scarred! Is all she can manage. She says this is illegal, says she is a proctor, says we're not allowed to assault them. How did we get here? How? Who helped us? Whose armor am I wearing? Oh, it's Apollo's. It's Apollo's. Where is Apollo? A man's gentle clothing is in the corner. They are lovers. Who helped you? I helped myself, I tell her, and pat her shining hand with a dagger. How many other proctors are left? She has no words. This is not supposed to happen. It has never happened. Children do not take Olympus. Not in history and all the planets was this even thought of. We gag her anyway and leave her tied, half naked, window open so she gets a taste of the chill. The howlers and I slink through the spire. I hear Thistle bringing reinforcements. Tactus will be here to bring his own breed of wrath. And Milia will come. Nyla soon. My army rises for Mustang. For me. For the proctors who cheated us and poisoned our food and water and cut free our horses. We go room to room, searching frigidariums, caldariums, steam rooms, ice rooms, baths, pleasure chambers filled with pinks, hollow immersion tanks for the proctors. We take down Juno in the baths. Howlers splash in to wrestle her out. She has no weapons, but cloaked Severo has to stun her with a stolen scorcher after she breaks Clown's arm and starts drowning him with her legs. Apparently she did not leave like she ought to have either. All these rule breakers. Vulcan we find in a hollow immersion room, a fire crackling in the corner. He doesn't even see us come in till we turn off the machines. Vulcan was watching Cassius stand at the edge of a battlement as flaming missiles etch a smoky sky. They gave them fragging catapults. There was another screen showing the jackal stumble through the snow into a mountain cavern's mouth. Lilith greets him there with a thermal cloak and a medbot. I ask the proctors where Mustang has been taken. They say to ask Apollo or Jupiter. It isn't their concern. And it shouldn't be mine. Apparently my head is going to roll. I ask them what they will swing. I have all the axes. My army binds the proctors, and we take them with us as we descend, flowing down to the next level and the level after that, like a flood of mad half-wolves. We run across high reds and brown servants and house pinks. I pay them no mind, but my army in their rabid excitement sets upon any they see. They knock down reds and absolutely obliterate any greys that make the mistake of trying to fight us. Severo has to choke out a Ceres boy who sits on a red's chest, bludgeoning in his face with scarred fists. Two greys are killed by Tactus when they try to fire on him. He dodges their scorches and breaks their necks. A squad of seven greys tries to take me down, but my pulse shield protects me from their scorches. Only if they concentrate fire and the shield overheats will I suffer. I dodge their fire and bring them down with my sling blade. My army trickles in, slowly at first, but more are coming every four minutes. I'm nervous. It isn't fast enough. Jupiter could destroy us, as could Pluto and whoever else is left. My army is exultant because they have me. They think me immortal, unstoppable. Already they've heard that I killed Apollo. I hear nicknames rippling like currents through the army as we swarm through the gilded vast halls. God Slayer, Sun Killer, they fancy me. But the proctors hear these things too. The ones we've captured, even the ones a little bemused by the idea of students invading Olympus, now stare at me with pale faces. They realize they're part of the game they thought they escaped many years ago, and that there are no med bots directed toward Olympus. Funny thing, watching gods realize they've been mortal all along.
I send out dozens of scouts through the palace, telling them what I need. Already I can hear my plan being unwound in the halls beneath me. Jupiter, Pluto, Mercury and Minerva remain. They are coming for me. Or am I coming for them? I do not know. I try to feel like the predator, but I cannot. My rage is calming. It is slowing and giving way to fear as the halls stretch on. They have Mustang. I remind myself of the smell of her hair. These are the scarred who take bribes from the man who killed my wife. The blood pumps faster. My rage returns. I meet Mercury in a hall. He is laughing hysterically and calling out bawdy drinking songs from the HC as he faces down a half dozen of my soldiers. He wears a bathrobe, but is dancing like a maniac around the sword thrusts of three dead horses. I've not seen such grace beyond the mines. He moves as I mind, fury balanced with physics, a kick, a crushing elbow, an application of force to dislocate kneecaps. He slaps one of my soldiers in the face with his hand, kicks another in the groin, and does a flip over one, grabs her hair while he is upside down, lands and slams her into the wall like a rag doll. Then he knees a boy on the face, cuts off a girl's thumb so she can't hold her sword, and tries backhanding me before dancing away. I'm faster than him, and stronger, despite his incredible gift with the razor. So as his hand goes at my face, I punch his forearm as hard as I can, cracking the bone. He yelps and tries to dance back, but I hold onto his hand and beat his arm with my fist till it breaks. Then I let him spin away, wounded. We're in a hall, my soldiers sprawled around him. I shout the rest back and heft my sling blade. Mercury is a cherub of a man, small, squat, with a face like a baby. His cheeks flush rosy. He's been drinking. His coiled golden hair droops over his eyes. He flips it back. I remember how he had wanted to pick me for his house, but his drafters had objected. Now he flourishes his razor like a poet with a quill, but his offhand is useless after I've punched it. You're a wild one, he says through the pain. You should have picked me for your house. I told them not to push you, but did they listen? No, 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 no. Silly Apollo. Pride can blind. So can swords. Through the eye. Mercury looks at my armor. Dead, then. Someone shouts for me to kill him. My, my, they are hungry. This duel may be fun. I bow. Mercury curtsies. I like this proctor, but I also don't want him to kill me with that razor. So I sheathe my sword and shoot him in the chest with my pulse fist set to stun. Then we tie him up, He's still laughing. But farther down the hall behind him, I see Jupiter, a god of a man in full armor, storming forth with a crooked pulse shaft and a razor. Another armored proctor is with him, Minerva, I think. We retreat. Still, they decimate my force. They come at us straight on in the long hall, knocking boys and girls down like boulders rolling through grain. We can't hurt them. My soldiers scamper back the way we came, back up the stairways, back to the higher levels, where we run over new packs of reinforcements. We scramble over each other, falling on the marble floor, running through golden suites to flee Jupiter and Minerva as they come up the stairs. Jupiter bellows laughter as our simple swords and spears ping off his armor. Only my weapons can hurt him. They aren't enough. Jupiter's razor goes through my pulse shield and slips my recoil armor on the thigh. I hiss with pain and shoot the pulse fist at him. His shield takes the pulse and holds, but barely. He flicks a razor at me like a whip. It grazes my eyelid, nearly taking my eye. Blood sheets from the small wound, and I roar in anger. I fly at him, past Minerva, breaking my pulse fist against his jaw. It ruins my weapon and my fist, but it dents his golden helmet and sends him reeling. I don't give him time to recover. I scream and hack in swirling arcs with my sling blade, even as I stab clumsily with my razor. It's a mad dance, 
I take him through the knee with the unfamiliar razor. He cuts open my thigh with his own. The armor closes around the wound, compressing it and administering painkillers. We're at the end of a circular stairwell as I push him back. His long blade goes limp, then slithers around my leg like a lasso, about to constrict and slice my leg off at the hip. I push fast as I can into him. We go down the stairs. Then he rolls up and stands. I tackle him backward, armor on armor. We smash into a hollow immersion room. Sparks fly. I keep screaming and pushing so he cannot rip off my leg with the razor, still limp and looped around flesh and bone. He's backpedaling, off balance when I take him through a window, and we spill out into the open air. Neither of us have grav boots, so we plummet a hundred feet into a snowbank on the mountain's side. We roll down the steep slope towards the one-mile drop, toward the flowing Argos. I catch myself in the snow. I manage to stand. I can't see him. I think I hear his grunt in the distance. We're both muddled in the clouds. I crouch and listen, but my hearing still hasn't recovered from Apollo. You'll die for this little boy, Jupiter says. It comes as if from underwater. Where is he? Should have learned your place. Everything has an order. You're near the top, but you are not the top, little boy. I say something pithy about merit not meaning much. You can't spend merit. So the governor is paying you to do this. I hear a howl in the distance. My shadow. What do you think you're going to do, little boy? Going to kill all us proctors? Going to make us let you win? It's not the way things work, little boy. Jupiter looks for me. Soon the governor's crows will come in their ships, with their swords and guns. The real soldiers, little boy. The ones who have scars you can't dream of. The obsidians, led by golden legates and knights. You're just playing, but they'll think you've gone mad, and they will take you, and hurt you, and kill you. Not if I win before they get here. That is the key to everything. There may be a delay on the hollows before the drafters see them, but how long a delay? Who is editing the gory damn hollows while you fight? We'll make sure the right message gets out. I take my red sweatband off my head and dab away the sweat on my face, then wrap it around my head once more. Jupiter is silent. So, the drafters will see this conversation. They will see that the governor is paying you to cheat. They will see that I am the first student to invade Olympus in history. And they will see me cut you down and take your armor and parade you naked through the snow if you surrender. If not, I will throw your corpse from Olympus and piss golden showers down after you. The clouds clear, and Jupiter stands before me in the white. Red drips from his golden armor. He is tall, lean, violent. This place is his home. It is his playground. The children his playthings till they get their scars. He is like any other petty tyrant of history, a slave to his own whims, a master of nothing but selfishness. He is the society, a monster dripping in decadence, yet seeing none of his own hypocrisy. He views all this wealth, all this power, as his right. He is deluded. They all are. But I cannot cut him down from the front. No, no matter how well I fight, he is too strong. His razor hangs from his hand like a snake. With the press of a button, it'll go rigid, a meter in length. His armor shines. Morning breaks as we face one another. A smile splits his lips. You would have been something in my house. But you are a little stupid boy, angry and of house Mars. You cannot yet kill like I can, yet you challenge me.
Pure rage. Pure stupidity. No, I can't challenge you. I toss my sling blade down at his feet and throw my razor with it. I can barely use the razor anyway. So I'll cheat, I nod. Go ahead, Severo. The razor slithers up from the ground, stiffens and goes through Jupiter's hamstrings as he wheels about. His slash goes two feet too high. He's used to fighting men. Invisible, Severo wounds Jupiter's arms and takes the man's weapons. The recoil armor flows into the wounds to stop their bleeding, but the tendons will need real work. When Jupiter is silent, Severo winks off Apollo's ghost cloak. We take Jupiter's weapons. His armor wouldn't have fit anyone except Pax. Poor Pax. He would have looked dashing in all this finery. We drag Jupiter back up the slope. Inside, the tide of the battle has shifted. My scouts, it seems, have found what I told them to seek. Melia runs up to me, a content grin on her long face. Her voice, as ever, is a low drawl when she tells me the good news. We found their armory. A host of Venus house members, only just freed from slavery, thunders past. Their pulse fists and recoil armor shimmer. Olympus is ours, and Mustang has been found. Now we have all the axes. Chapter 43 The Last Test I find her asleep in a suite beside Jupiter's own. Her golden hair is wild, her cloak dirtier than my own. It hangs brown and grey, not white. She smells like smoke and hunger. She's destroyed the room, upturned a dish of food, buried her dagger into the door. The brown and pink servants are scared of her, and me. I watch them skitter away my distant cousins. I see them move, alien things, like ants, so void of emotion. I feel a pang. Perspective is a wicked creature. This is how Augustus saw Io as he killed her. An ant. No, he called her a red bitch. She was like a dog in his eyes. The food was laced with something, I ask one of the pinks. The beautiful boy murmurs something, looking at the ground. Speak like a man, I bark. Sedatives, Lord. He does not look at me. I don't blame him. I'm a gold, a foot taller, worlds stronger. And I look positively insane. How wicked he must think me. I tell him to go away. Hide. My army does not always listen when I tell them not to toy with low colours. The bed is grand. Sheets of silk, mattress of feathers. Posts of ivory, ebony and gold. Mustang sleeps on the floor in the corner. For so long we have had to hide where we sleep. It must have felt so wrong, lying in perfect comfort, even with sedatives in her. She tried breaking the windows, too. I'm glad she didn't. That's a far drop. I sit beside her. The breath from her nose stirs a single coil of hair. How many times I've watched her sleep with a fever. How many times she's done the same. But there's no fever now. No cold. No pain in my stomach. Cassius's wound has healed. Winter is ended. Outside I saw the first of the flowers blossoming. I picked one on the mountainside. It's in the hidden compartment of my cloak. I want to give it to Mustang. I want to wake her with the Hemanthus by her lips. But when I take it out, a dagger slips into my heart. Worse than any metal blade. Eo. The pain will never go away. I don't know if it's supposed to. I don't know if this guilt I feel is owed. I kissed the Hemanthus and took it away. 
Not yet. Not yet. I wake Mustang gently. Her smile spreads before she even opens her eyes, as though she knows I am beside her. I say her name and brush the hair from her face. Her eyes flutter open. Golden flakes spiral there in the irises. So strange, next to my calloused, dirty fingers with their cracked nails. She nuzzles my hand and manages to sit up. A yawn. She looks around. I almost laugh as I see her digest what has happened. Well, I was going to tell you about a dream I had about dragons. They were purple and pretty and liked to sing songs. She flicks my armor with a finger. It rings. Way to upstage me, jerk. What happened? I got mad. She groans. I've become the maiden in distress, haven't I? Slag. I hate those girls. I tell her the news. The jackal is split. His forces besiege Mars as he and Lilith hide in the deep mountains. We'll be able to find him easily. If you want, you can take our army and root the bastard out. Done, she smirks and raises an eyebrow. But can you trust me? Maybe I'll want to be big primus of this weird army. I can trust you. How do you know? She says again. This is when I kiss her. I cannot give her the Hemanthus. That is my heart, and it is of Mars, one of the only things born from the red soil. And it is still Eos. But this girl, when they took her, I would have done anything to see her smirking again. Perhaps one day I'll have two hearts to give. She tastes how she smells, smoke and hunger. We do not pull apart. My fingers wend through her hair. Hers trace along my jaw, my neck, and scrape along the back of my scalp. There is a bed. There is time. And there's a hunger different from when I first kissed Io. But I remember when the Gamma Helldiver, Dago, took a deep pull from his burner, turning it bright but dead in a few quick moments. He said, This is you. I know I am impetuous, rash. I process that. And I am full of many things. Passion, regret, guilt, sorrow, longing, rage. At times they rule me but not now, not here. I wound up hanging on a scaffold because of my passion and sorrow. I ended up in the mud because of my guilt. I would have killed Augustus at first sight because of my rage, but now I am here. I know nothing of the Institute's history, but I know I have taken what no one else has taken. I took it with anger and cunning, with passion and rage. I won't take Mustang the same way. Love and war are two different battlefields. So, despite the hunger, I pull away from Mustang. Without a word, she knows my mind, and that's how I know it's in the right. She darts one more kiss into me. It lingers longer than it should, and then we stand together and leave. We hold hands till the door. Then I turn to her. Fetch me the jackal's standard, Mustang. Yes, Lord Reaper. She gives a mock bow and a little wink. Then she is gone. The place is a madhouse of looting. In all the chaos, Severo has found the hollow transmitter. It has our sensorial experiences stored in its hard drives and is queued to send them back to the drafters wherever they may be. It is not a streaming feed, so the drafters do not yet have today's events. There is a half-day delay. That is all it will take. I give Severo instructions and have him get to work splicing out the story I want told. I would trust no one else. I have Fitchner brought up from Castle Apollo's dungeons. He reclines in a chair in Olympus's dining hall. His face is purple from when I hit him. 
The floor is made of condensed air, so we are suspended above a mild vertical drop. His feet are on the table, and his mouth twists into a smile. There's the manic boy, he calls, fingering his chin. I knew I liked your odds. I give him a greeting with my middle finger. Liar. He returns the finger. Turd. He reaches for my hand. Don't tell me you're still bitter about the poisoning, the sicknesses, the setup with Cassius, the bears in the woods, the shitty tech, the terrible weather, the assassination attempts, the spy. The spy? Messing with you. Ha, still a child. Speaking of which, where are your soldiers? Running around eating themselves stupid, showering, sleeping, screwing, playing with the pinks. This place is a honey trap, my boy. A honey trap that will make your army worthless. You're in a better mood. My son is safe, he says with a wink. Now, what are you up to? I already sent Mustang to deal with the jackal, and after this, I go to House Mars. Then it will all be over. Ooh, except it won't be. Fitzner pops a familiar gum bubble and winces. I did a number on his jaw. It makes me laugh. I felt like laughing since Severo took down Jupiter. My leg throbs with pain from that blasted man. Even with the painkillers, I can hardly walk. No riddles. Why isn't it over? Three things, Fitchner says. His hatchet face examines me for a moment. You're a peculiar creature. You and the jackal both. Everyone always wants to win, but you two stand apart. Freaks. Goals won't die to win. We value our lives too much. You two don't. Where did it come from? I remind him he's my prisoner, and he should answer my questions. Three things are not finished. Here's what's what. I'll tell you what they are if you answer my question. What drives you? He sighs. The first thing good man, is Cassius. He will simply have to duel you until one of you little sods keels over and dies. I was afraid of that. I answer Fitchner's question. I tell him the jackal wanted to know the same thing, what drives me. The write-off answer is rage. From point to point, it is rage. If something happens, and if I was not anticipating it, I react like an animal, with violence. But the deep spine answer is love. Love drives me. So I must lie a bit to him. My mother had a dream that I could be greater than anyone in my family. Greater than the name Andromedus. The name of my father. Fake father. Fake family. Point still the same. I am not a Bologna. Not an Augustus. Not an Octavia Aulun. I smile wickedly, something he can appreciate. But I want to be able to stand above them and piss on all their gory damn heads. Fitchner likes that. He's always wanted the same, but he's found that without the pedigree, merit takes you only so far. That frustration is his condition. The second thing that is not finished is this. Fitchner waves his hands about. I got the crust of this deal. He's making no revelations. I killed a proctor. I have evidence that the arch-governor bribed others and threatened more so that his child could win. Nepotism. Manipulation of the sacred school. This is not idle news. It will shatter something, perhaps even remove the arch-governor from office. Charges. Punishment. The drafters will want blood and the arch-governor will want yours. This will embarrass him, and potentially make room for a Bologna arch-governor. Maybe Cassius's father. Fitchner asks me why I trust the soldiers in my army who were slaves. They trust me because they've seen how they would have done in all this had I not come along. You think they want the jackal as their master? Good, Fitchner says. You trust them all. Splendid! then there is no third complication. My mistake. 
I press him for what he means. So he sighs and relents. Oh, only that you sent Mustang and half the army to deal with the jackal. And? It's really nothing. You trust her. No, tell me, what do you mean? Well, fine. If you must know, if there's simply no other way of going about it, she is the jackal's twin sister. Virginia Owl Augustus, sister to the jackal. Twin, an heir of the great family, the gens Augusta, the only daughter of Arch-Governor Nero Au Augustus, the man who made all this happen, kept cloistered and out of the public eye to ward off assassination attempts, just like her brother. That's why Cassius didn't know the daughter of his family's arch-rival. But when I sat with the jackal, Mustang knew who he was. Her brother. Had she known before of the jackal's identity? Nothing can explain her silence if she knew who he was and said nothing. Nothing except for family. Which is a loyalty above friendship. Above love. Above a kiss in the corner of a room. I have sent half my army to the jackal. I have given him recoil armour, grav boots, ghost cloaks, razors, pulse weapons, enough tech for him to take Olympus. Damn it! The proctors all know. And when I pass them at a run, they are laughing. They laugh at my stupidity. The rage grows inside of me. I want to kill something. I marshal my forces. They are spread throughout the castle, eating its food, taking its pleasures. Fools! Fools! My best are where I need them. Severo left to his work. That is the most important thing. I order Tactus to hunt down the remnants of Venus and Mercury in the southern lowlands and enslave them. I set Milia out to marshal the rest of my army with Nyla. I need to go to House Mars now. I cannot wait for my soldiers to assemble. I need fresh bodies because when the Augustus twins come, they will have weapons and technology to match mine, and they may have more soldiers. The game has changed. I did not prepare for this. I feel a fool. How could I have kissed her? My heart is swallowed by darkness. What if I had given her the Hemanthus? I tear it to ribbons as I jump from the edge of Mount Olympus in my grav boots and let the petals fall. I take only the howlers with me, passing the petals as we soar down. We wear grav boots and armour and carry pulse fists and pulse blades. The snow in the land of House Mars is gone. Muddy soil churned by the feet of invaders replaces it. The highlands are swaddled in mist. The smell is of earth and siege. Our towers, Phobos and Deimos, are rubble. The catapults gifted to the besiegers have done their work there. So too have they made progress on the walls of my old castle. The front façade is in ruin and strewn with arrows, broken pottery from pitch jars, swords, armour, and some students. Nearly a hundred strong besiege Mars. Their camp is near the tree line, but an enclosing fence has been built around Mars Castle to prevent any sallies from the fortress. It has been a long winter for both sides, though I note the solar cooking pots, the portable heaters, the nutrition packets of the jackal's besieging force comprised of Jupiter, Apollo, and a quarter of House Pluto. Several crosses stand high at the bottom of the slope. They face the castle. On the crosses are three bodies. Crows tell me their state. The only sign of resistance I see from House Mars is our flag, the Wolf of Mars, tattered and scorched. It hangs slack in the poor wind. The Howlers and I come from the sky like golden gods. Our ragged cloaks flap behind us, but if the besiegers expected us to be proctors bringing more gifts, they could not have been more mistaken. We land hard on the earth, the Howlers first, and I land at their head, and as I hit, the enemies scatter before me in utter terror. Reaper has come home. I let the Howlers make ruin of the enemies on our soil. 
This is as close as I've been to home, to Lycos, in months. I bend down and take a handful of House Mars's soil as my men do my work around me. Mars. Home. I have flown a different banner, but I have missed my house. Enemies run to attack me. They see my blade, know who I am. I walk impervious. My pulse armor is my shield. Severo and the Howlers act as my sword. I walk to the three crosses and peer up to see Antonia, Cassandra, and Vixus. The betrayers. What did they do now? Antonia is still alive, as is Vixus. Barely. I have Thistle cut them down and take them back to Olympus for the medbots. They will have to live with the knowledge that they slit Leah's throat. I hope it hurts them. I stand for a moment at the bottom of the hill. I call up to tell them who I am. But they already know, because the flag of Mars comes down, and in its place is raised a soiled bedsheet with a hastily drawn sling blade arching across. The Reaper, they cry, as I am their salvation. Primus! The defenders are ragged, dirty, and thin. Some are so weak we have to carry them from the rubble of the castle. Those who can come to salute me, or tip their heads, or kiss my cheeks. Those who cannot touch my hand as I pass. There are broken legs and crushed arms. They will be mended. We ferry them back to Olympus. House Mars will not be useful in the coming battle, so I will use besiegers from Pluto, Jupiter, and Apollo. I have Clown and Pebble enslave them all with the standard of Mars. A thin boy, I hardly recognize, delivers it to me. But when he grabs me in a skeletal embrace, a hug so hard it hurts, I know who he is. A silent sob echoes in my chest. He is quiet as he hugs me. Then his body shudders like Pax's did as he met death. Except these shudders come from joy, not pain. Roke lives. My brother, he sobs. My brother. I thought you were dead, I tell him, as I clutch his delicate frame. Roke, I thought you were dead. I clasp him to me. His hair is so thin. I feel his bones through his clothing. He's like a wet rag around my armor. Brother, he says. I knew you would come back. I knew it in my heart. This place was hollow without you. He grins at me with such pride. How you now fill it. The primus of House Diana was right. House Mars is a wildfire. And it does starve. Roke has scars on his face. He shakes his head, and I know he has stories to tell. Where he was, how he came back. But later, he limps away. Quinn, one-eared and tired, goes with him. She mouths a thank you and puts her hand along the small of the thin poet's back in a manner that lets me know she's left Cassius. He told us you would return, she says. Roke never lies. Pollux is still humorous when I see him. His voice is gravel, and he clasps my arm. Quinn and Roke kept the house together, he says. Cassius gave up a long while ago. He waits for me in the war room. Don't kill him. Please, it ate his mind up, man. Ate it all up, what he did to you. We all found out. So just let him get some time away from this place, man. It does things to your head. Makes you forget we don't have a choice. Pollux kicks a piece of mud. The bastards put me in with a little girl, you know. In the passage. Matched me with a little girl. I tried to kill her softly but she wouldn't die. Pollux grunts something and claps me on the shoulder. He tries a sour chuckle. We've got it raw, but at least we're not reds. You register? Righto. 
He leaves, and I'm alone in my old castle. Titus died on the spot where I stand. I look at the keep. It's worse now than it was in his time. Everything is worse now, somehow. Bloody slag. Why did Mustang have to betray me? Everything is dark now that I know. A shadow cast over life. She could have told me so many times, but she never did. I know she wanted to speak with me when I was with the jackal, but likely just to tell me something idle, some tidbit. Or would she betray her blood for me? No. If she would have done that, then she would have told me before I gave her half my army. She took her standard too, and Ceres's. Why did she need so many, except to make war with me? It feels like she killed Eo. It feels like she put the noose there and I jerked the feet. She is her father's daughter. I feel that little snap go through my hands. I've betrayed Eo. I spit on the stones. My mouth is dry. Haven't had anything to drink all morning. My head aches. Time to drop my balls, as Uncle Nero used to say. Time to see Cassius. He sits with his iron blade out on House Mars's table. He's in the seat I carved with my sigil. The old house flag lies across his knee. The primus hand dangles around his neck. So much time has passed since he put that sword in my belly. The weapon looks silly now. A toy. A relic. I am so far past this room, past his blade, past his reach. Yet his eyes stop my heart. The guilt is like black bile in my throat, fills my chest and drains me. I'm sorry for Julian, I tell him. His hair is golden curls, but matted with grit and grease. Fleas make their home there. He is still beautiful, still more handsome than I ever will be. But I am the greater man. The spark in his eye has cooled. Time and space away from this place are what his soul needs. Months of siege, months of anger and defeat, months of loss and guilt have drained him of all that makes him Cassius. What a poor soul. I feel sorry for him. I almost laugh. After he put a sword in my belly, I pity him. He has never lost a battle. He alone, of all the Primuses, can say that. Yet he takes the badge and flips it to me. You've won. But was it worth it? Cassius asks. Yes. No hesitation. He nods. That's the difference between you and me. He sets the standard and his sword down and walks close to me, so close I can smell the stink of his breath. I think he's going to hug me. I want to hug him, to apologize and beg for his forgiveness. Then he pulls open a scab on his knuckles, sucks the blood from it, and spits in my face, startling me. This is a blood feud. He hisses in high lingo. If ever again we meet, you are mine or I am yours. If ever again we draw breath in the same room, one breath shall cease. Hear me now, you wretched worm. We are devils to one another till one rots in hell. It is a formal, cold declaration that requires one thing of me. I nod and he leaves. I stand trembling for a moment after he's gone. My heart thuds in my chest. So much pain. I had thought it would be over, but not all scars heal, not all sins are forgiven. I take the Mars flag and pin the Primus badge to myself. 
I watch the map on the wall. My sling blade banner flutters over every castle there. My men secured the rest, even as Tactus makes ready Olympus for Mustang's assault. Now those castles belong to me, not to the wolf of House Mars. My sling blade looks like the L of Lambda, my clan, the place where my brother, my sister, my uncle, my mother, my friends still toil. They feel a world apart, yet their symbol, a symbol of our rebellion, a working tool made into a weapon for war, flies over all the houses of the Orient except one. Pluto. I leave the castle through the spire. I am a red hell diver of Lycos. I am gold primus of House Mars. And I am going to my last battle in this bloody damn valley. After that, the real war begins. Chapter 44 Rise Tactus has assumed command in my absence. The man is a cruel beast, but he's my cruel beast. And with him at my side, my forces are fit for bloodshed. Our armor glistens. Three hundred strong. Ninety new slaves. They will not have a chance to earn their freedom. There were not enough grav boots for all, or enough armor, but everyone has something. The dead horses and the howlers group together near the edge of Mount Olympus. They stare down a thin arc of gold at the ground a mile below. Our adversaries are in the mountains. When Mustang and the Jackal come from the snow peaks, they will be at a disadvantage. We have the highest ground. The rest of my force, Pax's former squad and Nyla's, guard the Golden Fortress and the Proctors. The slaves are there as well. I wish Pax were at my side. I always felt safer in his shadow. I've sent Nyla and Milia and a dozen others in ghost cloaks to scout the mountains for the jackal's movements. Who knows what intel Mustang has given her brother. He will know our weaknesses, our disposition, so I shift everything as much as possible. Whatever she knows will be useless. Alter the paradigm. I wonder if I could beat her as mercilessly as I beat Fitchner, the girl who hummed Eo's song. Never. I'm still a red at heart. Hate this gory part, Tactus sighs. He leans his wiry body past me to peer out over the edge of the floating mountain. Waiting. Pha. We need some optics. What? Optics, he says loudly. My hearing goes in and out. Popped eardrums are nasty things. He says something about Mustang and cutting our thumbs off for starters. I don't catch most of it. Probably don't want to. He's the sort to make braids of someone's entrails. There! Then we see a golden flyer pierce a cloud. Three more follow. Nyla. Milia. Mustang. And something else. Hold! I call to Severo and his howlers. They echo the command as Mustang approaches, carrying something odd. Lo, Reaper! Mustang calls to me. I wait for her to land. Her boots bring her quickly to the ground. Lo, Mustang. So, Milia says you figured it out. She looks around with a curious smile. This must all be for me, then. Of course. I'm confused. Thought there might be a scuffle between Augustus and Andromedus. No scuffle this time. I brought you a gift. May I present my brother, Adrius Al Augustus, the Jackal of the Mountains, and his standard. And he's... She looks at me with a hard smile as she realizes I thought she betrayed me. Disarmed. She drops the jackal, bound, gagged, and naked. Bugger my gory balls, Tactus hisses. I have won.
Mustang stands beside me as the dropships come to Olympus. She's told me not to feel guilty about doubting her loyalty. She should have told me her family ties, even though she doesn't claim the jackal as her brother. Not in spirit. Her true brother, her older brother, was killed by one of Cassius's, a brute by the name of Carnus. Augustus and Bellona. The blood feud between the families runs deep, and I feel its riptide pulling at my legs. Yet the question remains, is Mustang her father's daughter, or is she the girl who hums Eo's song? I think I know the answer. She is what goals can be, should be, yet her father and brother are what goals are. Eo never would have guessed it could be this complicated. There is goodness in goals, because in many ways they are the best humanity can offer, but they're also the worst. What does that do to her dream? Only time will tell. My lieutenants flank me. Mustang, Nyla, Milia, Tactus, Severo, even Roke and Quinn. We leave a space for Pax and Leah. My army flanks them. There is no need to embarrass the Pluto students. I want to, but I don't. They stand dispersed throughout my six units. We wait in a broad courtyard across from the landing pads. It is a spring day, and so the snow melts fast. Severo is near me. In his eye I see a subtle difference when he looks at me. The conversation we had when he finished editing the tapes was short and frightening. It echoes in my ears. The... Audio in the storm was scrambled, he said. Couldn't make out the last words you said to Apollo, so I deleted them. One of my last words was bloody damn. What does Severo know? What does he think he knows? The fact that he deleted it means he thinks it is important enough to cover up. Arch Governor Augustus and the Imperators Bologna and Adriatus, and a host of other dignitaries to the sum of two hundred, come from the shuttles, each with a cadre of attendants. The director surveys us and laughs at the proctor's condition. I have left them bound and gagged. There is no pity here. Any worry I had at punishment is swept away. Only Fitchner stands unbound. If there are any rewards given to the proctors, he should reap them. They have seen the hollow experiences by now. Severo made sure they were good. He knew well the story I wanted told. I made only a few adjustments. Director Clintus is a small woman with a severe mountain peak of a face. She manages to crack a joke about this being the first time they've had the ceremony at so lofty a location but she does think it will be the last. It is not the way the game is supposed to be played, yet it does speak to my creativity and cunning. She seems to like me very much, and affectionately refers to me as the Reaper. In fact, they all seem to like me very much, though some, I can tell, are wary. Rulers tend to dislike those who break rules. The drafters of all the houses are clamoring to recruit you, my boy. You'll have a choice, though Mars has first offer. It will be up to you. So many choices for the Reaper, Clintus titters. Bologna and Augustus, blood enemies, both watch me as you would a snake. I killed one of their sons and embarrassed the others. I do believe this may become awkward. There is little ceremony. The attendants bustle about. This is but formality. The true ceremony will take place in Aegea, where there will be a grand festival, a party to set fire to the heavens, and the hollow presence of the sovereign herself. Libations, dancers, racers, fire breathers, pleasure slaves, enhancers, spike dust, politicians, or so Mustang tells me. 
It seems strange to think others care about what happened to us here. Strange to think that so many of the goals are vapid creatures. They know nothing of what it is to earn the mark of a peerless scarred, to beat a boy to death in a cold room of stone. But they will celebrate us. For a moment, I forgot whom we were fighting for. I forgot this is a race that fights like hell to earn its frivolous things, because it loves those things so much. I don't understand that drive. I understand the Institute. I understand war. But I don't understand what is coming in Aegea, or what will come after that. Perhaps that's because I'm more like the Iron Gulls, the best of the peerless. Those like the ancestors. Those who nuked a planet that rose against their rule. What a creature I've become. When all is said and done, Director Clintus pins some badge on me. She winks and touches my shoulder. Then we disperse. Just like that. The game is through, and we are told dropships are inbound for our departure to our own homes, where parents wait to give their approval or disown disappointing sons and daughters. Just like that. Until then, we mill about feeling foolish in all our accumulated armour, all our weaponry that now means so little. I look at my sling blade and wonder how useless it has just become. It's as though we're supposed to congratulate one another, cheer or something. But there's only silence. A hollow silence for victors and losers, all. I am empty. What do I do now? There was always a fear, always a concern, always a reason to hoard weapons and food, always a quest or trial. Now, nothing. Just the wind sweeping in over our battlefield. An empty battlefield filled only with echoes of things lost and learned. Friends. Lessons. Soon it will be a memory. I feel like a lover has died. I yearn to cry, feel hollow, adrift. I look for Mustang. Will she still care for me? And then Arch Governor Augustus suddenly takes me by the elbow and leads me away from the other stunned youth. I am a busy man, Reaper, he says, mocking the word. So I will be direct. You have created complications in my life. His touch makes me want to scream. His thin mouth emotes nothing. His nose is straight, his eyes contemptuous and made from the embers of a dying sun. So peerless. Yet he is not beautiful. His is a face carved from granite. Deep cheeks. Manly, tough skin. Not burnished like that of the fools on the H.C. or the pixies who gallivant around the nightclubs. He reeks of power, like Pink's reek of perfume. I want to make his face look like a broken puzzle. Yes, is all I can say. He does not smirk or smile. My wife is a beggar. She pleaded with me to help her son win. Wait, he had help? I ask. His mouth slides into a soft smile the sort reserved for simple amusements. I'm assuming you are not sharing my involvement with others. I want to break him. After all that has happened, he expects my cooperation as though it is something due to him, as though it is his right that I help him. I unclench my fists. What would Dancer have me say? You're fine, I manage. I can't help you on the domestic front, but I won't tell a soul that the jackal had help from Daddy. His chin rises. Do not call him that name. The men of House Augustus are lions, not flea-bitten carrion-eaters. All the same, you should have put your money on Mustang, I say, intentionally not using her name. 
Don't tell me about my family, Darrow. He peers down his nose at me. Now, the question is how much you want for your silence. I accept no gifts. Oh, no man, so you will be taken care of on one condition. I stay away from your daughter. No! He laughs sharply, surprising me. The foolish families worry over blood. I care nothing for purity of family or ancestry. That is a vain thing. I care only for strength, what a man can do to other men, women. And that is something you have. Power. Strength. He leans closer, and in his pupils I see Eo dying. I have enemies. They are strong. They are many. They are Bologna. And others. But yes, Imperator Tiberius Au Bologna has more than fifty nieces and nephews. He has nine children. That Goliath, Carnus, the eldest. Cassius, his favorite. His seed is strong. Mine is... less so. I had a son worth all of Tiberius's put together, but Carnus killed him. He's silent for a moment. Now, I have two nieces, a nephew, a son, a daughter, and that is it. So I collect apprentices. My condition is this. I will give you what you want for your silence. I will buy you pinks, obsidians, greys, greens. I will sponsor your application to the academy, where you will learn to sail the ships that conquered the planets. I will provide you with funds and patronage requirements. I will introduce you to the sovereign. I will do all these things for your silence, if you become one of my lancers, an aide-de-camp, a member of my household. He asks me to betray my name to set aside my family for his. Mine is a false family, Andromedus, a family made for deception, yet some part of me aches. I saw it coming, but I don't know what to say. One of your son's soldiers might say something about your involvement, my lord. He snorts. I'm more concerned about your lieutenants. I laugh. Few of my army know the truth, and those that do will not say a word. So much trust. I am their arch primus. I say it simply. Are you serious? He asks, in confusion, as though I misunderstand something as basic as gravity. Boy, allegiances crumble as soon as we board that shuttle. Some of your friends will be spirited away to the moon lords, Others will go to the governors of the gas giants, even a few to Luna. They will remember you as a legend of their youth, but that is it, and that legend will brook no loyalty. I've stood where you stand. I won my year, but loyalty isn't found in these halls. It is the way things are. It is the way things were, I say harshly, surprising him. But I believe what I say. I am something different. I freed the enslaved and let the broken mend themselves. I gave them something you older generations can't understand. He chuckles, irritating me. That is the problem with youth, Darrow. You forget that every generation has thought the same. But for my generation it is true. No matter his confidence, I am right, he is wrong. I am the spark that will set the worlds afire. I am the hammer that cracks the chains. This school is not life, he recites to me. It is not life. Here you are king. In life there are no kings. There are many would-be kings, but we peerless lay them low. Many before you have won this game, and those many now excel beyond this school. So do not act as though when you graduate you will be king, you will have loyal subjects. You will not. You will need me. You will need a foundation, a supporter to help you rise. 
there can be none better for you than I. It's not my family I would betray. It is my people. The school was one thing, but to go beneath the dragon's wing, to let him hug me close, to sit in luxury while my own sweat and die and starve and burn. It's enough to rip my heart out. Both his golden children watch us. So do Cassius and his father after they embrace one another. There are tears for Julian. I wish I were with my family instead of here. I wish I could feel Kieran's hand on my shoulder, feel Liana's hand in mine as we watch mother set dinner before us. That is a family. Love. These people are all about glory, victory, and family pride, yet they know nothing of love, nothing of family. These are false families. They are just teams, teams that play their game of pride. The arch governor has not even said hello to his children. This vile man cares more to speak with me. Funny, I say. Funny, he asks darkly. I make something up. Funny how a single word can change everything in your life. It's not funny at all. Steel is power. Money is power. But of all the things in all the worlds, Words are power. I look at him for a moment. Words are a weapon stronger than he knows. And songs are even greater. The words wake the mind. The melody wakes the heart. I come from a people of song and dance. I don't need him to tell me the power of words. But I smile nonetheless. What is your answer? Yes or no? I will not ask again. I glance over at the dozens of peerless scarred who wait to have a word with me, no doubt to offer patronage or apprenticeships. Old Lorne Ao Arcos is there. I recognize him even without his drafter's mask. The rage knight. The man who sent me my pegasus and dancer's ring a man of perfect honour and leader of the third most powerful house on Mars, a man I could learn from. Will you rise with me? I look at the arch-governor's jugular. His heartbeat is strong. I imagine the fading dirge when Eo died. But when I hang him, he will not receive our song. His life will not echo. It will simply stop. I think, my lord, that it would present some interesting opportunities. I look up into his eyes, hoping he mistakes the fury there for excitement. You know the words, he asks me. I nod. Then you must say them. Here, now so all may witness that I have claimed the best of the school. His pride reeks. I grit my teeth and convince myself this is the right path. With him, I will rise. I will attend the academy. I will learn to lead fleets. I will win. I will sharpen myself into a sword. I will give my soul. I will dive to hell in hopes of one day rising to freedom. I will sacrifice, and I will grow my legend and spread it amongst the peoples of all the worlds until I am fit to lead the armies that will break the chains of bondage, because I am not simply an agent of the son of Ares. I am not simply a tactic or a device in Ares' schemes. I am the hope of my people, of all people in bondage. So I kneel before him, as is their way. And as is their way, he sets his hands upon my head. The words creep from my mouth, and their echo is like broken glass into my ears. I will forsake my father. I will abandon my name. I will be your sword. 
Nero our Augustus, I will make my purpose your glory. Those watching gasp at the sudden proclamation. Others curse at the impropriety, at the gall of Augustus. Does he have no sense of decency? My master kisses the top of my head and whispers their words, and I do my best to cage the fury that has made me a thing sharper than red, harder than gold. Darrow, Lancer of House Augustus, rise, there are duties for you to fill. Rise, there are honours for you to take. Rise for glory, for power, for conquest and dominion over lesser men. Rise, my son, rise. The End You've been listening to Red Rising by Pierce Brown, narrated by Tim Gerard Reynolds and directed by Abigail McHugh. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Theft of Swords, Book One of the Reiria Revelations by Michael J. Sullivan, also narrated by Tim Gerard Reynolds. When they killed King Amrath of Melangar, they pinned the murder on two men. They couldn't have made a worse choice. Royce Melbourne, a skilled thief, and his mercenary partner, Hadrian Blackwater, make a profitable living carrying out dangerous assignments for conspiring nobles until they are hired to pilfer a famed sword. What appears to be just a simple job finds them framed, and trapped in a conspiracy that uncovers a plot far greater than the mere overthrow of a tiny kingdom. Can a self-serving thief and an idealistic swordsman survive long enough to unravel the first part of an ancient mystery that has toppled kings and destroyed empires in order to keep a secret too terrible for the world to know? And so begins the first tale of Michael J. Sullivan's epic series of treachery and adventure, sword-fighting and magic, ancient myth and legend. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.